Hi, hello everyone. Very good morning one and all. Welcome to the most comprehensive preparation app for all exams, Baiju's exam prep. And warm welcome to the series, uh, to the session 50 marks in 5 hours. Just you can get 50 marks in 5 hours. So, Guys, join the session quickly and mark your presence. I am Satya, waiting for you all for this wonderful session, very, very useful session. So guys, join the session quickly and mark your presence. Let me welcome Priya Balachandar, Ayush Choudhury. Good morning. How are you people doing? <coughs> Nagendra Vaishnavi. Good morning. How your preparation is going on? So, just in 5 hours, you can become from 0 to hero. Because we are going to give the complete package for this 50 marks. So, if you just attend this 5 hour session, you will definitely be confident. Okay, okay, if I do this five, in 5 hours, we are going to give you a complete idea that how you can get this 50 marks with complete revision. Hi, Nev. Yep, yep. Okay. So, before I start, let me introduce myself quickly. I am Satya, research scholar with 15 plus years of teaching experience. I have mentored more than 35,000 students. I am qualified in GATE, UGC NET, SET and also certified by Cisco into networking and programming. Good morning, Sri Devi. So guys, for you, we have brought this master MSQ series because MSQ questions are now trending. If you observe the last year, there were many MSQ questions. So, we are bringing this exclusive MSQ series so that you can be master in att attempting this MSQ questions. Started yesterday. So, it happens on a regular basis for every subject. So, do attend this without fail. At 9 p.m., this session is going to be happening for CSC students. Now you can get 90% scholarship, up to 90% scholarship through this Baiju's exam prep scholarship test. This is going to be held on 22nd Jan. So if you know any of your juniors, your friends who want to undergo some course but unable to afford, looking for some financial assistance, Please suggest them so that they can get up to 90% scholarship. I mean, just with nominal fee, they can avail all the preparation programs, all the courses. It is happening on 22nd John at 12 p.m. Okay. <clears throat> and Asuto Saxena sir will be coming live on, uh, I actually taken uh, a session yesterday. Uh, so, if you know any of your ECE or mechanical or civil friends, please share this session information. Sir has given tips and tricks how to become an IES officer in the first attempt. Okay. So, guys, now you might be wondered how come you get 50 marks in just 5 hours, right? See, this is what the last 5 years weightage, dear friends. I will come with the proof. I will come with the proof. Right? I am showing you the proof, guys. I am showing you the proof. If you see the last 5 years trend, last 5 years weightage,
in 2022 you can see the weightage clearly here from these six subjects computer networks computer organization and architecture programming data structures algorithms operating systems and discrete mathematics from these six subjects you can see the weightage in 2022 altogether 52 marks in 2021 for 50 marks you got from these six subjects and from 2020 55 marks from 2019 47 marks 2018 57 marks and as this year iit kanpur is conducting this gate exam you see the last iit kanpur conducted years like 2015 2009 even those years also you have got 50 plus marks from these six subjects so it doesn't mean i am telling you don't prepare the other subjects you have to prepare all the subjects you have if you want to be under 100 undoubtedly you should prepare all but but if you just focus on these six subjects along with your aptitude and engineering mathematics you are done you have prepared for 75 marks isn't it so that boost up your confidence so we are here to boost your confidence because at this point of time this is what utterly required for every student <coughs> Rohit Choudhury, that is what the magic, we are here to create that magic. We are going to cover all that in 5 hours. Just stay tuned if you are from CSE and for other branches, sessions are happening which benefit in the same way but not with the same title. Okay, not with the same title but sessions are happening. All right. Nishu Kumar, question practice no, because, because we have already taken marathon sessions where, where you, you, will be, you will be getting all the questions, required questions, okay? So guys, I think you got a better idea. How you get 50 marks in 5 hours? In this, me, Satya, will be covering computer networks, computer organization and architecture, programming, operating systems. After me, in the same session, our favorite DV Sridhar sir will join us and he will be taking up this data structures, algorithms and discrete mathematics. So just with this session, you will be getting 50 marks related subject knowledge. And if you add up your practice, where just attend marathons for these six subjects, we have taken marathons almost with for every subject we have given 80 plus questions. And if you prepare the last uh, 10 years or 15 years previous year questions, definitely you would be able to get this 50 marks. Okay. So, shall we start? Everybody, I want response from everybody. Shall we start? Are we good to go? <clears throat> superb, superb. That's what. Keep up the same spirit, keep up the same energy. And guys, I request you all to keep liking the session, keep sharing the session because at this last point of time, this kind of sessions will be very useful. Believe me, it'll, it works like a quick capsule. It works like a last minute revision. 
if you just refer all this 5 hours class that is done, these 6 subjects is in your pocket. Believe me. So, please try to share this session information as much as possible wherever you are connected with your students, with your friends because it should benefit many students. That is what our intention. Chalo, chalo, chalo. Now, firstly, I would like to discuss the subject computer networks. Okay. So, whenever we say network, yes, it's a group of nodes that are connected, communicated with each other. Different modes of communication, simplex, half duplex, full duplex, full full duplex, unicast, multicast, broadcast and different topologies, bus topology, star topology, ring topology, mesh topology, tree topology, hybrid topology and different medium means guided medium in the form of cables twisted pair cable, coaxial cable, fiber optic cable, unguided medium in the form of electromagnetic waves, radio waves, microwaves, IR infrared waves. So, this is all the basic stuff, basic terminology you should know when you want to get into any concept of computer networks. So, here I am not going to revise that basic stuff because uh, leastly from this questions are expected. That is why I am directly taking you to the actual core, core concepts of this computer networks. Okay? Firstly, the very, very important topic of computer networks is delays. Means, whenever, whenever there is sender S, receiver R, when sender wants to send certain message of so and so bytes or kilobytes or megabytes. How much time it take for the data to reach the receiver? That is what we are calling as network delay. What? Network delay. This network delay is comprising of four different delays. What are they? Queuing delay, processing delay, transmission delay, propagation delay. What is <coughs> queuing delay, processing delay, propagation delay, transmission delay? Let us see. Firstly, queuing delay. What is queuing delay? It is the time spent by the data packet waiting at the sender in the queue before it is processed by the node. Means for header tailor to add that particular node requires certain time. So, our data may not be of a single packet. Right? The data may be divided into multiple packets. When for the first packet, header tailor are getting added, what about the status of other packets? They are waiting. Right? That waiting time is what we say queuing delay. Then processing delay means the wait is over. The particular packet is getting processed. That means you can say the header fields are getting formed, calculated, trailer is getting calculated, partitioning is happening. So, this processing of that particular packet and in the intermediate nodes processing means you can understand it is a verification of the nodes, verification of destination address, recalculation of checksum. All this stuff we say, the time taken for all this stuff we say as processing delay. So, the time taken by the processor to process the data packet. Process means, as I said, the time for the activities. What activities? 
verification or formation of the control fields then transmission delay so waiting is over processing is done now that particular packet should be loaded into the channel so the time needed to load the data into the channel that is what we say what transmission delay time taken to put that data packet on the transmission link and what is propagation delay it is the time taken to reach the receiver means till transmission delay your packet is at the sender only now that packet start its journey it is getting pushed towards the receiver so this traveling time this journey time is what we say propagation delay so here you understand one point propagation delay is independent of packet size why sir just understand just understand you are in a bus the bus has the capacity of 50 passengers if there is only one passenger if there are 50 passengers two cases until the bus go with the same speed until the bus travel for the same distance will the time vary for 50 passengers and one passenger you tell me whether there is one passenger in the bus whether there are 50 passengers in the bus until the bus is going with the same speed same distance it is traveling will the time vary no right this journey time won't vary right so that the propagation delay is independent of packet size remember that so how we calculate this in this queuing delay and processing delay they are in microseconds to nanoseconds henceforth in general we will ignore them in general but for some questions if they are mentioned this is the processing delay this is the queuing delay then definitely we will add them so the total time actually is summation of queuing delay processing delay transmission delay and propagation delay if you ignore tq and tpr then it is just transmission delay and propagation delay by ignoring them and if you look at certain questions if you remember there, there were couple of questions where processing delay is mentioned at that time we will add if not mentioned understand they are ignored okay so how we calculate this transmission delay propagation delay transmission and propagation delays you can add you can calculate as transmission delay is length of the packet size of the packet divided by bandwidth and propagation delay is calculated as distance between the sender and receiver in the other way what you can call it as length of the channel length of the medium upon transmission speed and while you calculate these two everybody please please remember unit conversions many students commit mistakes silly mistakes they know everything but as they forget to convert these units like one is in bits another is in bytes like this is given in bytes and this is given in bits per second if you directly take the bytes number and do the calculation you may get certain value and you may treat that as the answer right Similarly, you may be given length in the kilometers and transmission speed in meters per second or vice versa. So, please mind unit conversions. This is very, very important. Okay.
okay everybody will you remember please please make the session interactive please give certain response so make it as a note while doing while calculating td and pd unit conversions should be focused okay chal next when it comes to computer networks the next focused topic or next important topic is error control what is this error control whenever the transmitted data and received data are not same then you say error error occurred right this error is basically of two types single bit error and burst error for single bit error we have certain codes they are error detection code error detection and correction code the difference i think you know detection code means it identify only presence presence of error whether error is there or not it will not tell you which bit is error or how many errors how many bits errors are there when it comes to detection and correction code <coughs> it will identify both presence and position so detection codes we have vrc vertical redundancy check lrc longitudinal redundancy check crc cyclic redundancy check checksum these four are what error detection techniques in these checksum is used by higher layer protocols transport layer application layer crc is used by lower layer protocols network layer data link layer and uh, <coughs> yeah. okay and detection and correction code is what hamming code we have yes of course when you take this 8421 hamming code it can detect and correct single bit error single bit error vrc is what you say parity mechanism lrc is what you call as block parity but they can't detect all kind of errors that's why we will use either crc or checksum and in certain applications we use hamming code yes nishu yes hamming distance need not to be the <coughs> subtopic of hamming code hamming distance is basically the number of bit differences between sent code word and received code word that is what hamming distance hamming distance is the number of bit differences or bit changes in sent code word and received code word maruti pyq solving is very important okay at least in which subjects you are confident at least those subjects minimum 8 subjects you have to pick up those 8 subjects please finish last 15 years pyq solving if time doesn't permit at least make sure last 10 years papers you are solving it is very important and it is very much required this 15 days sufficient little difficult but 
try to spend more time and try to finish okay so how we calculate this hamming distance let sent code word is c1 received code word is c2 then we will do xor between these two c1 and c2 in this result you will get certain result in this result the number of ones is what the hamming distance number of ones is what the hamming distance so as when you apply hamming code technique then only hamming distance you have you should calculate means not hamming distance is basically telling how many bit errors are there okay chalo so in this crc checksum hamming code definitely you should revise first let us revise the crc with example directly suppose you have this original data this is called data word and you are given the divisor divisor will not be given like this in binary divisor is always represented in polynomial form means if this is the divisor this is given as 1 into x power 0 plus 0 into x power 1 plus 0 into x power 2 plus 1 into x cube that means you will be given as x cube plus 1 okay like this the divisor is not mentioned in the polynomial form it is given that you should convert into binary okay so now whenever you have this original data and the divisor what you should do when the divisor is having n bits you should append n minus 1 zeros so 1101101101 this is the data word for this you should append n minus 1 zeros as our divisor has 4 bits i am appending 3 zeros so 1001 now this is after appending what you get that is dividend you have divisor dividend now you should do actually division process sir in binary how we do division you do successive xor operation so what you have to do 1001 do xor you will get 0 1 0 0 when msb is 0 you have to shift it left so that you will get one bit space in that space you borrow one bit the next bit of the dividend and do repetitive xor <clears throat> 1001 you are getting all zeros what i am doing xor operation please understand i am doing xor operation now actual algorithm uh, borrow or shift one one bit only but for time saving i can borrow i can shift all these bits and i can borrow all these bits together again i am telling algorithm don't shift multiple bits at a time by one one bit at a time only to do but in the gate exam as the time is important we can do like this but before you shift make sure you have those many bits to borrow so i am having 0 1 0 1 to borrow do repetitive xr 1001 0, 0, 1. so 1 1 0 0 now now i am having msb1 when msb1 it can't be simply shifted so what you have to do do xor again 1001 so 0101 now you got msb0 now you can shift it and borrow this bit how many bits i am shifting those many bits i have to borrow so 1001 so this is 0011 
Now I have two zeros. Do I have two bits to borrow? Yes. So borrow these two bits. Zero zero one zero zero one. So what you got? One zero one zero. Zero one zero one. Now MSB zero. Shift it left. Borrow a bit, but there are no bit no bits to borrow. So here it ends. Here it ends. So how many bit remainder you got? One zero one you got. This is what you say CRC remainder. So what would be the code word? Code word means data word with check bits or redundant bits. So one one zero one one zero one zero one. Now these three zeros are replaced by obtained remainder. Clear how you calculate the remainder? And this is frequent question. What is the remainder or what is the code word? Okay. <coughs> Is this clear for everyone? Super. Now, the next important error detection code, error detection and correction code you have to revise is Hamming code. With this Hamming code, suppose the data to be transmitted is the data to be transmitted is this. Right? This is not the data word. The, sorry, this is what the data word, not the code word. Means you don't transmit this. What you transmit? Code word you transmit. How you get the code word? When you append check bits, redundant bits. Right? So, how many check bits are needed? Minimum number of check bits. needed is <coughs> let check bits I am taking as R the number of data word I am taking as D okay okay so if you want to calculate minimum how many check bits required for the given data word how you calculate 2 raised to R greater than or equal to D plus R minus 1. Sorry, plus 1. Right? So, where D is number of bits in the data word. Number of bits, not ones. Number of bits in the data word. Here, if you observe, how many bits I have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 9, 10. Is it plus 1 or minus 1? I am confused. Wait a minute. So, minimum number of check bits is equal to 2 raised to r greater than or equal to d plus r minus 1, right? Yeah. So, d is number of bits in the data word. So, here I am having 10 bits. So, 2 raised to r greater than or equal to 10 plus r minus 1, which value which minimum value satisfy this? R equal to 4. So, minimum number of check bits needed for this data word is 4 bits. Okay, this is one important uh, formula you have to remember. Now, what you have to do? You have to arrange, place check bits at 
टू पवर आइथ पोजिशन आई स्टार्ट विथ जीरो दट मीन्स दट मीन्स टू पवर जीरो यू विल प्लेस द फर्स्ट रिडंडेंट वर्ड टू पवर वन सेकेंड रिडंडेंट वर्ड टू स्क्वेर नेक्स्ट रिडंडेंट वर्ड टू क्यूब नेक्स्ट रिडंडेंट बिट सो फोर बिट्स वी रिक्वायर सो वी हैव टू अरेज दम इन टू पवर आइथ पोजिशन ओके If more check bits, you take two power four, sixteenth position, and that. So now, what about the remaining? Remaining we have to take data bits. You have to take the remaining bits. What data bits? So in the same order, we will write. So one, one. Zero one zero one zero one one <coughs> one one zero one. Sorry, here I missed one. One zero one zero one. One means in this order I am writing. Okay. Now, sender don't know what these arbits are, so sender should calculate these arbits and place there. Receiver getting code word means arbits some value zero or one. So what process sender follow same process receiver follow. But sender exclude these R bits to calculate it. Receiver include it. Here you can follow even parity, odd parity. But generally, <coughs> generally, as we apply XOR operation, you can say even parity we will follow. That means, how do you get R not, R one, R two, R three? this is the question mark please follow this simple trick in the books it is said <coughs> include one bit exclude one bit or include two bits exclude two bits you will have certain terminology but simple trick is we have 14 bits positions no so arrange those 14 positions in the binary i have already taken one exclusive session on this hamming code dear friends you when if you want the detailed explanation you may refer that so one you write the binary form 0001 like this for all the given positions i am writing the binary form okay this is the simple way with practice you can do it in less time <clears throat> now what you have to do r not is in which position first position so first position has one where in the lsb right in the units place so it is uh, you, if you want r not that is the xor of other similar positions means 3 5 7 9 11 13 see these positions are having ones in the lsb so r not is xor between third position fifth position seventh position ninth position 11th and 13th for our our uh, example okay so at the third position i have one fifth position i have one seventh position one ninth position one 11th one 13th one 
Now XOR, even number of ones, zero, odd number of ones, one, we know that. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. So, I have six ones. So, zero. <coughs> so, R naught is zero. Now, R1. <coughs> R1 position is second position. Second position has one where in the tenth place, right? Last but position of LSB. So, what other positions have the same one uh, in, in the same place? One, three, five, and not five, sorry, six, seven, ten, eleven, fourteen, three, six, seven, <coughs> ten, eleven, and fourteen. So, it is the XOR of those bit values. So, third position 1, <coughs> sixth position 0, uh, seventh position 1, tenth 0, eleventh 1, fourteenth 1. So, count number of ones 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 ones, even number. So, R2 value 0, R1 value 0. <coughs> now, R2. R2 position is fourth position. See, fourth position has one in the <coughs> excuse me. In the hundreds place. So, what other positions have ones in the same place? If you see five, six, seven right and 12 13 14 <coughs> tenth position is 0 tenth position 0 sri devi So, fifth position has 1, sixth has 0, seventh has 1, 12, 0, 13, 1, 14th, 1. So, this is 1, 2, 3, 4 ones. So, 0. And finally, R3 has 1, R3 position is 8, 8 has 1 in the MSB. Other positions that have 1 in the MSB are 9, 2, 14. So, it is the XOR of all 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So, ninth position 1, 10th 0, 11, 1, 12, 0, 13, 1, 14, 1, whatever the value you get. So, in this way, sender calculate R bits, place their send. Receiver do the same, but receiver do XOR with R0 position, R1, R2, R3. So, receiver include those positions and he should get 0. If he is not getting 0, that means error is there. Any redundant bit value non-zero, that is indicating error presence. And how he will find the position, Hamming God says that error is at R0, R1, R2, R3, so on at this position. <clears throat> okay? Clear? And with respect to Hamming code, we have one point that is very, very important. You have to <coughs> uh, remember the formula. That is, I have just explained what is Hamming distance, right? So, with respect to Hamming distance, we have to detect up to D errors. Up to D means maximum. the minimum Hamming distance 
the minimum hamming distance must be d plus 1 and to correct up to d errors means maximum if we need to correct d errors then the minimum hamming distance must be Two D plus one. <clears throat> this is these two are also important formulae related to Hamming code. So remember this; these will be useful. Hamming code is clear, everybody. Please do respond. Next, next important. By the way, if you want checksum, I can I can explain what is checksum. It is very simple. Okay. Checksum is error detecting code, not correcting code. Remember, so checksum is, <coughs> as the name indicates. First, what we have to do is divide the data word into blocks of fixed size. Then, what you do? Let these blocks be B1, B2, B3, so on. Then we successively sum them. Sum is equivalent to XOR operation, sum, not carry, sum. So XOR B1 and B2, that will give you some result. Let's say R1. That result, you do XOR with next block. That result, you do XOR with next block. In this way, until all the blocks gets finished, you keep doing the successive XOR. Finally, you get some result Rn, right? So, do once complement of Rn, that is what your check bit or redundant word. <clears throat> I'll give one example. Let data word be. 1101010011011001 suppose this is the data word let block size is equal to 4 bits what block size sender follows same block size receiver follow this is the rule so what sender do divide the data word into 4 4 bits So, we got four blocks B1, B2, B3, B4. Now, <coughs> B1 and B2 we XOR. B1 is 1001, B2 is 0101. XOR, so 1100. This is R1. Do XOR with the next block B3. What is B3? 110 zero, zero, one, one, zero. So, you get 1010. One, do XOR with the next block B4. That is just one. Means we know <coughs> others are ones. So, it is 1011. One, one. This is the final result Rn. Do once complement of it. What is once complement for 1011? One, 0, 1, 0, 0. So, this is your R. Now, what is the code word? Code word is equal to data word appended with R. So, that is 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. 
so this is your data word this is your r completely together is code word <clears throat> nagendra binary addition binary addition will produce two results sum carry okay sum carry 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 this is a b whenever you do addition you will get two results sum and carry what is the sum 0 plus 0 0 1 1 0 carry 1 so this sum result if you observe it is equivalent to 2 a x or b so whether you include carry you do not include carry it is the same so it is the simple procedure <clears throat> okay i am talking about the result sum is equivalent to xor operation i am doing binary addition only but i am ignoring the carry part you consider carry also <coughs> the procedure is the same nagendra ura I understand what you people are telling. If we include carry, the results will vary. <coughs> right? So, here I am telling you the procedure. Successive sum you do. Final sum you do once complement. That once complemented sum is your redundant word. That is what I am telling. Okay. For simple explanation, I have taken XOR here. Clear? <clears throat> Next. Next important concept of computer networks is flow control techniques. When sender is slow, receiver is fast, no problem, receiver waiting will be there. But when sender is fast, receiver is slow, then data loss occurs. So, there require what flow control mechanism. Right. So, for that flow control, what we do? Flow control <coughs> techniques are used at two layers. Means, flow control is the functionality that happens at two layers. One is the data link layer, other is the transport layer. Data link layer flow control is called feedback based flow control. Transport layer flow control you call as rate based flow control that is what we say congestion control. So, in the feedback based flow control, feedback or acknowledgement is what important parameter based on which decisions are taken. In the rate based flow control, here we will regulate the amount of data that we are transmitting every time. So, data link layer flow control, if you look at, we have two types of protocols as noise for noiseless channel and noisy channel. Noiseless channel are not suitable for communication. So, leaving that for noisy channels, the protocols we got are stop and wait ARQ, go back and ARQ, selective repeat or selective reject ARQ. 
<coughs> what is the difference in these uh, uh, go back and or stop and wait and selective repeat in stop and wait here i don't explain uh, with the, all the diagrams i'll explain something which is even more needed in the stop and wait arq so we'll send one frame stop for the transmission and wait for its acknowledgement within the time if you get acknowledgement if it is positive do for the do the same for the next frame if it is negative retransmit the old frame right what if there is no acknowledgement means if the acknowledgement is lost that's why this arq is there sliding window define the timer until what what is the maximum time you can wait for the acknowledgement so whenever the timer expire no response from the receiver treat it as automatic repeat request from the receiver and do retransmission automatically got it so for this <coughs> flow control stop and wait will give you less efficiency less utilization so go back and says that you need not to wait for every frame keep sending window number of frames after window number of frames mind the acknowledgement if you get it react based on the acknowledgement such that if you get a negative acknowledgement for some nth frame repeat retransmission from n all the other frames but selective repeat says repeat only that nth frame transmission right so if i take this stop and wait go back n and selective repeat in which protocol what is the sender window size what is the receiver window size if we look at in stop and wait arq sender window size and receiver window size are one frame in go back and arq sender window size is 2 raised to n minus 1 receiver one only in selective repeat arq 2 raised to n minus 1 2 raised to n minus 1 what is n n is number of bits for sequencing the frames here here i can say minimum number of bits right and here <coughs> where you will get more utilization in stop and wait very less in selective repeat you will get more utilization in go back and very high utilization is more in go back and but when it comes to efficiency in selective repeat it is very high in go back and more in stop and wait as it, as usual very less generally utilization efficiency we relate as the same but utilization is just transmitted efficiency is talking about the success whether they are delivered or not So, until unless you are given the scenario, we will take both as the same utilization efficiency. Okay. Right. So, <clears throat> now how we calculate the utilization or efficiency? How much time you take to transmit one frame? in the total transmission time how do you get the total transmission time if you are having sender receiver channel 
how actually you get the total transmission time ignoring queuing delay and processing delay frame transmission delay frame propagation delay acknowledgement transmission delay acknowledgement propagation delay we understood propagation delay is independent of the data size so propagation delay 1 and 2 will be same if they are traveling for the same distance and same speed and td2 is what acknowledgement transmission delay that is generally acknowledgement size is less depend uh, divided by bandwidth would be even more small number so neglected neglected if given we will consider so neglecting acknowledgement transmission delay what would be the total time transmission delay one time of transmission delay that is frame transmission delay plus rtt round trip time <clears throat> what is rtt two times of propagation delay in this time how much packets or how many how many uh, frames you can send based on the protocol for go back n you will be able to send 2 power n minus 1 means window number of frames so utilization i can say it as window number of frames you will transmit in the total time or total transmission time so this is how you got w divided by 1 plus 2 into pd by td so if i take pd by td as a that is how i got utilization can be less or equal to w divided by 1 plus 2a where a is propagation delay by transmission delay and what is w it is 1 for stop and wait 2 raised to n minus 1 for go back n 2 raised to n minus 1 for selective repeat this formula is very 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 important based on this we have got questions many times are we clear with this then comes very important <coughs> topic ipv4 header ipv4 addressing this is what the ipv4 header here here if you observe it is having 20 bytes fixed header with 40 bytes optional header so the header length vary from 20 bytes to 60 bytes right so the range of header length would be 20 bytes to 60 bytes but you are given the header length HLEN HLEN width as 4 bits only so here comes the scale factor HLEN multiplied by 4 is what gives you header length means if header length is 20 20 divided by 4 5 if header length is 60 60 divided by 4 15 so header length value ranges from 5 hlen ranges from 5 to 15 whereas header length ranges from 20 to 60 okay this is one point and here if you see we are given fragment offset that indicates the starting position 
the fragment offset value is 13 bits. Its value is 13 bits. And identification value is 16 bits. Means you can have 2 power 16, 2 power 16 packets. But you have only 13 bit offset. So, so the starting position of the packet, if you want, 2 raised to 16 by 2 raised to 13 is what? 2 power 8. So, scale factor is 8 here. So, starting position, if you want, you should multiply offset with 8. This is one important point and, and TTL time to live. Time to live field is of 8 bit. 8 bit means 2 power 8, 256 values possible, but TTL is a decremented counter. So, TTL value vary from 255 to 0. So, why this TTL? If the packet is looping in the network, means it is visiting certain intermediate network more than one time. In order to avoid that count to infinity problem or two node loop problem, this TTL helps. So, TTL purpose is to prevent packet looping. Okay. And in the options field, dear friends, we have 40 bytes options. In the options field, In the options field, there is one option called record root. Means through which nodes our packet is passing or this packet travelled through which nodes for the receiver to know. This record root option can be enabled. Here, how many nodes IP address it can maintain as actually one IP v4 address length is of 4 bytes. Any IP v4 address length is 4 bytes as options length is 40 bytes. 40 by 4 actually 10 IP addresses you can maintain here. but Along with record root option, so many other options are also possible in this field. Hence, to indicate which option is enabled, 4 bytes always reserved. So, 36 bytes you can use for this record root. Hence, the maximum number of IP addresses that you can maintain in the record root option are 36 byte by 4 byte 9. This is one important parameter. Okay. And how do you get the total length? Total length is equal to header length plus payload length in bytes by default in bytes by default. Okay? <coughs> and here we have flags df, mf. Do not fragment further more fragments. When mf is equal to 0, that indicates that is the last partition of that particular segment. 
and when df is equal to 1 that is to indicate the intermediate networks for not fragmenting this packet further right so all these fields meaning certain fields values are very important you may get a direct question from them so please do recall their fields and their meanings their length once once you go for the exam okay are we clear with this ipv4 header now IPv4 addressing. This is a compulsory question I can say. From this topic, from this topic, definitely you will have a question in the gate exam. So, this topic must be confident, everybody must be confident with this topic. So, practice as much as possible. Now, <clears throat> what is this IPv4 addressing? IPv4 address length is 32 bits or 4 bytes. It is represented in the decimal number, rep uh, decimal representation separated by dots. Each byte separated by dot. So, the minimum or the first possible IP address is 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 and the max or last possible IP address is 255.255.255.255. These two are called global IP addresses. Sorry universal IP addresses, both mean the same, universal IP addresses and these are reserved, not allotted for any host or any network. Why? Remember, always the first IP is reserved for network interface. <coughs> And the last IP is always reserved for broadcast purpose. And in our region, we have one loopback IP address that is 127.0.0.1. When a node is delivering a packet to itself in the destination IP address field of header, this loopback IP is kept so that the packet need not to traverse to the router within the node itself, it gets delivered. Okay. <clears throat> so, as we have 32 bits, as we have 32 bits total 2 power 32 that means 4 giga or I can say 4.2 billion IP addresses possible. These 4.2 billion IP addresses are <coughs> classified into 5 classes, class A, B, C, D and E. Class A IP addresses are given for large scale organizations, B medium scale organizations, C small scale organizations, D for multicast purpose, E for research purpose or for testing purpose you can say. Right? So, what is the range of these? A, B, C, D and E.
what would be the range of this class A, B, C, D and E? Class A zero dot zero dot zero dot one two one twenty seven dot two fifty five dot two fifty five dot two fifty five. That means in the first octet there is a restriction. Class B one twenty eight to one nine one. Class C one ninety two to two twenty three. Class D two twenty four to two thirty nine. Class E two forty to two fifty five. I have excluded the first and last one, right? In these, for our regular communication, we are using A, B, C. Here, whenever a packet reach the router, in the header destination IP is there. In that destination IP, network ID will be there. So any IP address. Is the combination of network ID and host ID. So how the router can identify which number represents the network ID, which num number represents the host ID? For that purpose, we have got mask. So whenever mask and IP address are done and operation. Whenever mask and IP address you do, that will give you what network ID. In that way, if you observe, in class A, the total number of networks possible are in class A. The total number of networks possible are. Two power seven, because zero to one twenty seven is the range. One twenty eight network IDs. In class B, two power fourteen. In class C, two power twenty one. In each such network, how many hosts are possible? Two power twenty four minus two. Why? First and last we always reserve. Due to this, so many IP gets wasted. For that purpose, we have got the subnetting concept. So, in the subnetting, what we do? <clears throat> we organize multiple networks together as one subnetwork. So, for the subnetwork. Bits are borrowed from the host ID. Bits are borrowed from the host ID, and used as subnet ID. How many bits you can borrow in class A? For network ID, subnetwork ID, host ID, if you classify in the class A for network ID, eight bits, subnetwork ID, eight bits, remaining host ID. In class B, sixteen, eight, eight. 
in class C, 24, 2 bits for the subnet ID, 6 bits for the host ID. Like this, fixed number of bits are given and when you make this network and subnetwork bits once, you will get the mask. So, the subnet mask you see the first 16 ones that is 255.255.0.0. B 16 plus 8 24 ones. Host bits zeros. C 24 plus 2, 26 ones. <coughs> okay. Here, as fixed bits are given for the subnet ID, again, if we have more subnets, bits will be insufficient, less subnets again wastage. There you got this CIDR, classless inter-domain routing, means we can choose how many bits to use for this subnet ID. There, mask also we will form by making net and subnet, bis, uh, subnet uh, bits once. That will form variable length subnet mask, that is VLSM. And this CIDR mask is represented as a slash N notation, where N represents number of bits for network ID and subnetwork ID. Guys, <clears throat> 0 to 127 class A. In that 127 starting value used for loop back addressing. Our region is using 127.0.0.1. Only that particular number is what reserved for loopback IP in our NIC. Uh, <coughs> ours is Asian Pacific NIC. The other NIC, European NIC or other NICs use some other number starting with 127. In that way, we say 127 is not allotted for any host. And in you start with 0, 0.0.0.1 0 is what the starting host ID. Only 4 zeros is what reserved. So, when you talk about the range, if you find some IP with 0 and 127 starting value, under which class I have to keep it means in class A only. Whether they are used, allotted for the host ID or not, that is a different case. When you want to map to some class, that is class A only. Okay? <clears throat> Guys, this IPv4 addressing is a very important topic. So, without fail, everybody, please practice IPv4 addressing as much as possible. Now, moving on to another important topic of computer networks that is routing algorithms. Routing, we know routing is the process of finding optimal route. Means, shortest possible route. This routing is based on sharing. Sharing happens between immediate neighbors. Okay? So, whenever the sharing happens, the receiving node update its routing table. So, when that 
update happens this update can happen in two ways one is triggered update whenever any change occurs in the network immediately that node update its immediate neighbors another is periodic update for every 30 seconds this sharing happens until stabilization point reach it okay what is the shared that vary from algorithm to algorithm or protocol to protocol these routing algorithms <coughs> are classified as adaptive non adaptive static dynamic different terminology you see so centralized isolated distributed are again subforms of adaptive flooding and random walk non adaptive subversions on this exclusively i have taken one session you want more and more knowledge about it definitely you can uh, refer that here i am taking this uh, distributed distributed adaptive routing algorithm because that is what uh, we need to focus more under this we got uh, intra domain routing algorithms or interior gateway routing protocols inter domain routing algorithms or exterior gateway routing protocols there comes dvr algorithm lsr algorithm here comes path vector routing algorithm dvr algorithm based protocol is routing information protocol lsr algorithm based protocols are open source shortest path first intermediate system intermediate system and path vector routing based algorithm uh, algorithm based protocol is border gateway protocol these are ip supporting protocols along with this other ip supporting protocols <coughs> routing protocols uh, along with this you can take ARP address resolution protocol to convert IP address to MAC address RARP MAC address to IP address DHCP to configure the host dynamically or to maintain the routing tables to commit the routing tables ICMP for error reporting, NAT to translate private IP address to public IP address. <coughs> yeah, Nagendra Ura. Because at every uh, at every node, routing information is there. So definitely you can say it is distributed. Distributed basically says all the routing information is not present at one node. It is not centralized. When every node is maintaining certain routing information, you can say it is distributive algorithm. In LSR. Every node calculate its own shortest path. Every node has to maintain all the links, uh, cost, topology information. So it is distributed. And PVR is based on DVR. So it is distributed. So <coughs> DVR algorithm where routing tables are constructed, shared when there is a change receiving node compare old table new table update 
the table. So, DVR algorithm is uh, one of the most important algorithms we can expect. <coughs> Do practice with a numerical example. If I take a numerical example now, it would be more time taking. So, I am not taking here, but I just have briefed that procedure. Please do revise it. This DVR algorithm is iterative algorithm asynchronous because periodic update happens, triggered update also it supports distributed. Right? But with the DBR algorithm, we have a drawback. What is that drawback? Count to infinity problem. Count to infinity problem. <clears throat> For this count to infinity problem, three solutions are suggested as the define infinity. Poisson reverse technique and split horizon technique. In this split horizon technique covers the other two. So, split horizon technique or horizon technique whatever you pronounce that is what used to <coughs> uh, avoid or reduce this count to infinity problem. Hello Ikra, good morning. Okay. So, LSR algorithm. LSR is basically based on Distra algorithm, guys. Shortest path tree is what constructed for the given network graph. As the tree will not have cycle, this algorithm is uh, free from this count to infinity issue. But, but there is much memory overhead in this algorithm. And Routers do not generally maintain that much memory space and they, they do not even have that memory controlling logic. Hence, LSR algorithm why it is not that preferred is for that reason. Okay. <clears throat> So, link state routing algorithm means immediately you should recall the shortest path tree calculation. And what is shared? LSP, link state packet is what shared among the nodes. When again periodic update, triggered update. Okay. Now, I am moving on to congestion control algorithm of TCP. Before I talk about this, remember TCP transmission control protocol, it is byte oriented protocol because for each byte it assign unique sequence number. It is connection oriented protocol means it establish end to end connection using three way handshaking procedure. For that it use SYN flag, ACK flag for connection establishment, FIN flag and ACK flag for connection release. This is for establishment. This is for connection release in three way handshaking procedure. As it is a connection oriented TCP is a reliable protocol. <coughs> and how many 
sequence numbers it can have 2 raised to 32. So, if the number of segments are more than 2 raised to 32, wrap around happens. So, wrap around time, TCP wrap around time is 2 raised to 32 upon bandwidth. This is how you calculate. That is very important. Okay. Guys, am I visible and audible? Am I visible and audible? Right. So, at the transport layer, this TCP protocol is responsible for rate based flow control, regulated flow control, which you can term as congestion control. For this congestion control, this AIMD algorithm is used. In this AIMD algorithm, three phases basically slow start additive increase, multiplicative decrease. In the slow start phase, window size increases exponentially. In the additive increase phase, window size increases linearly. Upon every acknowledgement, this is what one important point everybody should understand. In the slow start phase, upon each acknowledgement, in slow start phase, window size increases by 1. In the additive increase phase, upon each acknowledgement, window size increases by 1 by w size. Means, suppose you are sending 16 segments. One one segment you are receiving the acknowledgement. Window size add by 1 by 16, 1 by 16, 1 by 16, so on. Let one segment size is 100 bytes, assume. So, you have sent 1600 bytes, let us say in the AI phase. Okay. When you receive one acknowledgement, the window size will be 1600 plus 1 by 1600 bytes. When you receive <clears throat> Another segment acknowledgement, window size increases by again 1 by 1600. Like this, sorry 1 by 16, like this upon each acknowledgement, window size increases by 1 by w in additive increase, in slow start by 1 every time on every acknowledgement. This is very very important. And in the slow start phase, whenever a threshold is reached, AI phase start and during AI, Whenever you say timeout or three negative acknowledgements or last uh, duplicate acknowledgements, both indicates congestion. Both indicates congestion. 
whenever the time out occurs when time out occurs means you did not receive the acknowledgement within the window time no response from the receiver that indicates congestion duplicate acknowledgements also indicates congestion so which require which indicates heavy congestion which requires moderate congestion whenever time out occurs that indicates heavy congestion huge traffic when three duplicate acknowledgements that indicates moderate congestion so when time out occurs you restart with ss phase when duplicate acknowledgements you go for md phase right so have this proper understanding of ai md algorithm because we can expect question from this okay <clears throat> now once everyone recall what are different application layer protocols and their purpose to start with we have http for all web based transactions right http port number is 80 https port number is 443 and it is a tcp based protocol and we have ftp for transfer of files it is also tcp based and it uses port numbers 20 for data and 21 for control this is also tcp based we have one protocol uh, smtp simple mail transfer protocol this is to push mails to the mail server it is also tcp based telnet this is used for remote login service this is also tcp based dns this is to resolve domain names to ip addresses this is udp based and trivial file transfer protocol tftp that is also udp based and we have uh, icmp internet control message protocol this is the tcp based port 143 is the port number to display mails to the <coughs> user and to manage the mailbox this I icmp sorry what i am talking not icmp guys imap imap hmm. and we have a protocol like pop this is to pull or retrieve mails from mail server its port numbers are 109110 pop3 is 110 it is tcp based right so like this we have certain application layer protocols i request everybody to revise once about these application layer protocols and their purpose okay
एच टी टी पी इज स्ट्रिक्ट टी सी पी एफ टी पी इज स्ट्रिक्ट टी सी पी एंड एस एम टी पी इज स्ट्रिक्ट टी सी पी चलो नाउ वी मूव ऑन टू नेक्स्ट सब्जेक्ट ओ एस सो गाइस all the important concepts of the computer networks i try to quickly revise and give you some required sufficient knowledge about them so <coughs> are all the topics got revised all right now os os is again one of the most weightage subject i can say but in the operating systems majorly you have to focus on three topics because majorly these three topics what most attended most frequently asked topics one is page tables other is scheduling topic other is synchronization topic i am not telling you other topics are not important i am not telling that i am telling these the three topics demand or draw much weightage generally means generally two marks questions will be framed from these topics if you observe yes deadlocks page replacement algorithms file systems whatever the other topics are there definitely all are important but two marks question means majorly these three topics what we pick up so focus on these three topics majorly okay but we revise all the other topics also quickly starting with what is os we know it's an interface between user and hardware means it acts like a system which is not actually visible os doesn't mean it's a single program it is just a piece of code os means it's a underlying system it's an underlying platform which is controlling everything which is making sure everything takes place in a right way right this os has several types <coughs> several perceptions also some of the popular include this serial processing batch processing multi programming multi tasking multi processing distributed embedded and real time in this please understand the difference between multi programming multi tasking and multi processing os everybody in the multi programming os how many execute at a time one process only execute at a time but but multiple programs can be loaded in the main memory multiple can exist in the main memory
at a time when you take multi tasking operating system here context switching is what playing a vital role at any given time only one process will be there by uh, with one cpu at a time but due to context switching by the time by the unit time expire multiple tasks happen <coughs> by the cpu when you say multi processing here you have multiple cpus each with multitasking ability in multitasking os only one cpu is there so this is what we are saying as a time sharing operating system so please have a clear distinction clear difference among this okay now when you say process which is the program in the executable form or we can say the active form of a program which is process right the process can have any of these seven states in its lifetime new state let me change the color <clears throat> new state ready state running state exit state blocked state suspend ready state and suspend blocked state right so these transitions are very important when cpu or the processor or the os supports preemption when the os supports preemption then only running to ready transition will be there otherwise we will not have that transition so these transitions are very very important okay and at any given time for a uni processor system in the running state only one process can be there but in the other states as many processes as we want can be there so as only one process can be in the running state at any time what is that process in which order we can send these processes new processes ready processes blocked processes there comes scheduling concept and when a process is in the new state suspend ready suspend blocked the location of the process is set to be secondary memory in all the other states we say it as main memory okay so scheduling it is basically deciding the order in which order we can deal with the processes 
देर आर थ्री टाइप्स ऑफ स्केड्यूलर्स लॉन्ग टर्म मीडियम टर्म शॉर्ट टर्म लॉन्ग टर्म स्केड्यूलर बेसिकली डिसाइड द सीक्वेंस फ्रॉम न्यू स्टेट टू रेडी स्टेट मीडियम टर्म डिसाइड द सीक्वेंस ऑफ प्रोसेसेस फ्रॉम ब्लॉक्ड स्टेट टू रेडी स्टेट शॉर्ट टर्म डिसाइड द सीक्वेंस ऑफ प्रोसेसेस फ्रॉम रेडी स्टेट टू रनिंग स्टेट हाउ दे डिसाइड वॉट पैरामीटर्स वी फॉलो दे आर वॉट वी से स्केड्यूलिंग क्राइटीरिया दे आर बर्स टाइम अराइवल टाइम वेटिंग टाइम टर्न अराउंड टाइम रेस्पॉन्स टाइम थ्रो पुट प्रयोरिटी इन दिस हाउ वी कैलक्युलेट द टर्न अराउंड टाइम कंप्लीशन टाइम माइनस अराइवल टाइम और बर्स टाइम प्लस वेटिंग टाइम यू कैन से बट वी यूज दट फार्मूला इन अदर वे फॉर कैलक्युलेशन ऑफ वेटिंग टाइम हाउ टर्न अराउंड टाइम माइनस बर्स्ट टाइम दिस टू फार्मूला आर वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट मोस्टली द क्वेश्चन दट फॉर्म फ्रॉम दिस टॉपिक आर अराउंड दिस and response time this is waiting time only but up to that instance waiting time till that instance or till that moment right so we have two different types of uh, algorithms for scheduling non preemptive scheduling algorithm preemptive scheduling algorithm means once a process is scheduled if it can be interrupted that is non preemptive if it cannot be interrupted if it cannot be interrupted that is non preemptive can be interrupted that is preemptive non preemptive algorithms we have fcfs sjf priority hrrn preemptive round robin srtf this is what you also say as preemptive version of sjf priority multi level queue and multi level feedback queue here fcfs has the drawback of convoy effect SJF priority has the drawback of starvation. Even in the priority also, SRTF priority preemptive priority preemptive MLQ also has the drawback of starvation. HRRN multi level feedback QRR free from the starvation okay <coughs> and definitely you should revise this once when you say oh yes the code the operating system code logically can be viewed as two sections user section kernel section accordingly we are getting these names user mode and kernel mode to switch from user mode to kernel mode we require a privileged instruction what is needed to switch from user mode to kernel mode where is this Wait a minute. Hmm. 
a privileged instruction is required and to switch from kernel mode to user mode non privileged instruction required so here we are indicating user mode with 1 and kernel mode with 0 but actually you can use as per our uh, wish but generally used st uh, flag values are like this user mode means mode bit 1 kernel mode means mode bit 0 then we should revise this deadlocks concept without fail because this is very important concept <clears throat> and we can expect a question from this topic. So, when you say the system is in the deadlock state, when process is waiting for certain resource, that resource is held by another waiting process mutually then you say it as deadlock. So, for this deadlock to occur, these four conditions must be satisfied. Mutual exclusion, no preemption, hold and wait, circular wait. Mutual exclusion says resource must be non-shareable resource. No preemption that says no process can be preempted or no resource can be forcibly released. Hold and wait. As the name indicates, to request a resource. process must acquire one resource. Circular weight says cyclic weight. When these four conditions exist, then you say yes, there is a deadlock. To handle this deadlock, we have prevention, avoidance, detection, recovery and ignorance. <coughs> Prevention can be done in two ways, one by having sufficient number of resources other by making any of the four conditions false. Right? But both are practically not possible and for avoidance and detection we can use resource allocation graph algorithm when there is a single instance of resource we can use bankers algorithm when there are multiple instances of resources Right. <clears throat> so, to prevent from the deadlock, just give me a minute. To prevent from the deadlock, minimum you should have sufficient number of resources. Right. So, to prevent from deadlock, How do we calculate minimum number of resources needed? So, 
let r i be the resource requirement n be number of processes m be number of resources then for what minimum value summation of resource requirement less than m plus n for what <coughs> minimum value it satisfy that is m or m must be greater than or equal to every resource requirement we satisfy one less sum up all whole plus one so we can use any of these two formulae to find minimum number of resources to prevent deadlock what is the difference between prevention and uh, avoidance prevention means uh, guaranteed that deadlock never occur right avoidance cannot guarantee cannot assure that's why deadlock may occur that's why we have detection right so everyone need to revise banker's algorithm this formula prevention avoidance are what uh, must and should or most important from this deadlocks concept then <coughs> disk scheduling algorithms everybody should revise because there is a possibility for getting a question from this and it it is very easy guys so why to lose unnecessarily marks from such a easy concept so better you revise this disk scheduling just one time with one one or two two problems of each algorithm okay so in which order the cylinders are accessed that is what disk scheduling we have four algorithms fc fs sstf scan c scan look c look if we take one example suppose we are given the request for cylinders the request for cylinders came in this order 30 45 75 12 and 60 total let's say we are having 100 cylinders and the current head position is at 50 then what we do is first we mark this on the surface in the increasing order we locate this given cylinder numbers in the increasing order means we try to position them then if we follow fcfs in the given order we have to traverse so first 30 then 45 then then 75 then 12 then 60 in this order so total head movement we calculate <clears throat> if you go for shortest seek time first from 50 which is near 45 or 60 45 from 45 which is near both are at same distance please observe here the current direction will get priority okay if nothing is given from the current position both are two cylinders are at same distance the current direction get the priority okay remember that and from 30 12 is near from 
60, then 75. Right? And the other Zero, twelve, thirty, forty-five, fifty, sixty, and seventy-five. If I take <coughs> scan scheduling, what scan says? Let's say we are given the direction as towards largest cylinder. The current head movement is. So we will go till the end of it. Then in the reverse direction, we will scan the remaining. This is what scan. This is also called as what? Elevator algorithm. And what is the C scan? Like scan, we will the head reach the end of the surface, then it reach the other end in the same direction the cylinders are accessed and what is look scheduling it is like scan but no need to reach the end c look like c scan but no need to reach the ends Right? So, all the way <coughs> you should you should be able to calculate the total head movement and how many times the head is changing its direction. Okay? Here, please be careful, be attentive while doing the calculation part because very much possibility for committing the mistakes. Okay, so do revise this disk scheduling algorithms once it is very easy. Then memory management topic. First you should understand a memory can be partitioned into either of a fixed size or variable size partitions. Fixed size partitioning has the drawback of internal fragmentation variable size both internal and external fragmentation but this external fragmentation can be handled by compaction procedure compaction algorithm right in the variable size, when multiple partitions suit <coughs> the given process, which partition to select? For that, we have four different allocation methods. First fit, next fit, best fit, worst fit. So, how they work, everybody should revise. And how the memory handle the free space. For that, we have four different ways. One using bitmap or bit vector. It is simple but waste much memory. And need to verify this clustering issue kind is there. So, we go with linked list. Here also much memory gets wasted, but sequential access is permitted. Then we go with grouping method, counting method. This grouping method is what <coughs> guide you to the file systems i node concept guys index node concept 
right and for allocation we have three forms of allocation contiguous linked and indexed indexed allocation method is what using this i nodes index node so how many i nodes to uh, maintain for certain file how to calculate that file size i think you are recalling everything right then everybody should recall this paging segmentation once whenever the process is partitioned into equal size partitions they are what we say pages unequal size partitions they are what we say segments right these pages addresses are what we call as virtual addresses even segment addresses also but more strictly speaking page address is what we say virtual address segment address generally called logical address but okay you can use one for the other and and <coughs> the actual location of this page means actual frame of these pages is what we call as main memory addresses they are physical addresses so as we follow this random allocation we maintain page tables before that we have to recall virtual memory ones when there is a insufficient space in the main memory to hold user content some portion of secondary memory acts as main memory that is what you say virtual memory so this virtual memory maintains some swap space in the hard disk this swap space do swap in and swap out in this way complete content can be supplied to cpu but when the number of swap ins and swap outs becomes usually more than usual and this number of swap in and swap out are high that leads to thrashing issue the remedy for thrashing is what this demand paging means load the page into frames only after it is requested or demanded by cpu so <clears throat> first time any page is requested definitely fault occur right then comes page replacement algorithms pfo lru optimal suppose there are four frames if the page are requested the page reference string let's say is in this order 4 2 6 4 8 7 8 2,4,3,8,4,6 then how many faults occur? suppose I am taking FIFO I am taking 4 frames first time for any fault occur 4 hit 8 fault 7 fault occurred now as per FIFO 4 is replaced by 7 <clears throat> 2 hit occur 4 fault occur 
So, 4 replaces what? 2. 3 fault occur. First time requested. So, 3 replaces 6. 8 hit occur. 4 hit occur. 6 fault occurred. So, 6 replaces what? 8. So, total how many faults? 3 plus 2, 5 plus 2, 7 plus 1, 8. For the same 4, 2, 6, 4, 8, 7, 2, 4, 3, 8, 4, 6. If I use LRU policy, how many faults occur? First time in any algorithm, first time requested page fault occur. So, 4 fault occur, 2 fault occur, 6 fault occur, 4 hit occur because it is there, 8 fault occur, 7 fault occur. Now, as per LRU algorithm, in 8, 4, 6, 2, 2 is least recently used. So, 2 is replaced by 7. 2 hit occur, uh, fault occur. As per LRU, 7, 8, 4, 6. 6 is least recently used, so 6 is replaced by 2. 4 hit occur, 3 fault occur. In 4, 8, 2, 7, 4, 8 is least recently used, so 8 is replaced by 3. 8 fault occur. In 3, 4, 2, 7, 7 is replaced by 8. 4 hit occur, 6 fault occur. 6 replaces in uh, 4, 8, 3, 2, 2 is replaced by 6. So, total faults, total faults 3 plus 2, 5, 3 plus 3, 6 plus 2, 8, uh, 9 faults here. If I follow optimal, what optimal says? Look at the future request. <clears throat> so, for 4, 2, 6, 4, 8, 7, 2, 4, 3, 8, 4, 6. First time requested all fault occur. 4 hit 8 fault occur, 7 fault occur. Now, as per optimal, look at the future, which is not required in 4, 2, 6, 8, long later, which is re needed 6. So, 6 is replaced by 7. Now, 2 hit occur, 4 hit occur, 3 fault occur. In 8, 4, 6, uh, 8, 4, 2, 7, 2 or 7, you can use any one to replace 3. Now, 8 hit occur, 4 hit occur, 6 fault occur. 6 you can replace any because now it is last one. So, how many faults? 3 plus 2, 5 plus 6, 1, 6, 7, 7 faults. Like this, we can calculate number of page faults. This is also simple question, generally for one mark, this page replacement algo concept is uh, picked. So, please do revise it, because every mark is important. Here, PIFO algorithm has one special drawback that is Billardi's anomaly effect. What is this? For certain, for few page reference strings, when number of frames increased, faults also increase. That is what Billard's anomaly effect, right? So, do remember that, okay? <coughs> then, page tables, yes, everybody should practice this page tables numericals, very, very important. When a process is divided into pages, let us say 4 pages, 
पेज जीरो पेज वन पेज टू पेज थ्री एज दीज पेजेस आर लोडेड इन टू मेन मेमरी एट रैंडम लोकेशन लेट से पेज जीरो इज एट फ्रेम फोर्टी टू पेज वन एट फ्रेम सिक्सटी नाइन पेज टू एट फ्रेम फिफ्टी सेवन एंड पेज थ्री एट फ्रेम वन फोर्टी वन देन विच पेज लोडेड इन टू विच फ्रेम दट इज वॉट मेन्टेन्ड इन द फॉर्म ऑफ टेबल सो पेज जीरो इन फोर्टी टू पेज वन इन सिक्सटी नाइन पेज टू इन फिफ्टी सेवन पेज थ्री इन वन फोर वन दिस इज वॉट वी से पेज टेबल सो वॉट इज मेन्टेन्ड इन द पेज टेबल मेन मेमरी फ्रेम नंबर सो द एसेंशियल एंट्री इन पेज टेबल इज मेन मेमरी फ्रेम नंबर हाउ मेनी एंट्रीज आर देर फॉर एवरी पेज देर इज ए एंट्री सो नंबर ऑफ पेज टेबल एंट्रीज विल बी इक्वल टू नंबर ऑफ पेजेस and how do you get the page table size page table size if you want how many entries are there and what is every entry size if you multiply you will get the page table size if this page table uh, before that where this page table should be stored in that also in one frame number if this page table size exceed frame size what is frame size remember page size and frame size will be same then when page table size exceed frame size what we do multi level paging for example this page table i am dividing into two pages again this is page 0 this is page 1 so page 0 of page table i am storing in 214 location page 1 of page table i am keeping in let us say frame number 9 for that another page table is maintained page 0 in 214 page 1 in 9 this is what another page table this page table is what we say outermost page table or first level page table this is called innermost page table or second level page table if this size is also more than frame size this we again do partition in this way multi level paging is extended okay so let's say this outermost page table is stored in frame number 90 this frame number is what maintained in पेज टेबल बेस रजिस्टर सो हियर नंबर ऑफ मेमरी रिफरेंसेस आर गेटिंग एक्सीडेड इज इंट इट सो वी मेन्टेन टी एल बी so tlb maintain frequently or most frequently requested pages information they don't maintain pages that pages information so example tlb looks like this suppose this is the tlb 
it is maintaining process id page number frame number process 0 page 3 in frame number 27 process 0 frame page 9 in frame number 41 process 1 page 2 in pro frame number 37 process 2 page number uh, 6 in frame number 11 like this tlb maintain frequently requested pages frame number so if any page is needed any page info is needed how page info we will identify or represent with the two forms of addresses virtual address physical address cpu generates virtual address what this virtual address is consisting of page number and page offset this page number 2 frame number transition is what happens through page table and offset would be same because page size and frame size are same this is what we call as physical address right so if the requested page <coughs> we want certain page first what we do we verify in tlb if it is available in tlb there is no need of uh, uh, referring memory there is no need of referring memory right so what we do is We verify TLB first. If it is there in TLB, we go to main memory directly, we will get the frame. If not, then we refer all the page tables multiple times. So, if we need to find the effective access time, if it is a TLB hit, you refer TLB once and main memory once. If it is TLB miss, refer TLB and n plus 1 times main memory. So, T1 is TLB access time, T2 is main memory access time, n is number of levels of paging. Right? So, please do revise this. This is considering no page fault. And H is TLB hit ratio. Are you guys following? Please respond. Okay, just give me a moment. Just give me a moment, guys.
<coughs> yes then yeah another important must and should uh, to be revised topic is ipc synchronization where it starts we will understand about concurrency means whenever multiple processes are accessing the resource concurrently that may lead to data inconsistency we call it as race condition so multiple processes need to access the resource share the resource in a synchronized way so how we can achieve that synchronization for that for that we will go with this critical section concept what this critical section is we will keep the shared resource guarded by entry section and exit section so this is the area where shared resources are kept that is what we call as critical section so what we have to write in the entry section and what in the exit section that is what important <clears throat> right so for that entry and exit sections whatever the code we write we call them as solutions to critical section problem so whatever the solutions we derive those solutions should satisfy three conditions mutual exclusion progress and bounded waiting isn't it mutual exclusion progress bounded waiting so mutual exclusion says that at a time only one process in the critical section progress says that no strict alternation bounded waiting says that no starvation so satisfying these conditions satisfying these conditions we have got several solutions busy waiting solutions non busy waiting solutions right we can say some solutions to critical section problem everybody do revise these solutions so that you will understand how to analyze progress satisfied bounded waiting satisfied or uh, mutual exclusion satisfied or not so that the same you can apply in the gate questions okay so what they are using turn variable it require strict alternation so no progress we say using peterson solution it works for only two processes then lock variable again it may lead to deadlock so we do test and set lock <coughs> tsl we say test and set lock this is one fine solution then semaphores here comes binary semaphore and counting semaphore 
here comes two operations operation p operation v p operation decrements semaphore value v operation increments semaphore value accordingly we will get some simple questions for one mark questions if some s value is 7 then 15 p operations 18 v operations like that so it is those many increments decrements if you do you will get the result right and uh, in, a, in addition to this the other solutions will be like monitors disabling interrupts please do go through all these solutions and their analysis ones so that you will understand how to analyze the given program code in the actual gate exam okay are we fine so far everybody Right. <clears throat> Before moving on to other subject, guys, our test series is now available live through which you can practice to the most with 4000 plus practice questions with virtual calculator help so that you will be habituated to it and complete detailed mock analysis is there for every question. So, do avail this test series. Now you can subscribe to our BEP channel and press the bell icon so that you will get notifications about our daily scholarship tests and workshops and also you can get <coughs> our free ebook. Okay. Now moving on to C programming. Firstly everybody, I do not take much time for C programming because uh, Recently only I have taken uh, this C programming session. So, I just briefly, quickly I do the revision. First, everybody do not neglect C tokens because nowadays we are getting questions from this. So, C tokens, we have identifiers, keywords, constants, strings, operators, special symbols. Please understand what are what. Suppose if I write sim some simple code like void main int a equal to 3, b equal to 7, comma c, c is equal to a multiplied by b divided by a plus b, something like this. print a equal to uh, c is equal to percentile d comma c. Please identify what are the tokens here and what tokens are there. <coughs> void is a keyword, main is the identifier. These are special symbols. Right, A, B, C, names, identifiers, printf, name, identifier and these are star, plus, division, minus, these are all operators. In this way, you should be able to identify what token is what in the given code. Okay? Then unary, binary, ternary operators. What are different uh, unary operator, binary operators and ternary operators? Unary 
unary operators wait unary operators we have increment decrement logical not bitwise not sin plus sin minus pointer in direction address of size of binary operators we have again arithmetic logical bitwise and shift relational assignment arithmetic means addition subtraction multiplication division modulus logical and or bitwise and bitwise or xor left shift right shift relational less than less than equal to greater than greater than equal to not equal to equal to assignment single equal to how they work please revise ternary operator which is also called as conditional operator so do revise how each operator works okay because we can expect a question and and most importantly operator precedence and associativity there is a big table but i know i mean you people know i have given a short code to remember the table that is u a s r b l t a c i think everybody remember the code u a s r b l tag u for unary a for arithmetic shift relational bitwise logical ternary assignment comma this is the priority and associativity for <coughs> unary and uh, ternary right to left for comma and for the other left to right in that way i i have given you a simple trick to remember this total precedence right guys don't ignore this you can expect a question and then data types primitive non primitive primary secondary user defined what are primary data types void char int and float these four are said to be primary for these you can apply type qualifiers what signed unsigned short and long secondary data types the other functions structures unions files these are all called secondary data types and enum and enumerated data types and type def defined data types are sec user defined data types please recall the ranges and the sizes ones because whenever the range exceed wrap around happens in the same way in the same way type conversions everybody need to revise once implicit and explicit okay short to long or short to int int to float 
implicit type casting. Similarly, int to char, char to int. The other sorry. Short care long float this explicit type casting into to care and care to int implicit type casting. So, how it occur whenever we use what format specifier, what does that mean? Please revise once. Okay. Then everybody should without fail, everybody should revise about control statements once. Sir, means if he fails? No. Majorly about to switch guys, about to switch. This is very, very important. About switch, I have given five important points if you remember. what. Default and break are optional in switch. Cases can be in the random order. Cases can be non consecutive. Duplicate cases are not allowed. And only int and care cases are allowed. These five important points you please remember about switch. Okay. And then how loop works, loops works. Unconditional control statements generally not focused much in the gate, but better know the functionality of continue and go to once. However, break we will revise in switch. Okay. Just for safe side. Then, <clears throat> yeah. How does this pointer works? Directly let me take you to this pointers and arrays. Guys, Please refer to this, how you will calculate the address of one dimensional array element, two dimensional array element in the row major and column major order. I have already uh, presented how to calculate the address. Please this PDF would be available to you in uh, telegram groups of mine and DV sir. So, please do. join our telegram group and so that you can get the pdf once the complete session is over uh, our dvsr is waiting so i'll hand over the session to sir okay so if pointers and arrays when you combine with one dimensional array if a is the array and p is the pointer how the conventions are and how they mean what they mean i have given here Please go through this, it helps you to understand uh, about pointer and array combined usage. Okay? Okay, everyone, please do respond.
and COA important formulae important points I will keep in the PDF just go through them those formulae will help you almost to solve uh, many questions all right so this is my telegram group link join cs underscore by underscore satyanarayana you can join to get the pdf and uh, for the doubts clearance okay thank you so much for joining the session guys now i will hand over the session to dv sir i think uh, our sridhar sir is uh, waiting since almost long time So, let me confirm with the sir once. Okay, DV sir, please take over the session. Thank you so much guys. Thank you so much for uh, joining the session. All the very best. See you in the next session. Thank you. DV sir, over to you. Continue. I think I can continue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good afternoon, dear friends. Welcome to Baiju's exam prep, and I welcome all for this particular session. Uh, I think uh, such as are uh, completed four important subjects, and you are all uh, very comfortable with those four subjects because he revised uh, in a very detailed manner all the four subjects. Okay. So, I welcome all for this particular 50 marks in just 5 hour series. See, it's not like you know you are going to get 50 marks, but the necessary information which is required for this 50 marks will be given here. Okay. So, already Sachasar has completed uh, four subjects. I will be completing the remaining three subjects that is discrete mathematics, algorithms, and data structures for you, my dear friends. Are you ready? Okay. Please keep commenting. Hi, Nagendra Ora. Good afternoon. Very good afternoon, sir. How are you doing? Please join the session. Okay. Share, subscribe this particular session to all your friends. Right? Right. So, you have this particular scholarship, uh, my dear friends. Uh, we'll be getting up to 90% scholarship uh, for Baiju's exam prep uh, uh, courses. So, please do uh, attend, uh, which is uh, to be conducted on 22nd January. Okay. Please register and link will be in the description, sir. You can find the link in the description, right? And this is about me, myself, Sridhar Dhulipala. I'm having 20 plus years of teaching experience. I'm associated with Baijus from almost from past two years. Initially, we were working on this particular project called Recorded Gate Content, first of its kind. And I recorded engineering mathematics for all branches, whereas for our computer science students, Discrete mathematics, algorithm, programming, and data structures are recorded. So, in this session, I'll be discussing the three subjects that is discrete mathematics, algorithms, and data structures, the outline course. Okay. So, uh, I'll be giving you the outline of all these three subjects. Okay. It's a kind of short notes. Am I clear? See, short notes will not be same for everyone, my dear friends. So, it varies from person to person because what you want to remember, see what will strike you at the time of okay revision so that you need to actually make a short notes so here i'll be giving you the formula list so you can make use of that particular formula list which can help you in revising the concepts quickly so let me start with uh, discrete mathematics okay of course uh, there is one uh, masters msq series which is uh, starting i think today such as are is starting with uh, computer networks and tomorrow I'll be coming up with discrete mathematics MSQ series. Okay. 
so expected msq questions and how to approach these questions will be discussed in this of course we'll be coming up with uh, other uh, subjects also my dear friends stay tuned please connect i think it is already started from some branches yesterday uh, inaugural was happened for this msq series and from tomorrow will be starting from today that is on 18th such as are is starting with uh, you know cn and tomorrow i'll be coming up with discrete mathematics msq series okay See 9 p.m. Uh, today and tomorrow, I think it's 9 p.m., sir. Uh, you please uh, stay tuned and in the, uh, you know, your uh, Telegram uh, group, I'll be discussing all that. See, this is a Telegram group of mine. You can join this particular Telegram group. Uh, you can join this particular Telegram group for the PDF of today's session and it would be password protected as usual. Password will be shared, okay, in between the subjects, okay. So, please stay tuned till end. So, definitely you can get the PDF of this particular class of mine as well as such a sir. Am I clear? Right, sir. So, stay tuned for all these courses. Keep, okay, sharing these sessions, like this session and subscribe. Right. So, some important series. Uh, uh, hope you all know this series expansion. Can you tell me what is sigma 1? I not given that. What is sigma 1? Can you please tell me what is sigma 1? What is sigma 1? What is sigma 1? See, this session will be very, very fast. So, I will be covering most of the information in a very, 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 very aggressive manner. So, I will be going in a very, very high speed. Okay, you should have high speed internet. This one. Not, I am talking about the other internet. Right? So, it is sigma. Okay, it depends on R or N. Very good. Sigma 1 is 1 added to itself n times. Sigma I generally we write it, which is sum of first n natural numbers, which is n into n plus 1 by 2, my dear friends. In algorithms, you also write it as theta n square by dropping lower order terms and ignoring the coefficient of highest order term. Then sigma I square is sum of squares of first n natural numbers, that is n into n plus 1 into 2n plus 1 by 6, which is of theta order n cube, my dear friends. And sigma I cube will be n square into n plus 1 whole square by 4, which is of order n power 4. Similarly, sigma i power k will be of order n power k plus 1. You can remember, sir. So, similarly, you can remember sigma i power k is of order n power k plus 1. This is a very, very standard result. Please remember this. And Hn, it is called harmonic series. For harmonic series, the sum of first n terms is given by, actually, you approximate with integration, you get log n to the base c, but base of logarithm asymptotically does not matter. So, we get theta log n, my dear friends. We get theta log n, my dear friends. So, I will be starting with discrete mathematics, very, very basic rules and advanced rules. All the rules will be covered in this short and quick session. It is a kind of very quick revision of results which you should know before going for your gate examination. Right? Wonderful. Now, the number of subsequences are there for string of length n. See, subsequence means it is formed by deleting the uh, symbols either from the front or from the end or anywhere. So, the number of subsequences of a string of length n, yes, you need to answer this quickly, sir. If you know any answer, you need to answer this quickly. Number of subsequences of string of length n is equal to what? The number of subsequences of string of length is 2 power n, the most important result. And number of substrings, we also call them as subwords. See, substrings are formed by deleting the symbols either from the beginning or from the end, but not from the middle. Okay? So, if you delete from the beginning, you are going to get suffix. If you delete from the end, you are going to get prefixes. Am I clear? So, number of substrings of a string of length n is given by n into n plus 1 by 2. See, my dear friends, in subsequences, default empty subsequence is involved, whereas in substrings, empty substring is not involved by default. If you want empty substring, you have to add 1 to that. Whereas, if you want to delete empty subsequence, you have to subtract 1 from total number of subsequences. Please remember that variation. Now, pigeon hole principle. What this pigeon hole principle says is, see my dear friends, if you have less places and more people, congestion will be more. Obviously, people sit over each other. Suppose you are having three seats 
और स्वीट्स थ्री सीट्स एंड फोर पीपल फर्स्ट पर्सन में गो टू द फर्स्ट सीट सेकेंड पर्सन में गो टू द सेकेंड सीट थर्ड पर्सन में गो टू द थर्ड सीट बट फोर्थ पर्सन ही हैज नो अदर चॉइस एक्सेप्ट सिटिंग ऑन अदर पर्सन so when you are having less number of seats or left less number of places and more people obviously congestion will happen so in one place you can find at least two members that is what pigeon hole principle says and you can write the generalized version of this pigeon hole principle sir if there are n pigeon holes and there are see when you are having n plus 1 pigeons at least two pigeons are conformed in one pigeon hole If you are having two n plus one pigeons, then at least two plus one three pigeons are, uh, I mean, uh, placed in one of the pigeon hole, my dear friends. And if you are having k n plus one pigeons, then some pigeon hole contains at least k plus one pigeons. But actually, what we do is we use this generalized principle to solve problems, my dear friends. If you are having n pigeon holes and k pigeons. then some pigeon hole contain at least how many pigeons then some pigeon hole contains at least how many pigeons simply do k by n seal of it k by n seal of it will give you the answer okay for example if you are having say 21 people at least how many are born at least how many are born on same day of a week see i will be completing my marathon series uh, that is scheduled i think on 22nd sunday 6 pm where i'll be doing see if you do this revision of formula problems will be done in marathon series so i'll be coming up with the problems of every type so i'll be taking formulas will not be discussed there directly problems within the problem i'll be discussing formula my dear friends okay so this is a formula series very good sir just write down 21 by 7 which is exactly 3 which is exactly 3 suppose if it is 22 you can get the answer 4 my dear friend nagendra ora very good nana super now actually sometimes what happens you will be having at least number that is this number is given and you need to find the minimum number of people in such cases also you can use this particular rule suppose the minimum number of pigeons to guarantee at least k plus 1 pigeons in some pigeon hole is nothing but k n plus 1 but it is difficult to remember because k plus 1 first you have to find k then you have to write k n plus 1 so you can write the same result in a simplified version the minimum number of pigeons to guarantee at least k pigeon in some pigeon hole is given by k into k minus 1 into this is k means k minus 1 into n plus 1 k minus 1 into n plus 1 so if i ask this question like okay if i ask the question like uh, minimum number of okay students to guarantee minimum number of students to guarantee at least four students born on same month of a year same month of a year what about this minimum number of students to guarantee at least four students see at least this is four is given what is the minimum number of students to guarantee at least four students born on same month of a year at least two students born on uh, born on uh, same month of a year what should be the answer for this 37 very good nana so k4 is given so that is k minus 1 3 into because month of a year is 12 3 into 30 3 into 12 plus 1 which is nothing but 37 very good super wonderful super sri devi super nagendra doing well now we have this permutations without repetition formula r permutation of n objects without repetition is given by the formula n p r of course you, those who do not know the formula it is n factorial by n minus r factorial and many people have problem with basic results please correct your results my dear friends it is useful not only here even in your aptitude also now number of permutations of n objects without repetitions see n objects means n objects in n places and by default when you say permutation it is linear permutation and that is given by n factorial so number of permutations of n objects is given by 
n factorial my dear friends number of permutations of n objects is given by n factorial my dear friends now what about number of permutations of number of permutations of n minus 1 objects sorry number of circular permut okay n minus 1 that is fine number of circular permutations of n objects what about number of circular permutation of n objects circular permutation when you want fix a object arrange the remaining in linear manner that is n minus 1 factorial very good sri devi right now combinations with repetition r combination of n objects without repetition is given by ncr which is n factorial by r factorial into n minus r factorial and some general result one should know like nc0 or ncn is equal to 1 nc1 okay is equal to n and ncr is equal to nc n minus r and results like nc0 plus nc1 plus and so on ncn is equal to 2 power n now result like even combinations yeah odd combinations even combination yeah odd combination sum is equal to 2 power n minus 1 see these are the standard result one should be having them on their fingertips my dear friends okay for them you don't have to think too much directly they should be on your fingertips please remember the standard results now let us see some very important results on sets my dear friends suppose we are having a set having n elements we are having a set having n elements how many subsets are there for this particular set how many subsets are there for this particular set see i generally tell students to revise the formulas on regular basis and I tell them this revise uh, the revision of the formula on regular basis. When you keep on doing it, first time it may take long time, but if you keep on doing it, this revision of the formulas hardly takes one minute or two minutes practices. So the entire formula list which I am giving today, okay, may take initially one hour time, but if you keep on practicing on regular basis, the entire formula list can be revised within half an hour, okay, or within 15 minutes. Very good, Nagendra Vora. Number of subsets of a set having n elements is 2 power n and number of subsets of a set is same as number of elements in power set of a set because power set is nothing but set of all subsets. So that is also equal to 2 power n. Now earlier we written one formula in combinations that is nc0 plus nc2 plus nc3 and nc4 and so on and nc1 plus nc3 plus nc5 and so on is equal to 2 power n minus 1 and that result is useful here. See the results which you write in combinations are useful in other topics as well. For example in set theory I can ask you like number of subsets of a containing odd number of elements that is how many subsets are containing one element how many subsets are containing three elements and so on so what is the answer what about the answer for this so this is same as 2 power n minus 1 this is same as 2 power n minus 1. very good sri devi because number of subsets containing odd number of elements, yeah, number of subsets containing even number of elements is 2 power n minus 1. By this formula, you can easily get that. Set. See, these formulas are very, very important. That is, number of subsets containing a certain number of elements, you can understand from this. Very good, Nagendra Vara. Suppose a set is having 6 elements. A set is having 6 elements. Number of subsets having, number of subsets having 4 elements. Can you answer this? How many subsets are having four elements? You have to practice it with numbers. Okay, always practice this with numbers. Hmm, 64. Paru uh, Gatecha, very good, sir. Here, 6 is given as 64. 6 factorial by 2 factorial into 4 factorial, that is 6 into 5 by 2, yani 15. 15 is the answer, right? There are 15 subsets having 4 elements. There are 15 subsets having 4 elements. Then we have some important set identities. See, these identities we will see in set theory, we will see in logic. We also see in Boolean algebra. 
these 10 properties are satisfied by any boolean algebras remember both uh, both set algebra as well as proportional algebras are boolean algebras both are boolean algebras these 10 properties must be on your fingertips i don't pretend identity domination negation double negation or complementation double complementation commutative associative absorption de morgan distribution c you should say the properties like this and you should remember the properties also like that and these are two sided conditions these are two sided conditions and one should know how to use them my dear friends if you just write them it is of no use they are available in every damn book they are available here also if you just write them it's of no use you should know how to use the result you should know how to use the result for example if i give you x union y intersection x union y whole complement what property is this what property is this you can just take this uh, properties you can spend almost one hour for solving problems on this that is the beauty of the results in discrete matrix i can just spend one hour time only on this results i'll just play with them that is what you need to understand that is how we should understand the result what is the answer for this A set intersection its complement is it not like a set intersection its complement a set intersection its complement is empty set okay a set intersection its complement is empty set that is what you call it as complementation law that is what you call it as complementation law okay you see a intersection a complement is empty set so we should know these results okay the first one is i don't pretend a union a is a yeah a intersection a is a identity law a union empty set is a a intersection universal set is a okay so that is identity getting back the same set very good nagendra Vada. then we have domination union or u universal set dominates with respect to union empty set dominates with respect to intersection see these properties must be on your fingertips am i clear see it is very simple at the same time it is very very difficult now some people say sir can i start now and complete it see there may be some subjects which can be completed like that but this is a subject where we explore the rules see unless or until you have you own the rules you cannot explore the rules my dear friends okay there may be sometimes uh, some simple problems okay where simple application of the rules may be given but generally the idea here is how to use the rules it's all about playing game with these rules remember that so please remember these 10 properties my dear friends and de morgan's and distributive properties are very very important and again de morgan's property people only remember this but you you should also write what is this also it's not given in this but you should be able to know how to write this also a union b complement whole complement is what which is a complement intersection b this is also de morgan's property only so one should know how to apply these properties okay it's all about that now the inclusion exclusion principle for two sets and three sets see the idea for inclusion exclusion principle whenever you want to find number of elements in the union number of elements in union it may be two sets three sets four sets five sets or hundred sets the logic is simple take all one combinations with plus sign then all two combinations with minus sign then all three combinations with plus sign then all four combinations with minus sign like that it continues this can be generalized to any extent my dear friends the idea is simple all one combinations will have plus sign like one combinations then two combinations will have minus sign. <coughs> here all one combinations will have plus sign all two combinations will have minus sign all three combinations will have plus sign okay here only one three combination that one fellow will be plus sign now what about a complement intersection b complement intersection c complement it is neither a nor b nor c see generally it is read as none and it is nothing but total minus at least one see union problem generally read as at least one so total minus at least one is none my dear friends and there are some applications of this uh, inclusion exclusion principle this formulas are very very important the first one is euler phi function which will give you the number of positive integers less than n and relatively prime to n number of positive integers less than n and relatively prime to n for example if i ask what is 524 first of all you have to write the prime factorization for that that is 2 cube into 3 in this you have to identify the prime factors like 2 
2 and 3, we can call them as P1, P2. Then 524 is given by N into 1 minus 1 by P1 into 1 minus 1 by P2, which is nothing but 24 into 1 by 2 into 2 by 3. So, it is 8. So, this particular formula is very, very useful by definition. So, this particular results, they can ask you directly in the examination. They asked also in the examination. Okay. Please note that result, my dear friends. Next comes derangement formula. Derangement means the number of arrangements of n objects in such a way that no object occupies its natural position. No object occupies its natural position. That is called derangement and we have this beautiful formula which is n factorial into 1 by 2 factorial minus 1 by 3 factorial plus 1 by 4 factorial. Alternatively, you get plus minus signs and last one is plus minus 1 power n by n factorial. Okay, that's it. Actually, we can write the simplified version of this by writing this way, which is actually approximately equal to, which is actually approximately equal to e power minus 1. So, we can approximate this with n factorial by e, my dear friends. We can approximate this uh, derangements of n objects with n factorial by e. That is an approximate formula for derangements of n objects, my dear friends. Now, we move on to the propositions, Babu. Propositions. See, proposition means what a declarative sentence which is either true or false but cannot be both. Okay, that is what you mean by proposition. See, the story of propositional calculus is what are the propositions, what are the operations on the propositions and how you can combine these uh, propositions using these operations and what are the properties. That is the story. So, here proposition, you know what is a proposition? It can be a declarative sentence which is either completely true or completely false but cannot be both. Now, we have five basic fundamental connectives. One is called negation, conjunction, disjunction, implication, by implication. Now, negation says sorry. Means whatever proposition P says, it says sorry to that. It says sorry to that. Am I clear? So, negation says if P is false, negation P is true or vice versa. If P is false, it is true. If P is true, it is false. Now, what about the next connective which is conjunction? See, conjunction is true when both P and Q are true. Conjunction is true when both P and Q are true. Then comes disjunction. Disjunction is false. Because actually, four cases, there are four lines of truth table will be there. Here, I given a beautiful result. If you are having n propositional variables, how many truth combinations are possible? Because each variable will have two possible truth com two true possible truth values. True or false, true or false, true or false, like that. So two into two into two into two into how many times? N times that is two power n my dear friends. That is two power n my dear friends. So when you are having two propositional variables, there will be four truth combinations. But when it is a conjunction, you, sh you should see when it is true because conjunction is true in less number of cases. In one case, it is true, remaining three cases, it is false. Disjunction is false in less number of cases. In one case, it is false. In remaining cases, it is true. So, we see when it is false. So, a disjunction is false when both P and Q are false. Next, the most important one, I will be discussing some more properties of this implication, the heart of logic heart of logic is implication and implication is false. They say that true cannot imply false. That is true implying false is false. True implying false is false. And then comes the by implication, double implication, by conditional, by implication, whatever names you can give. And a by conditional is true when both P and Q have same truth value. Same means both are true. Yeah, both are false. When both are true or both are false, then biconditional is true, my dear friends. And this is about the implication. So, when you write an implication, the P is called antecedent, premise or hypothesis and Q is called consequent yato conclusion. Okay, or left side, right side also you can call it, but better terminologies are available, sir. So, whenever you write implication in the literature there are many forms for implication that is an implication can be expressed in english language in many ways but you should not worry about the nuisance of english language so they fixed some standard formats in which an implication can be expressed means whenever you see this particular format 
you can understand it as an implication and can write the symbolic form for that. So the standard form for implication for P implies Q R, P implies Q, if P then Q, P only if Q or you can write it as Q if P, Q when P, Q whenever P, Q unless negation P. See, these are the different forms in which an implication can be expressed. These are the different forms in which an implication can be expressed. And two more forms like necessary and sufficient conditions. These are very, very useful when you write the theorems. So, understanding theorems, the two forms, like, you know, whenever you write P in place Q, okay, the P part is called sufficient condition and Q part is called necessary condition. So, if the condition is in P part, then it is called sufficient condition. If the condition is in Q part, that is called necessary condition. A standard example like continuity implies differentiability. So, continuity implies differentiability is wrong, sir. Actually, this is wrong. Differentiability implies continuity. Differentiability implies continuity. So, let me remove this nonsense. Hello, sir. Very good afternoon, Tushar Shushodia. After long time, I am seeing you. How are you doing, sir? See, differentiability implies continuity. So, it is in the P implies Q form. So, this differentiability is a sufficient condition. Sufficient means more than enough. Whereas, continuity is the minimal requirement for differentiability. See, many people, they read the theorems without understanding the meaning of necessary and sufficient condition. If you have some condition in P part, that is a sufficient condition. That is, if that condition happens definitely, Okay, the result is true. Even if the condition is not true, the result may happen. We don't know. But this is called sufficient condition. Whereas this condition on Q part, whenever it is available, that is called necessary, minimal requirement. Without that, this result cannot be true. Like that. So, please remember the importance of this sufficient and necessary condition. Sufficient means more than enough. So, if that condition happens, obviously result will be true. Without that condition also, result may be true. Whereas necessary condition means with this, this is the minimal requirement. But even if this condition is satisfied or if this requirement is satisfied, the result may not be true because it is just minimal requirement. That is, BTEC is required for writing gate examination. If I say that is minimal requirement, sir. That is not sufficient. You have to get the good rank now to clear your gate. Am I clear? So, like that. Please remember that. Then comes the precedence of the operators, very, very important. Negation is having highest precedence, then conjunction, then disjunction, then implication, then by implication. So, if I have some uh, result like this, you should understand the meaning of this. So, negation P is having highest precedence, then conjunction will have higher precedence, then implication will have higher precedence, then finally, by implication will be having highest precedence. Okay. So, this is the order of precedence by which you can understand even though they are not given the parenthesis. See, the precedence of operators are mainly introduced to avoid unnecessary parenthesization. Of course, you can't completely remove parenthesization, sir. But to remove unnecessary excessive parenthesis, we use precedence of operators. Remember that. Of course, tautology means a proposition which is always true. Contradiction means a proposition which is always false. Satisfiable means, satisfiable means true for at least one line of the truth table. Satisfiable means it should be true for at least one line of the truth table. Of course, satisfiable may become tautology. But, okay, satisfiable may become tautology. I am clear, but you can't guarantee that. Every tautology can be called as satisfiable. But satisfiable every time cannot be tautology, sir. Satisfiable every time cannot be tautology, but every tautology, because tautology means true for all instances. So, definitely for one instance or one line of the truth table, it will be definitely true. So, obviously done. That is the idea. Hope you understand and contingency means it is neither tautology nor contradiction. Neither tautology nor contradiction. So, we generally call it as satisfiable. We generally call it as satisfiable but not valid actually tautology they also call it as valid my dear friends tautology they also call it as valid my dear friends hope you understand all of you able to follow clear to you all 
Hope you understand. Now comes the most important things in logic is, see first thing which we need to know in logic is what are the, what do we mean by proposition, what are the connectives. We should understand the meaning, logical meaning as well as expressional way of writing and uh, connective, okay. How you express in English language you should know and the logical meaning of connective you should know. Then comes the equivalences, logical implications. The logical implications ultimately becomes the uh, ultimately becomes your rules of inference. See the equivalences we divide into three parts. Equivalences involving negation, conjunction, disjunction. These are exactly like your set identity set. Idempotent, identity, domination. Here it is negation, double negation, commutative, associative, absorption, demorgons and distributive properties. These properties are same in set algebra, in proportional algebra or in Boolean algebra my dear friends. One should master these 10 properties. The 10 properties must be on your fingertips. Remember that. <clears throat> then comes equivalences too. These are the equivalences involving implication. The most important equivalence or the implication is logical implication. What is logical implication, Babu? Logical implication says P in place Q can be converted to negation p r q that is implication can be converted to disjunction implication can be converted to disjunction my dear friends then comes law of contra positive and implication because uh, for every implication we have some associated implications called converse inverse and contra positive and an implication is same as its contra positive that is what this rule says my dear friends then comes this exportation law exportation law p implies Q implies R is equivalent to P and Q implies R. That is, if P, then R if Q can be written as P and Q, then R. Am I clear? So, this is exportation law, my dear friends. So, these four, three, and there are two more rules. These five rules are very, very important and they are called equivalences involving implication babu these are the equivalences involving implication and they must be on your fingertips okay they must be on your fingertips so what it says p implies q see here what happened antecedent is same then p implies q or p implies r is same as p implies q or r p implies that is r will remain r and will remain and but if consequent is same if consequent is same then P in place R or Q in place R will change to P and Q in place R. And we actually popularly use this result actually like you know gate exam require preparation and cat exam require preparation. That is nothing but gate exam require preparation, cat exam require preparation. Okay, that is same as gate and cat require preparation. So, this is the most useful result later on also my dear friends. One should remember. Then we have equivalences 3 which are equivalences involving by implication. By implication means what sir? By implication means necessary and sufficient condition. Therefore, it is P implies Q as well as Q implies P. Or one more way of remembering by implication is by implication is true when both are true or yeah, both are false. It is true when both are true or yeah, both are false. By implication is true my dear friends. And by implication can be equivalent to all these things. See, implication is equivalent to only contra positive version, but by implication is equivalent to Q if and only if P, negation P if and only if negation Q, negation Q if and only if negation P. So, all these forms are same, my dear friends. So, these are the most important equivalences, my dear friends, and you should master them. Then comes logical implication and implication which is tautology is called logical implication. And Okay, arguments will be of the form conjunction of premises implies conclusion and any inference or form of argument which is tautology is called rule of inference. Actually valid inference you call it and when any valid inference becomes rule of inference my dear friends. Any valid inference becomes rule of inference. So, these are all the rules my dear friends. You can write them like P and Q can give you P and Q. 
Now this will give you that P can give you P or Q. This is called addition principle. Then simplification P and Q can give you P. Of course, P and Q can also give you Q. So this is called simplification property. The next properties are modus ponens, the most used rule. P implies Q and P can imply Q, my dear friends. But please remember, when you write the rule, P implies Q, Q, therefore P, this is fallacy. This is called fallacy. You should be aware of the fallacies. See, rules must be used in the given order. Okay. So, this is called inductive proof. Okay. Uh, so, not inductive, sir. It is deductive proof. Okay. Deductive uh, logic, we call it. See, there is something called inductive logic. This is a deductive logic where we deduce something from the given rules. Okay. We deduce something from the given rules. Okay. See, there is something called inductive logic. Like, you know, suppose there is a, uh, uh, suppose the smoke. We conclude there may be a fire. See, this is called induction. Whereas, deductive proof means if there is a fire, then there is a smoke. There is a fire, therefore there is a smoke. So, it is called deductive logic, my dear friends. Okay. See, we are not talking about inductive logic. I am clear in movies, detectives will do something like that. That is not what we are going to do here, sir. It is a deductive logic. Based on the evidences, we prove something. Based on the evidences, we prove something, my dear friends. So, we are like lawyers or the judges. Based on the evidences and all the uh, available truths, we are going to make some conclusions. Remember, this is a deductive logic, not inductive logic. Please remember. Then comes modus tollens. What is this modus tollens rule says? <coughs> P implies Q and negation Q implies negation P. So, here you see, if the conclusion is negated, negation of hypothesis is the answer. But you have to be careful with the fallacies, my dear friends. Okay, here we are denying the consequent, but there is a possibility of denying antecedent. That is called fallacy. So, if you do something like P implies Q, negation P, therefore negation Q, this is wrong because here we are denying the antecedent instead of denying the consequent. So, one should know that, my dear friends. Got it? Then we have this hypothetical syllogism, simply transitive rules are P implies Q, Q implies R, therefore P implies R. So, this is your hypothetical syllogism. See, please practice all these rules, sir. See, without knowing the standard six rules minimum, you cannot proceed any further. Of course, remaining ones, you can solve them as problems. For example, disjunctive syllogism is given. P R Q is there. This can be written as negation P implies Q. And negation P is given. From modus ponens, you can get Q. Of course, this seven onwards, you can derive them. But first six rules, one should definitely remember. Because they are the basic rules. They are the basic rules. All other problems can be derived as solutions. See, for example, this can be derived. Okay. This can be derived, my dear friends. Okay. Please remember that. Disjunctive elimination. And generally, I ask students to remember them with some examples. Okay. It's better to remember them with some examples. P implies R, Q implies R, P R Q, therefore R. If I drink tea, I get energy. If I drink coffee, then I get energy. I drink tea or coffee, therefore I get energy. Like some nonsense example you can create, sir. You can say if I drink tea, I am a king. If I drink coffee, I am a king. I drink tea or coffee, therefore I am king. No problem. Okay. You can say if I drink tea, you are idiot. You are saying to someone. If I drink coffee, then you are idiot. I drink tea or coffee, therefore you are idiot. See, you can create some nonsense example to remember these rules, my dear friends. Okay. So, it's always beneficial to create some general example. Okay. Funny example. Whatever way you want. You create it. Okay. Okay. Maybe you want to praise someone. If I drink tea, you are intelligent. If I drink coffee, you are intelligent. I drink tea or coffee. Therefore, you are intelligent. See, you can make some examples out of it. Always make examples to remember these rules, my dear friends. Okay. So, once you can remember these rules with some example, your own examples, then you can remember them for a long time. Always do this practice. Am I clear? Always do this practice. Okay. So, if I give funny example, then Sri Devi likes it. Okay. If I go give good example, Sri Devi likes it. I give funny example or good example. Therefore, what is the conclusion? Sri Devi likes it. Okay. So, I just created an example. 
you can create examples like this because this logic requires that common sense okay so please create some general funny example for all the rules then you will remember for long if you just see p implies r q implies r if you like do like this you get some dance practice not result practice my dear friends always practice with some rules remember or practice with some examples resolution prq negation prr therefore qrr so you can try some uh, example my dear friend you can try some example here i drink tea or coffee now i don't drink uh, tea or i eat dosa so i drink coffee or eat dosa something like this see i it, it don't have to be very very beautifully framed examples don't try to make it a beautifully framed example what you get at that particular time or what you can think about it because i like eating more so my examples even in the class you see always i say tea coffee dosa idli somosa with this only i create the so examples for this uh see uh, ramesh yadav uh, uh see because it may vary but uh, i think uh, uh, minimum 40 40 percent marks can give you depending on you know what iit you are expecting i think uh, i i don't have that uh, data with me presently but you can connect with uh, my, my, our team or you can connect with me in the telegram group i can give you that information okay it's very simple to find sir okay and that particular data is very because that is not a gate question no i, I don't remember the data entirely uh, i don't remember this general data okay uh, sorry for that but uh, what i uh, expect is around um, uh, not just qualifications are minimum 40 50 marks i think you should get to get that pwd cat ramesh yadav what i uh, think is because uh, there may be some competition in every categories so uh, 40 marks to 50 marks is a decent marks to get into iits okay mr ramesh yadav that is what i feel you can just check the data available okay on the net very freely right so the other results also you please remember this similar manner my dear friends please remember practice these results with general examples always thank you sir then comes the predicate see predicate is an open proposition which is ready to be proposition but not proposition due to fact that it contains some variables whose values are to be taken from some set which is called universe of discourse am i clear once you put the values it becomes a proposition there are two ways of converting a predicate into proposition either you can substitute that is called by substitution you can convert a predicate into a proposition or you can use what is known as quantification but one thing you should remember here we are restricted sir we have only two quantifiers one is called universal quantifier one is existential quantifier whatever you want to say you have to say with just these two quantifiers nothing else that is a point to be noted now we have some standard form always remember instead of remembering all this try to remember where you are negating are you negating the quantifier or are you negating the predicate see for example if you see here you are negating the quantifier sum negation of sum is what none so it says none here if you see you are negating both quantifier as well as predicate negation of for all not all negation of predicate true negation is false not all false like that you can easily read these statements my dear friends am i clear see one should know how to uh, read the statements am i clear and for that i generally suggest this simple logic see what you are negating are you negating the predicate yeah quantifier from that you get the meaning properly actually from this meanings you can also get one important idea that is uh, you know how to negate the quantifier predicates because there is some relation between these fellows the first fellow all true is same as none false at least one true is same as not all false not all true means something is bad none true means everything is bad like that so there is some equivalences we can create which is called equivalence for my difference and with these equivalences we understand how to negate the quantified predicate <coughs> negating quantified predicate means when you take negation inside the universal changes to existential or existential changes to universal and that negation is applied to the predicate my difference and this is one of the important concept for gate point of view 
negating quantified predicates. Then this is called relation between quantifiers and connectives. So we generally call these results as the relation between quantifiers and connectives. Actually, in the gate examination, these results were asked directly. These results were asked directly. And generally, best way to remember them is conjunction works fine with universal quantifier, existential quantifier, okay, disjunction works fine. But disjunction with <coughs> universal quantifier works only in one direction, that is for all Px for all, or for all x, qx can imply for all x, px or qx, but not in the reverse order. Similarly, with existential quantifier, conjunction works in only one direction, that is there exist x, px and qx can imply there exist x, px and there exist x, qx, but not vice versa. And implication also works in one direction, for all x, px implies qx gives you, for all x, px implies for all x, qx my dear friends. Whereas, if you have one predicate and one proposition, all are equivalences, my dear friends, all are equivalences, my dear friends. But when you have one predicate and one proportion and implication is there, we have four different rules which can be very easily derived. For example, if you take the first one, for all x, p implies qx. This can be written as for all x, negation p or qx. Now, this can be written as because when it is one proportion, one predicate and disjunction is there, it is equivalence. You can directly distribute or you can directly uh, transfer the quantifier to the predicate. So, it becomes negation PR for all x qx, which is nothing but by law of implication, P implies for all x qx. So, directly you can get these results very, very easily by applying law of implication and using the previous set of rules, my dear friends. These, red, uh, these set of results, 1, 2, 3 are very, very powerful, very, very important, my dear friends, because they were asked in gate directly many times. They were asked in gate directly many times, directly results were asked in gate. You just need to identify which of the following is true or yeah, which of the following is false. So, these are the important candidate questions for your MC, MSQs also. So, in uh, MSQ series, tomorrow I am doing some MSQs. Please practice these results. So, I will give you two, three questions on this so that you can answer, plan to answer these questions, my dear friends. Please be ready. Tomorrow MSQ series at 9 p.m. on this topic. Then there are some uh, statement to symbolic form. Mainly the statements to symbolic forms are based on these two results. All P's are Q's. That is for all X, PX implies QX. So whenever all is used in this sense, for all is followed by implication. Whenever some is used in this sense, that is some P's are Q's. Some birds can fly. Some, some of my friends are intelligent. Some of my friends are useless fellows. Like this. <coughs> such examples whenever you have that sense the statement is given you can convert that that is uh, there exist is followed by conjunction my dear friends that is the idea okay so these are the two important aristotle forms then we can also have other form like not all p's are q's so that is negation of for all x px implies qx so this Negation, when you take inside and simplify, this becomes negation. There exist x, p, x and negation q, x. So, that means some p's are not q's. Some p's are not q's. So, like the alternative versions for this can also be obtained, my dear friends. But these are the two major or important forms one should remember. <clears throat> then, this is the relation between quantified two place predicates. See, here you need to understand this result mainly. That is, there exist y for all x can imply for all x there is a y. If you can remember, topmost thing you see for all x, for all y, for all y, for all x, they are equal, equivalent, two-sided. Whereas, there exist x, there exist y, there exist y, there exist x is equivalent. See, you just remember this relationship, my dear friends. You can easily remember this entire table, my dear friends. Remember, this is one of the important uh, question for gate point of view. Even this is a good candidate question for your MSQ, my dear friends. For MSQ, it is one of the very, very good candidate question, my dear friends. You should remember. Okay? Please remember this. Then, these are some general properties for relation. You all know it. If A contains M elements and B contains N elements, then number of elements in A cross B will be. You can write down answer, my dear friends. 
see are you able to catch up the speed sir are you able to catch up the speed i already informed you this will be a very 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 okay rapid fast session yeah man very good mr nagendra ora number of elements in power set of a cross b super shri devi number of elements in power set of a cross b Two power m n, very good. And number of subsets of a cross b. See whether number of elements in power set, yeah, number of subsets, both are one and the same because power set is set of all subsets. That is two power m n. Number of okay, here I written number of relations between a to b. See because a relation from set a to set b is nothing but a subset of a cross b. Therefore, number of relations, number of relations from A to B is same as number of subsets of A cross B. Number of subsets of A cross B, which is same as number of elements in power set of A cross B. See, Nagendra Ora, very good. You know that, but this is very important twist. People ask same question. This is, all these questions are same. You should know that, na? that is important point. Those who know can answer such questions just like that. And some very important rules about, you know, uh, functions like, you know, f of c1 union c2. That is, uh, function of union is union of function. That is, functional value of union is union of functional values. Functional value of union is union of functional values. This is always correct. But intersection, it cannot be equal. So, in general, f of c1 intersection c2 is subset. But when this will be equal, sir, if the function is 1, 1. When the function is 1, 1, then definitely f of c1 intersection c2 is also equal to f of c1 intersection f of c2. But in general, f of c1 intersection c2 is subset of f of c1 intersection f of c2. <coughs> See, <coughs> One important point about inverse. Whenever I see inverse, I will be very happy. Because when you see inverse means, it is a very good fellow. It is 1, 1, it is on 2. Simple to handle. Inverse, when you see inverse, you should feel very happy. But generally when you see inverse, people worry about it. My dear friends, inverse is also a function. And it is a very good function. It is 1, 1, it is on 2. Because f inverse exists only when the function is 1, 1 and on 2. Only when the function is 1, 1 and on to inverse exist. Otherwise, inverse does not exist. We should know that. Am I clear? And you see the same properties. Instead of function, if I use instead of function, if I have a function which is invertible, f inverse s union t will be f inverse s union f inverse t. And f inverse s intersection t will be equal to f inverse s intersection f inverse t. Why? Can you tell me why? Why this equal to happen? Can you tell me why this equal to happen? Can you tell me why this equal to happen? <coughs> Can you tell me why this equal to happen? See, in the previous result, I told you, if the function is 1, 1, I told you if the function is 1, 1, then the equal to will happen. And f inverse is not just 1, 1, sir, it is also on 2. f inverse means it is 1, 1 and on 2. Therefore, equal to will definitely will happen. Equal to definitely will happen. And it is one of the interesting results, my dear friends. One of the interesting results, my dear friends. <coughs> and about counting of functions. About counting of functions, one should know this. Okay. If A contains M elements and B contains N, okay, A contains N elements and B contains M elements, number of functions from A to B. How many functions are there from set A to set B? That is number of elements in B power, number of elements in A. Always try with some examples. Don't just practice like this. Keep some number of elements in set A, keep some number of elements in set B and practice. This is a very, very important question even in probability. This question can be asked even in probability, sir. They asked, 
they can ask you this kind of questions in probability also they can combine this concept with probability and ask questions remember that remember that okay so number of elements in uh, i mean number of functions from set a to set b is given by number of elements in b power number of elements in a number of one one functions from set a to set b is given by b p a and here b should be more than a my dear friend b should be more than a see number of elements in b should be greater than number of elements in a that is very important and how many one one functions from set a to set b when both are having equal elements that is given by n factorial my dear friend that is given by n factorial my dear friends and number of on two functions from set a to set b how many on two functions are there from set a to set b my dear friends of course this is given by formula mc0 actually minus 1 power 0 is plus 1 m minus that is m power n minus mc1 m minus 1 power n plus mc2 m minus 2 power n and so on that is the biggest formula you need to practice with examples my dear friends okay of course there is a special case when you are having uh, you know b having just one extra uh, mean b having one uh, less number than a we can solve it uh, quickly my dear friends but remember this formula because it is valid for all variations not just one variation for all variation this formula is valid so please remember this good for help now one very important result for composite functions see if f and g are like composite function means what sir if you are having set a to set b set b to set c if it f is this g is this see what it says if f and g both are one one the composition see this is composite function sir this is composite function my dear friends the composite function is also one one if f and g are onto composite function is onto and if f and g are 1 1 and r 2 composite function is also 1 1 and r 2 but the converse is partially true see the converse not completely true that is very important converse is partially true that is very important result my dear friends partially true that is if g circle f is the composition is 1 1 composition is 1 1 then both cannot be 1 1 sir in this f will be 1 1 am i clear f will be 1 1 see when the composition is 1 1 this has to be 1 1 when the composition is on 2 g will be on 2 so when the composition is 1 1 and on 2 f will be 1 1 you can't say about g but g will be on 2 you can't say anything about f this partial result is very important they asked in gate examination this is a very important result please note that now about relations next comes some relations on a set a my dear friends properties if a set contain n elements how many elements are there in a cross a number of elements in a cross a is n square elements so when you talk about different types of relations on a when you talk about different types of relations on a we have reflexive irreflexive symmetric asymmetric anti-symmetric and transitive am i clear so when you talk about different types of relations on a <coughs> okay how many relations are there my dear friends number of relations are there my dear friends number of relations is 2 power n square and how many reflexive relations are there that is 2 power n into n minus 1 same is the case for number of irreflexive so i suggest students to practice this with some numbers my dear friends maybe a is equal to 5 a is equal to 4 like this you practice with some numbers my dear friends you please practice it with some numbers you please practice all these values with some numbers like 3 4 5 6 like that please do that practice that is very very important okay so please do that practice my dear friends number of reflexive relations is 2 power n into n minus 1 number of irreflexive relations is 2 power n into n minus 1 both are same number of symmetric relation is 2 power n into n plus 1 by 2 or you can also remember it as 2 power n c 2 my dear friends you can also remember it as 2 power n c 2 my dear friends hope you understand then comes asymmetric relations how many asymmetric relations are there asymmetric is given by what sir 3 power n into n minus 1 by 2 n into n minus 1 by 2 then comes number of anti-symmetric relation this part will be same because in anti-symmetric relation the reflexive elements present or absent it does not matter so this is 2 power n into 3 power n into n minus 1 by 2 and number of reflexive and symmetric relations is given by 2 power n into n minus 1 by 2 my dear friends so please practice this with numericals practice this with numericals my dear friends 
Now this is one very important result. R inverse is also same. So if R is reflexive, R inverse is reflexive, R is irreflexive, R inverse is irreflexive, R is symmetric, R inverse is symmetric, R is and asymmetric, R inverse is asymmetric. So all are same, my dear friends. Whereas intersection also satisfies the same property as both R1 and R2. That is, if R1 and R2 are reflexive, so is their intersection. R1 and R2 are irreflexive, so is their intersection. R1 and R2 are symmetric, so is there the intersection. R1 and R2 are asymmetric, so is their intersection like that. But union when it comes, these three are guaranteed, but these three here cross means need not be. You can remember this 18 results in one go just by seeing this table, my dear friends. You can remember 18 results in one go just by seeing this table, my dear friends. Okay. Just see the table, you will remember 18 results, my dear friends. <laughs> Wonderful. And there are some special elements uh, in a poset. What is a poset, my dear friend? Poset is a partially ordered set. Okay. That is a, a relation which is reflexive, anti symmetric, and transitive is called partially ordered relation. And a set together with the partially ordering relation is called poset, my dear friends. Okay. And whenever a relation is poset, it is inverse is also partially ordering relation. So we have duals here. That is, if you are having a set together with a relation which is poset, the set with its inverse relation is also a poset and these fellows are called duals my dear friends these are called what duals my dear friends okay and we have something called maximal and minimal elements see maximal element means what it says nothing is above me that is maximal minimal means nothing is below me that is minimal there can be many elements claiming that so maximal and minimal elements need not be unique my dear friends and if it is a finite poset, 100% maximal and minimal elements will exist. But infinite posets, for example, set of integers with less than or equal to is an infinite poset. It does not has maximal and minimal elements. Okay, finite posets, 100% will have maximal minimal elements, my dear friends. Infinite posets need not have this. Now, what about greatest and least element? Greatest and least elements are intelligent fellows. Greatest says all the elements are related. So, obviously, nothing is above me. Am I clear? But it says all the elements are related. See, for maximal elements, all the elements may not be related set. But for greatest elements, all the elements are related. Whereas least element is related to all the elements. Okay. So greatest and least if exist, they are the unique element. Generally, if the maximal is only one, that is greatest element. Minimal is exactly one, that is the least element, my difference. Okay. That is it. Now, greatest lower bond and least upper bond, we denote it by A meet B and this is read as A join B my dear friends. For standard relation like less than or equal to the meet is nothing but their uh, minimum minimum of the two numbers is the meet and the join is maximum of the two numbers. Suppose if the relation is divides relation the GLB that is the meet is nothing but their uh, GCD or highest common factor and LUB is nothing but LCM of the two numbers. Now the relation is subset relation, then the uh, meet of the two, uh, two sets uh, will be their intersection, join will be their union, my dear friends. Join will be their union, my dear friends. Now there is one very beautiful property. Suppose you are having a poset. If two elements are related, A related to B, then meet of AB is A, join of AB is B, my dear friends. So when two elements are related directly or indirectly, if you are having two elements which are related, then this will be their meet and this will be their join, my dear friends. This is the meet and this is the join. So you don't have to verify the meet and join for the two related elements or two comparable elements, 100% the meet and join is existing okay because of that reason only if it is a chain definitely it is a lattice what do you mean by lattice sir a lattice is one in which every pair of elements are in which every pair of elements are having gcd as well as uh, i mean g uh, meet as well as join am i clear so that is what you mean by lattice okay so because the consistency property is satisfied in a chain has a diagram when you draw it you'll see that chain all the elements are related with each, other, with each other. So, for every pair of elements, GLB and LUB is guaranteed. Therefore, it becomes lattice. 
okay so actually this property helps you in checking whether the given poset is a lattice or not very quickly my dear friends wonderful now as a lattice four properties are satisfied idempotent commutative absorption and associative see only these four properties are satisfied in any lattice this question can be asked in gate sir which of the following properties are satisfied in lattice can be asked as a msq can be asked as a mcq also see as a lattice four properties are guaranteed tomorrow M mc uh, msq session i am asking this question sir please remember i am going to ask this question in tomorrow's msq session okay which of the following properties are satisfied in a lattice i'll give you four options you have to identify the correct ones in that okay so definitely guarantees guaranteed is what idempotent commutative associative and absorption d morgan's not satisfied distributive not satisfied my dear friends see in a lattice distributive properties are not guaranteed but distributive inequalities are guaranteed my dear friends distributive inequalities are guaranteed and i give generally this particular beautiful diamond example from this you can see this relationship between them sir because here it is 0 1 a b c you can take it you can just see what is a or b and c and then you see a or b and a or c now what is b and c b and c is 0 a or 0 is equal to a a or b is 1 and a or c is 1 this is 1 so obviously a is related to c therefore the a or b and c is related to a or b and a or c just by remembering this simple diamond example this inequality can be remembered very easily my dear friends am i clear in a lattice distributive inequalities are guaranteed but distributive properties need not be satisfied my dear friends please remember <coughs> and uh, if it is a finite lattice uh, a bounded lattice means in which greatest and least elements exist so obviously finite lattices are bounded see bounded lattices are needed to identify the complements of an element only when it is bounded we can define complement of an element what do you mean by complement of an element sir b is called complement of a b is called complement of a if a or b is equal to 1 and a and b is equal to 0 0 means least element 1 means greatest element am i clear and for a if b is the complement for b a will be the complement and one very important result is greatest and least elements are complements of each other <coughs> in general in a lattice complements may exist may not exist even if complements exist they need not be unique but if it is a distributive lattice the complements when exist are unique complements when exist are unique my dear friends now bounded distributed and complemented lattice is called bounded distributive and complemented lattice see in a lattice distributive property need not be satisfied but suppose in the lattice distributive properties are satisfied then it is called distributive lattice complemented lattice means a lattice in which complement exists for each and every element now if your lattice is bounded distributive and complemented then it is called boolean algebra what is it called sir it is called boolean algebra my dear friends it is called boolean algebra okay and the best example for boolean algebra is of course you can say power set with subset is a beautiful powerful example for boolean algebra not only that dn with division when n is product of distinct primes n is product of distinct primes that is also a best example for boolean algebra don't forget this because it can give you two marks or one mark in your gate examination straight away remember this now equivalence relation a relation on a set a is called equivalence relation if it is reflexive symmetric and anti symmetric uh, reflexive symmetric and transitive a relation which is reflexive symmetric and transitive is called equivalence relation my dear friends now once you have an equivalence relation okay r is equivalence relation on a then you can create equivalence class of an element a is any element in set a you can create equivalence class of a it is simply set of all b belonging to a such that a related to b that is all the elements which are related to a forms equivalence class of a and beautiful property about equivalence class is every element belongs to its equivalence class suppose if b belongs to equivalence class of a then a belongs to equivalence class of b therefore equivalence class of a and equivalence class of b will be same and two equivalence classes will be either completely same or completely different. 
आइदर कंप्लीटली सेम या तो कंप्लीटली डिफरेंट माई डिफरेंस नाउ वन ब्यूटिफुल प्रॉपर्टी अबाउट इक्वाल रिलेशन एंड इन इक्वाल रिलेशन एंड पार्टीशन ऑफ ए सेट माई डिफरेंस सो फॉर एवरी इक्वाल रिलेशन ऑन ए सेट और फॉर एवरी रिलेशन इक्वाल रिलेशन on a set a we can create a partition of that particular set similarly for every partition we can create equivalence relation my dear friends so the number of equivalence relation is same as number of partitions and that is given by beautiful number called bell number and i generally suggest students to remember at least first four or five bell numbers my dear friends or you can use this particular formula to get those bell numbers for example b2 if you want you can just start 1c0 b0 plus 1c1 b1 which is nothing but 2 B3 if you want 2C0 B0 2C1 B1 plus 2C2 B2. So which is nothing but 1, 2 into 1 plus 1 into 2 which is 5. Then B4 is 3C0 B0 3C1 B1 3C2 B2 and 3C3 B3. So what is it? Please tell me what is B4 value, my dear friends. What is B4 value? Please let me know. What is B4 value? Please let me know, sir. <coughs> Can answer? No problem. This is one, three into one, three into two, plus one into. So four plus six eleven, sorry four plus six ten plus five fifteen. B four is fifteen. These numbers are very very important and B five is fifty two. Please remember these numbers very very powerful. They are already asked these questions in gate examination. High possibility of asking in gate again. Remember them. Now suppose we are having a particular set A. Having n elements, a cross a contains n square elements. So, what about the smallest equivalence uh, relation on a, my dear friend? What is the smallest equivalence relation on a? Actually, smallest equivalence relation on a is delta relation, which contains n elements. And the largest equivalence relation on a is nothing but a cross a itself, and it contains n square elements. It contains n square elements, my dear friends. It contains n square elements, my dear friends. now about groups okay so these are the properties one should know closure property means if you operate two elements the resultant is element of the same set and it should satisfy associative property identity means whether you do a star e or e star a you should get same element back and inverse means a star b or b star a should give you identity element and commutative property you all know a star b should be equal to b star a now suppose you are having a set and an operation defined and if the operation satisfy only closure property then you call that set together with the operation as algebraic structure and if the set together with the operation satisfy closure and associative property then you call it as semi group and if it satisfy closure associativity as well as identity property then that particular set together with the operation is called monoid and if it satisfy closure property associative property existence of identity property and existence of inverse property then the set together with that operation is called group my dear friends and a group which also satisfies commutative property is called commutative group ya to abelian group my dear friends see this properties need to be verified my dear friend mostly they can ask you like a give you a set and operation they ask you what is identity element or what is inverse of a particular element or they can ask you whether it is a group or not this type of questions are very very common in gate my dear friends even for msqs they'll give you uh, three four choices and they ask you which of them is idempotent or which of them is a group or which of them is abelian that kind of questions like msq it is a very very favorable question by difference so you can expect msqs from group theory my dear friends see msqs from all the topics are not that favorable of course you can create it sir creating msq is very simple suppose you have mcq what is the answer you can ask which of the following is not answer <coughs> you can you can say minimal spanning tree <coughs> i'll give you minimal spanning tree which of the following is not the uh, minimal cost uh, what is the minimal which of the following is not minimal cost 
of or minimal cost of the spanning tree you can ask. So one will be minimum with other fellows will be not minimum. So any MCQ can be converted to MSQ set. That is not at all a big deal my dear friends. But that is not a good idea my dear friends. But in MSQ there is a possibility of you know combining two three questions also. And these are the suitable topics for such MSQs my dear friends. Like groups, relations, the high possibility of asking questions from these topics in MSQs my dear friends. Now some important properties. I listed all the properties which you should know. Okay. So this copy those who have can do a very very quick revision of all the properties one should know my dear friends. Like you know identity is unique. Inverse of an element is unique. You cannot have two inverses and two identities my dear friends. And inverse of whole inverse that is you got inverse and its inverse is original element. Then a b whole inverse is b inverse into a inverse and identity is inverse of itself that is inverse of identity is itself e inverse is equal to e inverse is equal to e then every group of prime order this is a very powerful result sir very very powerful result now i say that order of group is 13 and g is a group is it abelian or not is it abelian or not? You just need to answer that. <coughs> See, my dear friends, it's a very, very quick revision, sir. If you need to do this revision, it will take at least five hours for you. I am doing it in a no time. Okay. So please concentrate. And after that, once you get this particular uh, PDF, your revision will be done in very, very less time, my dear friends. Please remember that. Okay. Of course, you already had your short notes, suppose some more points you can write down to make it much better. <coughs> so what is the answer? <coughs> it is abelian group because group of prime order, therefore it is abelian. Sir. Now any group of order less than six, that is five, four, three, two, one. Without any verification, you can say it is abelian group, my dear friends. And if a group is having even order, see identity is definitely self inverse. Other than identity, you can find at least one element which is inverse of itself, that is self inverse. Now, <coughs> addition modulo group, okay, uh, uh, containing the elements 0 to m minus 1 is an abelian group. And in this, identity is 0, and inverse of an element a is given by m minus a. Whereas, Multiplicator modulo group that is the elements from 1 to p minus 1. When p is prime, then only it is abelian group, otherwise, it is not. So, this p should be prime, my dear friends. Then only it is abelian group, otherwise, it is not. <coughs> now, you know that a subgroup of a group is uh, a part of group which itself is a group, but you do not have to verify all the four properties like closure, associative, existence of identity, and inverse. You can just verify this particular property that is you take two elements from h and if a star b inverse also belongs to h then it becomes a subgroup my dear friends and if it is a finite group the story is much easier for finite groups you just need to verify the elements forms closed closure pro or closed set that is enough to say that it is a subgroup am i clear some beautiful property powerful property my dear friends lagrange's theorem H be a subgroup of a group, then order of wonderful, powerful result. You can see number of questions asked in gate on this particular result, sir. Order of H divides order of group. Lagrange's theorem. Order of H divides order of group. Lagrange's theorem. <coughs> then comes subgroup of an abelian group is an abelian. Every subgroup of abelian group is abelian, sir. 100% no need of verification. And H and K are subgroups. Their union need not be subgroup, but their intersection is subgroup. But if you want union to be subgroup, either H should be subset of K, or K should be subset of H, my dear friends. <coughs> Order of element is such that A power M is equal to E, uh, where M is the smallest positive integer. Okay. So, what do you mean by order of an element? It is a positive integer m such that a power m is equal to e. m should be the smallest positive integer, my dear friends. And if order of an element is equal to order of group, then it is called generator of the group. And a group having generator is called cycle group, my dear friends. 
a group having generator is called cyclic group my dear friends <coughs> and these are the properties please remember practice whatever way you want sir because these are the most powerful results about cyclic group every group of prime order if it is a group of prime order 100 percent it is cyclic no need of verification like order of an element is equal to order of group directly it is cyclic group but every subgroup of cyclic group is cyclic so you are having a cyclic group the subgroup is definitely cyclic group my dear friends and every cyclic group is abelian but every abelian group need not be cyclic my dear friends so if it is cyclic 100 percent it is abelian group my dear friend but if it is abelian it need not be cyclic remember that my dear friends how many generators are there suppose you know a group okay of order 24 the number of generators is given by how many generators are there it is given by pi 24 my friends we already solved eight is the answer so that many generators this group will have this group will have eight generators my, my dear friends and if you know order of an element you can find order of a power k also which is given by n by gcd of nk my dear friends n by gcd of nk these are the most important properties based on cyclic group one should master my dear friends that's about groups my dear friends <coughs> now when you talk about graph theory what is a graph a graph is an ordered pair of vertices and edges if each edge is identified with unordered pair of vertices it is called undirected graph or graph and if each edge is identified with an ordered pair of vertices then it is called a directed graph my dear friends directly or generally we default discuss about uh, undirected graphs only directed graphs are specially mentioned as directed graphs yeah to digraphs my dear friends so mostly we'll be talking about undirected graphs only in this okay uh, graph theory mainly my dear friends okay now suppose in a graph parallel edges are not there and self loops are not there such a graph is called simple graph suppose if parallel edges are allowed see allowed means it's not like must be there allowed means can be there but self loops are not there not allowed then you call it as a multi graph if parallel edges are allowed self loops are allowed then you call it as a general graph or pseudo graph okay so please tell me what type of graph is this First one is what type of graph? First one is what type of graph, my dear friends? <clears throat> First one is what type of graph? First one is, so first one is actually Deepak. It is actually simple, multi and general graph. It is actually all the three. Whereas second one is not simple. First one, second one is not simple. It can be multi or general graph or pseudo graph. Whereas the third one is only general graph. Only general graph. Remember that. See this confusion people will have always. Please note that it is a general graph only. <laughs> okay. First one can be simple, you can call it as simple. See, every simple graph can be called as general graph, but every general graph cannot be called as simple graph. That is the moral of the story, my dear friends. That is the moral of the story, my dear friends. Asa nahi hai, simple mainly, see in issue, mainly we talk about simple graphs. Mainly we talk about simple graphs. It does not mean that a general graph, multi graphs nahi hai. Asa nahi hai. Mostly we talk about simple graphs. Yani uska properties jada discuss kar sakte hai. Okay. Whereas for general and multi graphs, restriction hai. Kyunki they are not completely characterized. Simple graph to pura characterized hai. Iski properties jada pata chil jayega. Kyunki aapke paas do vertices hai. Aur isko simple graph bole dunge to. Ya to edge nahi rahega. Ya to ek edge rahega. But same two vertices deke multi graph bole to. I can create any number of edges. So, I characterize nahi hota hai. Is liye hum multi graph or general graph ke baare mein only like fundamental theorem of graph theory or that uh, result like uh, you know uh, small delta is less than or equal to 2e by b less than or equal to capital delta wo general properties tak hi baat karenge. Otherwise, mostly we talk about simple graphs. It doesn't mean that we don't have them in the syllabus sir. We have but we talk very less about them because Uske baare mein jyada baat nahi kar sakte hai. Kyunki they are not completely characterized. That is the only 
पॉइंट क्योंकि एवरी सिंपल ग्राफ का आप जनरल ग्राफ बोल सकते हो ओके सो दैट पॉइंट आल्सो यू शुड रिमेम्बर एंड द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट एंड द परफेक्ट रिजल्ट इज फर्स्ट थ्योरम ऑफ ग्राफ थ्योरी इन एनी ग्राफ वेदर इट इज सिंपल जनरल और मल्टी ग्राफ सम ऑफ डिग्रीज ऑफ वर्टिसस विल बी ट्वाइस द नंबर ऑफ एजेस सम ऑफ डिग्रीज ऑफ वर्टिसस विल बी ट्वाइस द नंबर ऑफ एजेस वी शुड नेवर फॉरगेट दिस सेल्फ द मोस्ट पावरफुल रूल इट इज द मोस्ट पावरफुल रूल बाबू and in any graph the number of odd degree vertices will be yeah that is also called hand shaking lemma yes fundamental theorem or first theorem of graph theory ya to hand shaking lemma you call it okay and in any graph the number of odd degree vertices will be always even and this property is the most powerful property babu this property is the most powerful property babu Minimum degree less than or equal to 2e by v less than or equal to maximum degree. <coughs> the most important you can find number of questions based on this in the examination. Okay, even in your uh, marathon series, I'll be doing some problems here. In MSQs, see <coughs> MSQs mainly I take a uh, uh, few questions only. Not uh, it's a one hour session. Whereas in marathon session that is on 22nd uh, 6 p.m. mostly. 22nd Sunday 6 p.m. So I uh, will be talking about. We'll take problems on each part. Important, important problems. We'll try to cover as many problems as possible in that particular. Uh, uh, whatever. How much time I cannot tell you exactly. As long as it takes. Even if you po if possible, a break be like a maximum problems cover. Okay. Havel <coughs> Hickman theorem. Degree sequence. ग्राफिक है या नहीं मींस गिवन डिग्री सीक्वेंस इज सिंपल ग्राफ और नॉट वी कैन वेरीफाई यूजिंग दिस हैवेल हेक मी थ्योरम एक्चुअली दिस थ्योरम इज व्हाट वी आर गोइंग टू अप्लाई सर ओके दिस थ्योरम इज व्हाट वी आर गोइंग टू अप्लाई सर ए डिग्री सीक्वेंस इज ग्राफिक इफ एंड ओनली इफ द सीक्वेंस ऑब्टेनिंग बाय ऑब्टेंड बाय डिलीटिंग द लार्जेस्ट एंट्री डी एंड सबट्रैक्टिंग वन फ्रॉम द रिमेनिंग ऑफ द एंट्रीज ओके रिमेनिंग डी एंट्रीज स्टिल प्रोवाइड यू अ ग्राफिक सीक्वेंस सी व्हाट वी डू हैज डिग्री निकाल देंगे Suppose if it is d, next that many degrees, we subtract one, again rearrange it. We continue the process till you get all zeros. If you get all zeros, it is graphic. If you get any negative entry anywhere, you stop. It is not graphic. Suppose you do not have enough number of degrees to perform the operation, we stop it and we say it is not graphic. That is a simple Havel-Hakmi uh, uh, algorithm which we use to check whether the given degree sequence is graphic or not, my dear friends. <coughs> these are the properties about simple graph in a simple graph with n vertices maximum degree of any vertex is n minus 1 maximum number of edges is nc2 ya to n into n minus 1 by 2 okay n into n minus 1 by 2 right and of course degree can be what sir degree can be 0 to maximum n minus 1 degree of any vertex can be from 0 to n minus 1 <clears throat> and in a graph at least two vertices should have same degree sir minimum two vertices will have same degree my dear friend you cannot have all different degrees my dear friends all different degrees you cannot have minimum two degrees will be same my dear friends and one more important property is number of odd degree vertices will be even number of odd degree vertices will be even remember <clears throat> now comes the most powerful result the story table for the standard graphs the story table for standard graphs my dear friends you should know this 100% my dear friends this is the most important table one should know see that is degree babu nishu kumar i said degree it is a degree degree maximum degree degree not edges ओके, इज दैट क्लियर बाबू निशु कुमार होप यू अंडरस्टैंड सो नल ग्राफ विल हैव नो एडजस्ट सो एन वर्टस जीरो एडजस्ट एंड डिग्री ऑफ इच वर्ट एक्स इज जीरो सो यू कैन कॉल इट एज जीरो रेगुलर ग्राफ साइकिल ग्राफ ओके हियर वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट सिंपल साइकिल ग्राफ्स है so three cycle four cycle five cycle and so on 
so it will have n vertices and n edges and degree of each vertex is 2 so it is a two regular graph whereas wheel graph is obtained by adding a additional vertex to a cycle which is adjacent to all the vertices of the cycle so here the hub will have degree n whereas remaining vertices will have degree 3 my dear friends so the wheel graph will have n plus 1 vertices and how many edges it will have n in the cycle n connected to the hub so 2n edges it will have my dear friends and complete graph this is the graph having the maximum degree for every vertex and maximum number of edges so the number of vertices in a complete graph is n but number of edges is n c2 yeah so n into n minus 1 by 2 my dear friends and degree of each vertex is n minus 1 sorry degree of each vertex is n minus 1 my dear friends n cube one very important cube sir where the vertices are labeled with uh, you know binary strings of length n my dear friends and two vertices are adjacent depend only if they differ in exactly one bit position so we are having two power n vertices in n cube and degree of each vertex will be n and number of edges is n into 2 power n minus 1. This numbers are very, very, it is actually 2 power n, sir. 2 power n, sorry. <coughs> and complete bipartite graph will have m plus n vertices and edges will be m into n. And uh, the first part uh, vertices will have degree n, whereas second part vertices will have degree m, my dear friends. And a graph is bipartite depend only if every cycle in the graph is even cycle a uh, bipartite uh, graph is bipartite if and only if every cycle is even cycle for example if i give you a graph like this you can say whether it is bipartite or not can you tell me whether it is bipartite or not can you tell me whether it is bipartite or not <coughs> can you tell me whether it is bipartite or not See, tomorrow we are going to solve MSQ, sir. So, this revision is very important. So, we can remember some of the properties and quickly answer the questions. Okay, please do remember these properties, Babu, standard ones. It cannot be bipartite because you find an odd cycle in it. Odd cycle is there. Therefore, it is not bipartite. <coughs> it is not bipartite. Remember that. And how many maximum number of edges in a bipartite graph with n vertices? Maximum number of edges in a bipartite graph with n vertices is given by, see half in one side, half in one side, that is n square by 4, my dear friends, floor of it. n square by 4 is the answer for this. Okay. Suppose if it is a bipartite graph with 6 vertices, 3 into 3, 3 in one side, 3 in one side, maximum edges will be 9, my dear friends. Maximum edges. This is the maximum edges. Maximum edges is given by n square by 4 or half in one side, half in one side, you put it, you will get the answer quickly, my dear friends. <coughs> Number of simple graphs on n labeled vertices. This is very important. Some people skip that label, uh, the meaning will change, sir. So, number of simple graphs with n labeled vertices is given by because with n vertices, how many edges are possible? n into n minus 1 by 2. So, the simple graph which you are constructing, each edge is having two possibilities. It may be present in your graph or absent in the graph. So, 2 into 2 into 2 into 2, how many times? n into n minus 1 by 2 times. So, 2 power n into n minus 1 by 2 is the answer, my dear friends. <coughs> Number of uh, simple graphs on n labeled vertices having k edges where k is equal to 0 is given by. See, it is simply n into n minus 1 by 2. So, out of that, you are selecting 0 edges. Out of n into n minus 1 by 2, you are selecting 1 edge. Out of n into n minus 1 by 2, you are selecting 2 edges. Out of n into n minus 1 by 2, you are selecting n into n minus 1 by 2 edges. So, this is very, very powerful result, my dear friends. It can help you in solving very, very complicated problems very quickly. <coughs> the isomorphic graphs means uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Means you, you are creating the uh, mapping between the vertices of first graph and vertices of the second graph in such a way that the mapping is 1, 1 and on to actually these two conditions will give you necessary condition these two forms necessary condition and that is necessary condition that necessary condition is here sir. that necessary condition is here <coughs> that is there is a one one uh, and on to mapping between the vertices set which will guarantee same number of vertices in both the graph same number of edges in both the graphs and same degree sequences in the both the graphs. 
but these two uh, conditions like 1 1 and 1 2 does not guarantee isomorphism sir the third important property must be the function also should preserve the adjacency adjacency must be preserved we, these are only necessary condition if two graphs have same number of vertices same number of edges and same degree sequence there is a possibility that they may be isomorphic suppose if any of these property fails they can never be isomorphic so they are necessary conditions sir. last one has value one okay this is value one you can say it, sir no problem yes this is even this is also having value one <coughs> and two graphs are isomorphic this is a wonderful property sir sometimes verifying whether two graphs are isomorphic is difficult you check their complements you check their complements okay for example you take these two graphs Verific verifying may be difficult for you what you do is do the complement for these two graphs g1 g2 try the complement of this graph and complement of this graph complement is just four vertices complement of this is just four vertices both are null graphs of four vertices so they are isomorphic so they are isomorphic means original graphs are isomorphic this is one of the powerful result my dear friends beautiful result also am i clear you can check whether two graphs are isomorphic or not by checking their complements if the complements are isomorphic original graphs are isomorphic <coughs> And some important properties about the <coughs> complement of a graph. If you union graph and its complement, you are going to get complete graph with that many vertices. And number of edges in graph plus number of edges in complement will be number of edges in complete graph, my dear friends. And when you know the degree sequence of the graph, you know the degree sequence of its complement. This is a very, very beautiful result. You can expect this question in gate examination, sir. <coughs> you can expect this question in gate examination, my dear friends. Please remember. Now, self-complementary graph means a graph which is isomorphic to its own complement is called self-complementary graph. So, if the graph is self-complementary, even in that case, union will give you complete graph. And here what happens, number of edges in graph will be same as number of edges in its complement. So, this result actually, E plus E becomes 2E becomes N into N minus 1 by 2. Therefore, E becomes, what happens, number of edges becomes N into N minus 1 by 4. And from this, because number of edges must be integer, which is of the form n into n minus 1 by 4, either uh, 4 should divide n or 4 should divide n minus 1, which means n should be of the form 4k, ya to n should be of the form 4k plus 1, my dear friends. So, because of this two, <coughs> what we, uh, we get this particular property, my dear friends. Please remember this, my dear friends. And there is one more important one, the only self-complementary cycle. The only self-complementary cycle. What is the only self-complementary cycle, sir? Is C5. This is the only, one and only self-complementary cycle, my dear friends. C5. <coughs> now, here you see this. If G is a simple graph with N vertices and K components, then maximum number of edges. See, Babu, this is called P implies Q. Condition is in Q path. It is called necessary condition. Okay, it is a minimal requirement. With this, you can't say it is connected, sir. Okay, you can't say it is uh, having K components, sir. It is just necessary condition. So, if it is having N vertices and K components, then this maximum edges will happen. Okay, N vertices and K components, then number of edges should be less than or equal to N minus K into n minus k plus 1 by 2 this condition is called a necessary condition minimal requirement that is a minimal requirement my dear friends minimal requirement less than or equal to that can guarantee that many components my dear friends okay that is a minimal requirement not sufficient even if this condition is satisfied you can't get k components sir it is just a necessary minimal requirement not sufficient condition remember that <coughs> Now, this is about connectedness. These are the sufficient conditions. Okay, here you see, when you are having condition is in P part, it is called sufficient condition. See, sufficient condition means, if this condition happens, 100% graph is connected. If this condition happened or this condition happened, 100% graph is connected. But it does not mean without the condition, graph is connected, sir. 
that is just a sufficient condition not necessary people never understand this sufficient condition then they can never understand such results you need to understand this result properly sufficient more than enough if you are given this condition 100% graph will be connected if this condition is not satisfied pray god why you can't guarantee babu see with this condition 100% sure without this condition it may happen may not happen we can't say anything remember that see some people uh, you know they send uh, you know doubts also just with a plain understanding when you go you cannot solve problems based on this in the examination babu you need to understand आएगा बहुत सारे पूछेंगे पूछते रहेंगे ओके okay? आपको इसे समझना है ठीक से कैसे समझना है इसे सफिशियंट यानी अगर आपके लक लग गया है ये कंडीशन सेटिस्फाइड आ गया है तो ब्लाइंडली यू कैन से कनेक्टेड सपोज ये कंडीशन सेटिस्फाई नहीं हुआ है आपको कोई और मेथड से चेक करना होगा कनेक्टेड है या नहीं क्योंकि ये प्रोसीजर डजेंट वर्क यानी ये ग्रेटर देन हो गया तो 100 परसेंट कनेक्टेड नहीं हुआ तो भी कनेक्टेड हो सकता है यू कांट से एनीथिंग अबाउट इट रिमेंबर ये दोनों जो है ना सफिशियंट है नेसेसरी नहीं है याद रखो नाउ इफ इट इज ए डायरेक्टेड ग्राफ द वंडरफुल प्रॉपर्टी sum of in degrees is equal to sum of out degrees is equal to number of edges sum of in degrees is equal to sum of out degrees is equal to number of edges my dear friends okay please remember of course uh, you write something called adjacency matrix my dear friends it is a matrix with aij when you are having n vertices it is a n by n matrix this aij will be uh, zero if the vertex I mean uh, there is a edge between ij I mean edge between ij is not there then you put the corresponding entry as zero suppose edge between ij is there then you put the corresponding entry one of course this adjacency matrix can be written both for directed as well as undirected groups okay generally when you write adjacency matrix we assume that there are no self loops my dear friends self loops are not there that is the first assumption we are going to consider okay so multi graphs are not considered here only self loops and simple graphs simple graphs may be having self loops suppose if main diagonals are all zero self loops are also not there so that self loops are not there is actually very very happy situation for that because once self loops are not there if it is a undirected graph sum of elements in each row gives you degree of the vertex or similarly sum of elements in each column gives you the degree of the corresponding vertex whereas if it is a directed graph sum of elements in each row can give you the uh, you know uh, a to b na out degree or sum of uh, elements in column can give you in degree or vice versa sir. okay so that you can easily verify that am i clear so that is the idea and the most important result is when you raise it to the power k when you raise this particular adjacency matrix to the power k then ijth element in this aj power ag power k will give you number of walks not paths number of walks of length k from vertex i to vertex k sir it can give you number of walks of length k from vertex i to vertex k my dear friends so these are some properties about adjacency matrix my dear friends <coughs> now Euler graph is the most easiest problem in the world, and you want to check whether it is Euler graph or not. That is, without lifting pen from the paper, you want to trace the graph. When it is possible, if all the degrees are even, all the degrees are even, then it is Euler graph. If all the degrees are even, then it is Euler graph. What about a uh, unicursal graph, sir? Of course, you can uh, trace without lifting pen from the paper, but you cannot come back to the starting position. you cannot come back to the starting position and that is possible when you are having exactly two vertices of odd degree if you are having exactly two vertices of odd degree then it will have unicursal uh, graph means you can trace the graph without lifting pen from the paper but you may end with different vertices means it is not closed it is just open walk containing all the edges of the graph open walk containing all the edges of the graph in which no edge is repeated and of course there is one more version of this for uh, euler graph 
it can be divided into edge disjoint cycles then also it is Euler graph my dear friends then also it is Euler graph my dear friends so this is one more property about Euler graph my dear friends okay so these are the important properties about Euler graph next comes Hamiltonian graph what do you mean by Hamiltonian graph Babu <coughs> what do you mean by Hamiltonian graph Babu Hamiltonian uh, graph means a graph in which Hamiltonian cycle is there. What do you mean by Hamiltonian cycle? You can create a spanning cycle. Spanning cycle means a cycle containing all the vertices of the graph in which no vertex is repeated. Okay. Such a cycle if graph contains, we can call it as Hamiltonian cycle or spanning cycle. Such a graph is called Hamiltonian graph. And once you have a Hamiltonian cycle, because it is a cycle now, Graph is having n vertices means Hamiltonian cycle also will have n vertices. Hamiltonian cycle will also have n edges because cycle na, n edges. N vertices means n edges and degree of each vertex in Hamiltonian cycle is 2. So generally what you do whenever you want to create Hamiltonian cycle from Hamiltonian graph or graph, you try to see that degree of each vertex is kept 2, remaining extra degrees are removed. That is how we try to create Hamiltonian cycle for a graph my dear friends okay and we don't have uh, beautiful conditions like Euler graph here sir we only have sufficient conditions one is called Dirac's theorem the other one is called Ohr's theorem my dear friends what Dirac's theorem says is if minimum degree is greater than or equal to n by 2 then definitely graph is Hamiltonian see if you know minimum degree is greater than or equal to n by 2 definitely graph is Hamiltonian if minimum degree is not greater than or equal to n by 2 Pray God, you can't say whether it is Hamiltonian or not because this test fails. Remember, these are sufficient conditions, one-sided conditions. Okay, keep this in mind, my dear friends. Okay, some people take one-sided conditions as necessary and sufficient conditions and they want to verify and they ask questions how. See, for that, no one can answer you, my dear friends. You need to understand it's a one-sided it's a one-sided condition. If this condition is satisfied, then Hamiltonian. If it is not satisfied, this test does not work. Use some other test like that. Similarly, of course, you can never verify this, but know the result because they can ask you which of the following is true. That type of statements they can ask you. In that, this will be very, very useful, sir. Knowing this result, standard results is very, very important. There is one more uh, sufficient. Okay, this one says if you are having two non adjacent vertices, some of their degree should be greater than or equal to n. If it happens for every pair of non adjacent vertices, then the graph is Hamiltonian. Suppose there is a pair of non adjacent vertices whose sum is not greater than or equal to n. You can't say it is not Hamiltonian. This test fails. That's it. Remember that. And again, if minimum number of edges uh, is greater than or equal to n square minus 3n plus 6 by 2, then the graph is Hamiltonian. This is also another sufficient condition all these are sufficient condition minimum degree greater than or equal to n by 2 or degree of u plus degree of v for non adjacent vertices greater than or equal to n number of edges greater than or equal to n square minus 3 n plus 6 by 2 if any of these condition happens definitely graph is Hamiltonian but not vice versa not vice versa converse need not be true remember that and Number of Hamiltonian cycles in a complete graph with labeled words. So only for labeled vertices, this result is there, which is n minus 1 factorial by 2. And number of edge disjoint Hamiltonian cycles is given by formula n minus 1 by 2 when it is a labeled graph. This labeled is very important, Babu. In one of recent gate examination, that labeled was removed. So marks need to be given for all the students. Remember that. Now about planar graph, I think each subject you are taking two hours, so okay. In a planar graph, sum of degrees is less than or equal to twice the number of edges. If you are having internal edge, if there are no internal edges, then sum of degrees is twice the number of edges, my dear friends. Then we have Euler's formula, my dear friends. Uh, that is V minus E plus R is equal to 2. That is called Euler's formula, my dear friends, okay. Let me take some C and solve the questions. 
right? Now comes the Euler's formula. <coughs> Very good. Babu, Nishu, V minus E. Abba. Uh -huh. Oh. Yeah, you can write like that also, no problem. And if minimum degree of region is 3, then this result you should remember. 3R should be less than or equal to 2E and E less than or equal to 3V minus 6. See, by default, we consider this result, sir. Because by default, we consider the minimum degree of region equal to 3. By default, we consider minimum degree of region equal to 3. So, we consider this. And the other one. The other one, if minimum degree of region is equal to k, then it is kr less than or equal to 2e and e less than or equal to k into v minus 2 by k minus 2. This you should remember, my dear friends. And k5, k3, 3 are non-planar graphs by Kartowski's theorem. And k5 is non-planar with minimum number of vertices. k3, 3 is non-planar with minimum number of edges, my dear friends. <coughs> And of course, there's a Kartowski's theorem. A graph is, uh, you know, uh, uh, non-planar uh, non if and only if uh, it, it contains a subgraph homeomorphic to K5 or K33. And when it is planar, my dear friend, if it does not contain a subgraph homeomorphic to K5 or K33, that is called Kartowski's theorem, my dear friends. <coughs> and uh, some uh, problem or results about uh, uh, this planar graph. Uh, at least one vertex of degree less than or equal to 5, a planar graph will definitely contain. If it is a planar graph, definitely one vertex of degree less than or equal to 5, it will contain my difference. And every, this is called four colorable, four colorable theorem or four color theorem. Every planar graph is four colorable. And if you are having k components, that Euler's formula, which is v minus c plus r is equal to 2 becomes v minus c plus r is equal to k plus 1, my difference. Remember, interesting property. Okay. If you are having k components, it is k plus 1. Suppose one component k becomes 1, 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, that is your Euler's formula only. So, Euler's formula is a special case of this result, my dear friends. Now, this is about the results about tree. Uh, the following statements are equivalent, means if any one of the statement is given, other statement follows. If it is a tree, it is connected, will have n minus 1 edges. It is acyclic and will have n minus 1 edges. It is minimally connected. That is, if you remove even a single edge, graph get disconnected, my dear friends. And there is exactly one path between every pair of vertices. And next comes, <coughs> okay, these are standard properties, so I'm going quickly around it, sir, okay. Now, <coughs> if it is a tree, it is having n vertices means it should have n minus 1 edges, my difference, okay. And definitely, at least two vertices of degree 1 should be there in a tree. At least two vertices of degree 1 should be there. That is, at least two pendant vertices must be there in a tree, my difference. And every tree is a planar graph. Okay, tree is a planar graph, 100%. Not only that, every tree with two or more vertices is a bipartite graph because every cycle is a zero cycle. Therefore, every tree with two or more vertices is a bipartite graph, my dear friends. <coughs> okay, so uh, spanning tree means what, sir? It is a spanning subgraph, which is a tree. Okay, so once you create a spanning tree, uh, graph is having n vertices and e edges. The spanning tree will contain how many vertices? Because Spanning means it should contain all the vertices of the graph. It contains n vertices. How many edges are present in the spanning tree? n minus 1. The edges which are not present in the spanning tree are called chords. The edges present are called branches. The edges which are not present in the spanning tree are called chords, which is nothing but e minus of n minus 1. That is e minus n plus 1. That number is actually called rank. The number of chords. Rank is nothing but the number of chords, my dear friends which is nothing but e minus n plus 1, my dear friends. <coughs> of course, this particular result we can use for solving problems like, you know, <coughs> uh, number of distinct labeled uh, spanning trees. So, you know, total edges, you have to select the chords. You have to select the chords. That chords you have to remove, but not all chords, uh, not all that K selections uh, may give you spanning trees. There may be some K selections which disconnect the graph. So you take K selections out of E edges and out of that you have to subtract the K selections which actually disconnect the graph because they are not going to form these spanning trees. With that you can use this formula, my dear friend. For example, if you want to find number of spanning trees in this, if you want to find number of spanning trees in this, See, edges will be how many, sir? Five edges are there. K, chords, how many chords are there? Chords will be 
because uh, spanning tree should contain three edges. So E minus three will be number of cards. So this number of spanning trees is given by phi C2 minus how many two edges removal disconnect the graph that you have to identify. If you remove these two edges, graph disconnects. If you remove these two edges, graph get disconnected. There are no other two combinations whose removal disconnect the graph. So minus two, you have to do it. That is 10 minus two, the answer is eight minus two. So like this, we can find number of spanning trees. Of course, we have one more method called this Kirchhoff's matrix theorem, where you have to write the Laplace matrix, which is degree matrix minus adjacency matrix. See, that is main diagonal. You have to degree, my dear friends. In, in adjacency matrix, when suppose there is an edge between a pair of vertices, you have to put minus one. That is Laplace matrix. And you find cofactor of any element that will give you number of spanning trees, my dear friends. The number of uh, distinct labeled spanning trees is given by cofactor of any element in the Laplace matrix. And with this method only you can find number of uh, spanning trees in a complete graph kn which is given by n power n minus 2 my dear friends. Number of spanning trees in complete graph kn is given by n power n minus 2 my dear friends. That is a formula. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Every edge in a tree is a cut edge. Okay. Every uh, edge in a tree is a cut edge. And a bridge cannot be part of any cycle. Remember this. These are the chromatic number, uh, sorry, uh, what do you call this uh, vertex connectivity and edge connectivity. It is called vertex connectivity and this is edge connectivity, my dear friends. Vertex connectivity and edge connectivity, my dear friends. So by Whitney's theorem, you can say that chromatic number is less than or equal, that is uh, vertex connectivity is less than or equal to edge connectivity is less than or equal to delta G. Please remember this. These are the numbers. I am just giving it, okay. So, I will not discuss this again story, sir. Vertex connectivity means minimum number of vertices whose removal disconnect the graph or leaves the trivial graph. And edge connectivity means minimum number of edges whose removal disconnect the graph. That is edge connectivity, my dear friends. <coughs> okay. So, there is something called perfect matching. Matching means uh, the set of non-adjacent edges, my dear friends. And when you can say matching uh, is perfect matching, it can cover all the vertices, then you call it as a perfect matching. And for perfect matching, uh, a graph to have perfect matching, this is the uh, necessary condition, sir. The graph should have even number of vertices. Even number of vertices, then only it can have perfect matching. And number of perfect matchings in K to N, I think same thing, it is repeated two times. Same thing, sir, it is same thing. Uh, number of perfect matchings in K to N is given by 2N factorial by 2 power N into N factorial and number of perfect matchings in KNN is given by N factorial. And if a graph is having 2N vertices and it is called matching number greater than or equal to N, definitely G will be having. That is 2N vertices matching number greater than or equal to, that is you have more than N non-adjacent uh, vertices, edges are there, definitely it can cover all the vertices, my difference. it can cover all the vertices, my difference. And every tree has at most one perfect match. If it is a tree, maximum perfect matchings in the tree will be one my difference. You cannot have more than one perfect matchings in a tree. See, these are all statements which can be asked directly in uh, MSQs or MCQs, my difference. <laughs> and you know, matching number plus edge covering number is equal to one. And you know, edge covering number should be greater than or equal to n by two. Because one edge can cover two words. Just, na? So definitely edge covering number should be greater than or equal to n by two. That is the idea. And uh, uh, what do you call this vertex covering number plus independence number? Independence number plus vertex covering number also equal to n. The properties about uh, matching number and edge covering number, independence number and vertex covering number, my dear friends. <coughs> and these are the chromatic numbers, coloring. So for null graph, one color is required. For cycle graph, when n is even, two colors are required. This is a very, very powerful result, sir. And for odd cycles, we require minimum three colors, my dear friends. And we'll, uh, n is even, three colors required, n is odd, four colors are required. And for complete graph, n colors are required. And you know, the beautiful results like KMN and cube generally look very dangerous. They are very beautiful results. Uh, complete bipartite graph, yato n cube just required two colors because they are bipartite graphs because these two fellows are bipartite graphs. And you take any bipartite graph, it is two colorable and chromatic number should be uh, and every cycle in the graph will be even cycle my dear friend and because of this reason 
uh, chromatic number of a tree is 2 my dear friends. If a tree is having 2 or more vertices, chromatic number of any tree is 2 my dear friends. The beautiful powerful result. Remember such powerful results sir. See they can ask you in gate directly and you will directly get marks for them. Hardly takes 5 seconds. Remember. Now these are all some general properties. Permutations with repetition properties sir. And uh, permutation with repetition or permutation of n objects with repetition is given by n power r my dear friends. And our combination of n objects with repetition can be written in multiple ways. It is same as number of non-negative integral solutions of this equation x1 plus x2 plus and so on xn is equal to r. Okay, that is given by the formula n minus 1 plus r c r. Yato n minus 1 plus r c n minus 1 my dear friends. Either this way you can write or this way you can write it. Okay, there are other different ways of expressing number of r combination of n objects without repetitions my dear friends. And these are called permutations with constrained repetitions. Suppose we are having n objects in which q1 are same, q2 are same and qt are same. Then that is given by n factorial by q1 factorial into q2 factorial and so on qt factorial. It is like you know number of uh, permutations of letters in the word rearrange, Mississippi, Tallahassee like this. These are the where you know letters are repeated. How many arrangements are there? That type of question. Of course, uh, this can be generalized or used uh, in this particular application like, you know, multinomial coefficient. Uh, the coefficient of x power, uh, x1 power n1, x2 power n2 and so on, xt power nt in this x1 plus x2 plus and so on, xt whole power n is given by what sir? Just you see, for example, if you are having x1 plus x2 plus x3 whole power 8 and you want to co find the coefficient of x1 cube, x2 power 4 and x3, it is simply given by 8 factorial by 3 factorial into 4 factorial into one factor. Suppose if there are some coefficient, even that need to be taken care of my difference. <clears throat> number of ordered permutations formula is same as your number of permutations with constraint repetition. But number of unordered partition, we don't have generally formula. But if it is of equal cell types, then we have this particular formula my difference, which is given by n factorial by q factorial whole power t into 1 by t factorial. If there are of unordered partitions of equal cell type. If there are unordered partitions of equal cell type, then we have this particular formula, my dear friends. Then comes ordinary generating function. So, this particular function is generating the sequence, my dear friends, or this sequence is having this function as generating function, my dear friends. And exponential generating function means same thing, sir. The generating function will be of the form x power r by r factorial into a r, my dear friends. That is the only difference. So, some standard formulas which you should know, they are all the very, very basic formulae, binomial expansion and simple formulae, my dear friends, which you should know. And here, what is very important is for the generating function, what is the a n and for a n, what is the generating function? You should practice these fellows in both the orders, my dear friends. You should practice these fellows in both the orders, my dear friends. All of you able to follow? Is the idea clear? Clear or not, my dear friends? So, please remember standard generating functions and the sequence. Sequence and corresponding generating function you should practice. Okay? Please practice them. Okay? For example, here you are having a n plus 1. Suppose you want a n is equal to n. You just multiply with x. If you want n, you just multiply with x. Then you get it. See this one. Similarly, here you have n plus 1 whole square. Na. If you want a n is equal to n square, na, just multiply with x, my dear friends. x into 1 plus x divided by 1 minus x whole cube. You can practice like that, my dear friends. Similarly, n plus 1 whole cube is given. If you want n cube means, if you want for a n is equal to n cube, what is fx? Sir? Just multiply with x x into 1 plus 4x plus x square divided by 1 minus x whole power 4. Remember the standard ones, my dear friends. n square, what is the generating function? n cube, what is the generating function? Please practice them. For n plus 1 and n, remember them. These are the most powerful generating functions, my dear friends. These are the most uh, powerful generating functions. Am I clear? Any other fellow is there, that formula you can use, my dear friends. That is n minus 1. That is 1 by 1 minus x whole power n is nothing but sigma n minus 1 plus r c r x power r, where r varies from 0 to infinity. 
So if you want any other fellow, you can use this formula to get the generating function for any other function by doing this. Hope you understand. And of course, this uh, coefficient of uh, function and this number of integral solution problems are one and the same. Of course, this can be used to solve uh, different types of variations, my dear friends. And the last topic, <laughs> discrete mathematics already taken three, two hours, my dear friends, no problem. Uh, then uh, we can complete uh, algorithms and data structures. See, the problems will be more, the formulas will not be there uh, that many, sir, in algorithms and data structures. Okay, standard formulas are in uh, very, very standard things are there. Okay, this because discrete mathematics is all about results, so it takes more time, obviously. It takes more time, so obviously. A general form of linear recurrence relation of order k is given by this one. So, tomorrow we'll do MSQs for the uh, discrete mathematics on Sunday, uh, 6 p.m. We do marathon series, my dear friends. So discrete mathematics, mostly review, revision will be completed in these two sessions together with this session. Am I clear? Like, see, uh, based on this characteristic roots, if it is real and distinct is C1, B1 power n plus C2, B2 power n. If it is repeated, na, you just need to multiply the second root with n, sir. C1, B power n, C2, n into B power n. Suppose one more time it is repeated C3 n square into B power n. Complex roots are not important. Those who are interested can go, go through it, sir. They will not ask you complex roots, but just for completeness, I given that. And if it is non homogeneous linear recurrence relation, <coughs> based on the form of this right hand side function, we have this. Suppose uh, Fn is equal to constant and 1 is not root of Ct, then An is ANP is simply D. So, you just substitute the solution in the full problem and find the value of D. Suppose if B is the root of CT, B, suppose B is not root happily, D some constant into B power N, you can write it. Suppose B is root of CT of multiplicity M, you have to multiply this B power N with N power M. My dear. And same is the case, suppose you are having a, uh, you know, a polynomial, okay, you have to use another polynomial with different constants, uh, arbitrary constant P0, P2 and so on. Yes, my dear friends. And if B is not root, that is the situation. If B is root of multiplicity M, the same fellow you have to multiply with N power M, my dear friends. So that is the story about your, uh, what do you call that? Recurrence relations, my dear friends. <coughs> so we completed your discrete mathematics, my dear friends. So in the next one, one and a half, we'll discuss uh, the outline of algorithms and data structures, my dear friends. <clears throat> you have any doubts, you can ask me. Any doubts, you can ask me, my dear friends. Otherwise, I'll continue with my. See, my dear friends, here mainly, <laughs> try to understand this. We have notations like big O, big omega, big theta, small o, small omega. See, here, asymptotic notation. Of course, even though we write it as less than or equal to, it's not for small values, sir. It is for large values of n you need to understand, not for small values of n. But, once you understand that asymptotic in your mind, you can just consider them as you are regular less than or equal to regular greater than or equal to regular equal to regular less than and regular greater than. With that idea, you can handle these functions. But you need to understand, okay, that these ideas are for large values of n. That you should always keep in mind. So when you say fn is big O of gn means f is smaller than g. f is big omega means f is larger than g greater than or equal to and f is theta means they are of same order of growth same equal to my dear friends and small o means less than see my dear friends whenever fn is small gn you can say fn is less than or equal to gn that is when fn is small o of gn then you can say fn is big o of gn but can you do reverse can you do reverse can you do reverse, my dear friends? The reverse property doesn't hold good. Okay, whenever fn is big O of gn, we can't say fn is small o of gn. Please remember. Same is the case with f is greater than g. 
then you can say f is greater than or equal to g but not vice versa f is greater than or equal to g you can't say f is greater than g my dear friends because that equal to may happen how can you say greater than so that idea those who understand playing with asymptotic notation is very simple sir. playing with asymptotic notation is very very simple my dear friends just understand them as regular less than regular less than or equal to same way you can easily handle my difference you can easily handle my difference that basic idea one should understand is the idea clear all of you understand so whenever f is asymptotically smaller that is f is small of g you can say f is small big o of g similarly when is f is small omega of g you can say that f is big omega of g my dear friends these ideas are very very important and these properties the most important results one should know the reflexivity reflexive means f related to g then g related to f see whenever f is equal to g you can say g is equal to f when is f is equal to g then you can say g uh, sorry reflexivity now i am very sorry Reflexive means related with itself. You can say f is related with itself happily. You can say f is less than or equal to f happily. You can say f is greater than or equal to f happily. But can you say f is less than f? Can you say this? No. So for small o notation, it doesn't work. Can you say f is greater than f? No. So small omega notation, it doesn't work. That simple it is. Okay, it's a very simple thing. People generally complicate these ideas, my dear friends. Asymptotic notations are Lilliput. See, if you understand discrete mathematics results, these results are simple results. Sir. These results are very, very simple results. See, I'm not uh, making it down, sir, but they are very simple. The only thing is we do not know how to play with them. That is the only problem with this asymptotic notation. Okay, and I always start with asymptotic notation only because that is a simple mathematics. There is nothing in this. Am I clear? Now, symmetry means what, sir? If, see, f is equal to g, then you can say g is equal to f. This can be only said for equal to. Can you say if f is less than or equal to g, can you say g is greater than or equal to, uh, g is less than or equal to f, can you say that? Can you say g less than or equal to f, can you say that? If f is less than or equal to g, can you say g less than or equal to f? You can't say that. So, symmetry doesn't work for Big o, big o or big omega, small o, small omega doesn't work. It works only for theta. Then comes transitivity. Transitivity works for what? Transitivity works like, you know, f related to g, then g related to h, then f related to h. f less than or equal to g, which is less than or equal to h, then f less than or equal to h. Same is greater than or equal to. Same is less than f is less than g is less than h, therefore f is less than h. So, this transitivity property is satisfied for all these fellows. There is one special property called transpose symmetry. See, this transpose symmetry is not accepted for theta. Transpose means suppose if f is less than or equal to g, then g is greater than or equal to f. f is less than or equal to g, then g greater than or equal to f. That is, f is big O of g, okay, f is big O bounded above by g, then g is bounded below by f same is f is small than g then g is large than f that is what you call it as transpose symmetry my dear friends and you know if t1 is big o of f and t2 is big o of g n then the product is big o of their product and their sum is big o of maximum of these two my dear friends this is a wonderful property my dear friends now this order of growth is one very important question my dear friends which is generally handled with this and log property. The log property is this one. See if log fn is less than or equal to log gn. Only log fn is less than or equal to log gn. Actually smaller actually. Not even equal to. Then fn is smaller than gn. This is the property we are having, sir. Beautiful property. This property and this basic order, dominance ranking, you can say, or basic order of growth, my dear friends. Okay, basic ordering relationship. With this, you can handle this relationship between functions. Any type of question which they ask, you can easily handle with this. See, this is called polylog. This is polynomial. 
it is exponential it is factorial it is n power n and it is 2 power 2 power n of course whatever other names people can give see this three first three are very important polylog is less than or equal to polynomial is less than or equal to exponential always remember see for example if you are having log n power 100 and you are having n power point zero 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 one but still this log n power 100 is smaller than n power point zero 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 one and this fellow will be smaller than 1.01 whole power n remember this the most important result and this is the dominance ranking between basic functions which, which you should know my dear friends dominance ranking now the time complexity problem time complexity actually is an estimate we don't find exact time complexity we just uh, estimate it as number of uh, you know statements okay number of statements executed and we assume the cost of each statement is constant and how many times statements executed that would be our time complexity but if you put it in a loop the statement may be repeated many times so that actually gives you more value to the time complexity as long as they are individual statement it amounts to constant complexity my dear friends but when it is uh, used in repetition structures then it actually counts to the complexity my dear friends and one should know the standard rules i is equal to 1 to n in steps of constant plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 anything or i is equal to uh, i think uh, it is repeated same thing oh i is equal to n i greater than or equal to i'm sorry it was i greater than or equal to 1 i minus c whatever it is both fellows will have complexity theta n my dear friends and i is equal to 1 i less than or equal to uh, n you are going in multiples of constant or from n to 1 you are coming by uh, multiples of 1 by constant the complexity would be theta log n see the standard results one should remember my dear friend, standard result and here you are going in powers of i power c or from n to 2 you are coming in cube root of c cube root of i in both the, or uh, c root of i whatever it is in any case c root of i in any case the answer is theta log log n my dear friends in any case, the answer is theta log log n, my dear friends. Is the idea clear? The standard results one should know. <clears throat> and this is one more code where you know i varies from 1 to n, but j goes in the steps of i, not constant steps. If it is constant, then it is n only. Constant, then it is uh, you know i plus c, then it is n only, but it is going in steps of i. So, what happens first time? Uh, uh, first time uh, the inner code for i is equal to 1 inner loop varies n times second time for i is equal to n inner loop varies n by 2 times for i is equal to 3 inner loop varies from i is equal to n by 2 square times like that it continues like n plus n by 2 square n by 2 plus and so on n by some 2 power k let us suppose taking n common it is 1 plus 1 by 2 plus and so on 1 by 2 power k my dear friends and this amounts to be log n my dear friends because it is uh, 1 by 2 power k plus 1 because a into a is 1 a is 1 1 into 1 minus r power k plus 1 because 0 to k plus 1 or 2 power k plus 1 by 1 minus 1 by 2 my dear friends which is nothing but this 1 by 2 2 will come up which is 1 by 2 power k plus 1 we assume that this 2 power k 1 by 2 power k is uh, we assume that this uh, 1 by 2 4 power k is n my dear friends so this would be amounting to n so what happens to this oh sorry this has to continue till what time sir it has to continue till n by 2 power k is equal to 1 that is 2 power k should be equal to n uh, that means k should be equal to log n am i clear so this amounts to what sir uh, this is n uh, what is this 1 minus 2 power k i think somewhere something wrong 2 power k minus 1 yes. simplifications i am doing mistakes of course it is n how long it should continue n by 2 times n by Oh, sorry, it is not n by 2 square, it is n by 3, na? n by 3 and so on, sorry. 
the other problem i am doing n by 3 and so on n by n so it is 1 by 2 1 by 3 it goes up to 1 by n so it is 1 by n it is harmonic series so log n my dear friends it is harmonic series you are going in steps of one na? first time n second time n by 2 third time n by 3 fourth time n by 4 up to n by n so taking n common it is n into 1 plus 1 by 2 plus 1 by 3 and so on 1 by n which is log n my dear friends so the code whenever you get this you know dependent code of this particular form you can remember directly the complexity would be theta n log n my dear friends yeah so the recurrences are the problems expressed in terms of that is express problem in terms of sub problems the basic idea of recurrence relation is problems in terms of sub problems See, actually taken many uh, topics under this recurrence relations only in your uh, YouTube also. Okay, how to think recursively. There are many uh, topics which I taken on the recursion, my dear friends. How to write the recurrence relations I taken. So, some examples. Writing problem in terms of sub-problems. The famous one Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci n is nothing but Fib n minus 1 plus Fib n minus 2. And this is Tower of Hanai problem. Okay, where you have to move n uh, disks from uh, starting to destination using some middle or some temporary disk or uh, peg, my dear friends. That is, first you have to transfer n minus 1 to the uh, intermediate fellow. Then you have to uh, move the last one, that is the main largest disk to the destination. Then this n minus 1, you have to move to the destination, my dear friends. So, it amounts to tn minus 1 problem, you have to move to the temporary fellow one disk you have to move to the destination that is one here this tn minus one work you have to do two times so that is how we get this particular uh, recurrence relation my friends and we have uh, this uh, very important uh, master theorem of course there are many methods for solving recurrence relation one is called iterative method so keep on uh, iterating uh, either using forward iteration or backward iteration you can use it sir to get the answer that is iterative method the next one is for special type of recurrence relation called divide and conquer recurrence relation. These uh, type of recurrence relations are called divide and conquer recurrence relations. For these type of recurrence relations, we can use this master theorem. See, the idea of master theorem is very, very important, sir. See, it is all about comparison between n power log a to the base b versus fn. Suppose n power log a to the base b dominates, then theta n power log a to the base b. If, if both are having same order of growth, you just need to multiply with log n. Suppose if fn dominates and satisfies this regularity condition. Generally for polynomial, you don't have to ver verify this regularity condition, sir. Obviously, it will be satisfied. If this regularity condition is satisfied, then theta of fn is the answer. Okay, so that is it. And there is an extended version of this particular master theorem. This is, see, this is for any fn. When fn is of this particular format, this extended theorem is applicable when fn is of the form polynomial multiplied with some log power pn. See, this extended theorem you cannot apply for 2 power n. Some people apply for everything, they apply this. Don't do that. It is only for this particular format. You need to understand that. See, when fn is of this particular format, see, for all formats, this can be applied. Whereas this can be applied when fn is of the form n power k multiplied with log power pn. So here, because this n power k, we are multi, we are comparing this n power k with n power log a to the base b. So we expect this to be some b power k or that b power, that power to be either more than k, less than k or equal to k. Based on that, you are going to get this particular result, my dear friends. So if a is greater than b power k, if a is greater than b power k, what happens, sir? This value will be greater than, this fellow will be greater than n power k. Suppose, that is if a is greater than b power k. If a is equal to b power k, this fellow's order will be same as n power k. This fellow order will be same as n power k. If a is less than b power k, this fellow's order will be less than n power k, my dear friends. So, that is the logic, nothing more than that, my dear friends. So, when a is greater than b power k, obviously, this fellow is dominating according to your first condition of master theorem also, tn is theta of n power log a to the base b. But, when they are of equal order of growth, based on this log fra fraction, we are going to get the answer. If p value is greater than minus 1, Okay, p value is greater than minus 1. You just multiply with log p power 
log power p plus 1 that is power of log is incremented by 1 by dt okay that is p plus 1 of n and when p is minus 1 it becomes log log n my dear friend that is log power p n is replaced with some log log n my dear friend and when p is less than 1 that log factor is completely thrown out and you can write uh, theta power n power k at the uh, n power log a to the base b anything you can write my dear friends now the case when a is less than b power k that is the third case here this is dominating so you can when p value is greater than or equal to 0 directly you can write uh, the fn part fn part whatever is there that is n power k log power pn you can write it but when p value is smaller than 0 that log power pn uh, factor has no effect that can be removed completely and you get big o of n power k my dear friend okay so the uh, complexity would be big o of n power k so this is your extended master theorem my dear friends so i just i suggest students to practice it with numericals you put some values of a b on your own and try this problems my dear friends so you can try this problem like you know 4 t n by 2 plus n square log cube n like this you have to practice you can't just practice with the general result like this you have to keep some numbers and practice then only you will understand you can't just keep this looking at this and practice like this sir it will not help you you have to practice with numericals my dear friends whether it is master theorem or this extended master theorem always practice with numericals so number of problems required for this my dear friends <coughs> even recently in the marathon series i solved number of examples based on this my dear friends you can see that and this is subtract and conquer theorem actually the first case when a is less than one is useless practically not applicable but we just write for completeness my dear friend mathematically applicable practically it is not useful my dear friends <coughs> see a tn minus b fn see this is not applicable for all fn sir it is applicable only when fn is of the form polynomial this subtract and conquer theorem people don't see these results properly it is applicable only when fn is of the form polynomial if fn is not polynomial if fn is not polynomial for example if i have tn is equal to tn minus 1 plus 1 by n you can't apply the subtract and conquer theorem so you have to go for iteration method yeah thought recursion tree method you have to go this method doesn't work for this remember that okay please note that point my dear friends and when a is equal to 1 simply tn is this uh, order n power k plus 1 you write down but in a is greater than 1 it is big o of n power k there is this n power k a power n by b my dear friends so this would be the formula my dear friends see for example if you are having uh, 2 tn minus uh, uh, 1 am i clear 2 tn minus 1 say order n square is given because a value is greater than 1 it is tn is equal to big o of n square into a that is 2 power n by b b means 1 n by 1 so it is n square 2 power n my dear friends directly you can write the answer like this okay practice with numericals always practice such results with numericals blindly if you practice it's of no use my dear friends <coughs> the variant is very important when you have this is very useful in your quick sort algorithm uh, kth smallest number in all such things the average case is uh, done with this idea only all the average case uh, splits see in quick sort if you get different splits average case splits different uh, forms of splits you can get it sir like you know tn is equal to tn by 4 plus t3n by 4 split some theta n for splitting it that is the partitioning algorithm uh, takes theta n time so all such cases where here you see alpha value is 1 by 4 and beta value alpha minus 1 minus alpha is 3 by 4 1 minus alpha is 3 by 4 so this is alpha this is 1 minus alpha this particular form so the complexity is theta n log n my difference and actually there is one variation like t n is equal to t alpha 1 n plus t alpha 2 n and so on t alpha k n plus some n theta n or some n and if some of these fellows here all alpha i's are uh, less than one only sir all alpha i's are zero to one values and some of these fellows is equal to n then the complexity would be theta n log n and if some of all these values is less than n then the complexity is theta n my difference 
If sum of sub problems is less than size of the problem, then the complexity is theta n. Remember this very interesting result, my dear friends, which will be very, very useful for you. Got it? Now, when you go for this uh, searching problem, linear search and binary search, so we are taking it as a successful search case. The best case uh, in the linear search, because you are searching from first element, second element like that, because this is useful for unsorted arrays, which is useful for unsorted arrays also. Unsorted arrays. So we can find the best case, that is first element is your search element, theta one time. Worst case, you have to traverse the entire list. Even the average case, you have to take our uh, element is found in first position, second position. The probabilities, you have to take it and expected values, you have to find it. That will be also equal to theta n, my dear friends. So the worst case and average case, linear search complexity when it is a successful search is theta n. See, my dear friends, if it is an unsuccessful search, even best case is theta n. Remember that. Whereas in binary search, because you, are, you should have a sorted array here. We should have a sorted array here. And the best case search, we find mid element. If it is found, fine. Otherwise, either in the left or right, you are going to find that particular value, my dear friends. So the time complexity for this is, because either left or right subarray, you are doing it. And find a value, uh, I mean, time complexity for uh, finding mid value, some constant, my dear friends. So this is the uh, recurrence relation. And this recurrence relation is having time complexity theta n here will be because uh, both uh, n power log a to the base b as well as fn has same order of growth that is uh, n power 0 that is constant. So you have to multiply with log n. So the complexity would be theta log n my difference. So in the worst case and average case, the complexity would be theta log n my difference. Then you know the Mersart, the recurrence relation. Mersart, the idea in Mersart is what, sir? What is the idea of uh, Mersart, my dear friends? You divide into two subproblems. Again, we divide into subproblems till you get small subproblems. Then you merge them, okay, in pairs, my dear friends. Okay, the small subparts you are going to merge them. See, for merge, you are going to take a temporary array into place, okay, because of that, the space complexity for uh, Mersart is theta n of course recursion stack space is there generally recursion stack space they are not considered as extra spacer here the extra space is required extra space is required is theta n my dear friends so that theta n extra space is required for merge sort my dear friends am i clear so uh, time for dividing into two sub problems then time for merging them this time this is for co combining the two sub problems into a single problem after dividing into sub problems. So this, because left and right sub problems both need to be solved. So two times P n by two plus theta n by two. See in all the cases, the time complexity for merge sort because it's a divide and conquer recurrence relation by merge sort, by, by master theorem, the time complexity is theta n log n because in all cases, we are going to get this particular recurrence relation, my difference. So the time complexity in all cases is theta n log n, my difference. Theta n log n is the time complexity. Now, quick sort, it depends on partitioning element. So, you are going to take the partitioning element. You need to understand this partitioning element. They'll uh, twist the story here only in the gate examination. See, the generally in quick sort algorithm, the first element is taken as pivot element and we try to place it in its correct position. We try to place it in correct position, my dear friends. So, once it is placed in its correct position, we have left subarray, right subarray. And where that element goes, Depending on that, we are going to get splits, my dear friends. So the best split should happen when you uh, find that uh, pivot element always as the median element or middle element of the array. So obviously what happened, left subarray Tn by 2, right subarray Tn by 2, and time to find the position of this element is theta n. So 2 Tn by 2 theta n, and the time complexity of this is theta n log n, my dear friends. Okay, and average case partition, what happens? You are going to get this alpha n t 1 minus alpha n plus theta n splits. That is alpha n and 1 minus alpha n splits, where alpha plus 1 minus alpha is equal to 1. Am I clear? So the complexity would be theta n log n, my difference. But the worst complexity will happen when you are having n minus 1 0 split, my difference. See, generally this n minus 1 0 split happen for sorted or reverse sorted arrays sorted yato reverse sorted arrays this particular 
n minus 1 0 split happen or whatever uh, elements which gives you this n minus 1 0 split this particular time complexity okay you can use the previous example my dear friend a value is equal to 1 a value is equal to 1 the subtract and conquer theorem the complexity of this is order n square my dear friends so that is the worst case complexity for quick sort my dear friends okay so please remember this uh, uh, splits it depends on where you do the split my dear friends okay see uh, some special questions were asked based on the split my dear friends if you understand that you can easily answer uh, questions from quicksort recently in marathon series also i taken few questions you can just go through that marathon series for understanding problems on quicksort my dear friends then there is something called kth smallest element See, the idea for kth smallest element is similar to that of your quicksort, sir. You take uh, element and you try to find its position, my dear friends. Suppose the position that is jth position, you got it, and that is the kth position. Obviously, it is the kth smallest element. Suppose the you want to find kth smallest element, you got j pivot element, and that position you find that is j. j is, uh, j is greater than k means. Uh, that kth smallest will be found in the right subarray. Okay, kth smallest. Okay, uh, k less than j means uh, k less than j means k element is in the left subarray. You try to find in the left subarray. If k is greater than j means you have to find it in the right subarray. So here either you are searching in the left subarray or searching in the right subarray only. It is not two times set. You are not going to get this two, my dear friends. Either left subarray or right subarray you are going to get. Now the best case is the j position is k this is the best case my dear friends but for that finding the position of j you need theta n work so the best case is theta n my dear friends now if you take the average case there may be different types of splits which may happen any of these splits may happen sir so you may get n by 2 split or n by 5 split or 4 n by 5 splits if you take any of these cases the time complexity is theta n my dear friends because by master theorem uh, both uh, uh, I think Fn, Fn dominates here. Fn dominates. So, theta Fn will be the complexity, my dear friends. But the worst case will happen when the split, that is, the element is found here, the kth smallest element is in the right part. So, you have to solve this Tn minus 1 plus n problem and that gives you the time complexity theta n square, my dear friends. So, for the kth smallest element, best or average case complexity is theta n, but the worst case complexity is theta n square, my dear friends. <coughs> Now, for our sorting algorithms, the best cases, worst case and average cases are given in this particular table, my dear friend. Please go through the table. This is very important, my dear friends, to remember, practice. And one more thing about uh, this sorting algorithms is whether they are stable in place or adaptable. Stable means, stable means relative order of equal keys does not change see suppose there are two equal keys are there their order will be remaining same that is what you mean by stable sorting algorithm then call uh, in place algorithm see in place algorithm means the extra space generally here in in place we, we are not counting the recursion stack space into m only okay because of that quick sort also is considered as in place my dear friend because of that quick sort is also considered as in place that is extra amount other than the recursion stack space is not required okay of course these algorithm does not require recursion stack space also am i clear so all are in place except merge sort merge sort requires some extra space my dear friend which is of complexity theta n my dear friends okay whereas adaptive means if it is already sorted See, it's already sorted, we should not sort it again. So, when the keys are sorted, okay, you should speed up to theta n time. So, that is possible for bubble sort and insertion sort only. Only these are adaptive, my dear friends. Okay, only these are adaptive. See, insertion sort, of course, bubble sort, there is a, a version modified bubble sort, you call it. Original bubble sort is not uh, adaptive, but you can modify into adaptive nature. You can convert into adaptive bubble sort, my dear friends. Whereas insertion sort is considered as best algorithm for adaptive. So when what is the best adaptive algorithm for sorting, sir? Insertion sort. So when the uh, when the array is sorted or reverse sorted, the best algorithm to be used is insertion sort, my dear friends. Quick sort actually for other algorithms or other uh, arrays, 
uh, which are not properly sorted quick sort works better okay most of the time quick sort takes average case complexity not worst case complexity other algorithm generally performs in their worst case complexity whereas quick sort works in its average complexity but for sorted and reverse sorted it works in the worst case complexity am i clear remember that so that is about the sorting methods and their properties my dear friends please note out of course these are your <laughs> standard algorithms dynamic programming algorithms see for dynamic programming algorithms two things which they can ask you is one is the recurrence relation they can ask you for matrix chain multiplication problem also can be asked but the recurrence relation can be asked then they can ask you the time complexity see the dynamic programming complexity is theta and q but if you use the brute force technique it is having cat law number the complexity is cat law number which is given by omega 4 power n by n power 3 by 2 that is the uh, you know uh, lower bound for cat law number my dear friends okay <clears throat> so please remember because i am not discussing the recurrence relation completely that again takes a lot of time uh, you might have known already how to write the recurrence relation so what is important for this uh, dynamic programming problem is the recurrence relation the time complexities main time complexities you remember this theta n cube is the time complexity for uh, you know matrix chain multiplication because they can give you like time complexities for here for here match the following type of questions are very famous with this uh, uh, you know dynamic programming and greedy algorithms my dear friends the next one is longest common subsequence problem and this is the recurrence relation for lcs problem if you use brute force it is n into 2 power m complexity but when you use the dynamic programming approach it reduces to theta m into n or n into m complexity my dear friends okay problem is also very important under this see for lcs problem is important even for mcm uh, problem is important recurrence relation can be asked time complexity can be asked here also all the three can be asked in the examination my difference so please remember all the three my difference next floyd warshall algorithm the time complexity can be asked my dear friend or the recurrence relation can be asked questions very rare question to be asked in the examination is very rare but it's not difficult but a little lengthy my dear friends that is the only thing so the recurrence relation is very important that is you have to find you know uh, shortest path from i to j all pair shortest partner so uh, using k labeled vertices means so using k is better without using k is better based on that you are going to get this particular minimum value whatever is minimum that you are going to take my difference okay that is the recurrence relation here brute force is order n square into 2 power m but when you use the dynamic programming approach the complexity is theta n cube my difference see this time complexity is theta n cube even uh, matrix chain multiplication complexity is theta n cube whereas uh, longest common subsequence uh, problem dynamic uh, complexity is theta m into n my difference and the next one is 0 1 knapsack problem even here the uh, recurrence relation is very important my dear friends i think one of the classes i discussed this recurrence relation also you can just go through that okay and the recurrence relation this is the recurrence relation this actually depends on whether uh, ith item uh, is used in the solution or not used in the solution based on that you get recurrence relation brute force is 2 power and exponential complexity but if you use dynamic programming approach it is theta n into capacity my dear friends generally capacity is constant so theta n only we say but you should remember that theta n into c because capacity is a very big value then you have to use that accordingly so that's why they mentioned theta n c my dear friends now for greedy algorithms i think uh, problems are very important here for greedy algorithms problems are very important complexities for all the greedy algorithms the main idea is sorting them and solving it <coughs> or uh, okay sir thank you sir nishu kumar sir thank you very very much see in greedy the algorithm the problems are very important problems are very important then uh, the con i mean uh, procedures sir. okay so procedures they may ask or in uh, you know uh, match the following type of things they can ask you the complexities all are theta and log n complexities my dear friend because sorting is the main uh, aspect here so for all this Hoffman coding optimal merge pattern fraction knapsack problem or job sequencing problem the complexity is theta n log n my dear friends then comes your graph algorithms see graph algorithms we are having a graph traversal algorithm 
See, generally graph traversal algorithm based on, uh, you know, how you represent the graph, whether you are using adsense matrix or adsense list, my dear friends. See, for adsense matrix, order n square, they are also denoted by order v squares. Whereas adsense list, it is order v plus e, they write it. Anyway, you can write it, sir, that is fixed. Space and time will be exactly same, my dear friends. Order v plus e, if it is adsense list, order v square, if it is adsense matrix. Same is the case for depth first search. See, in depth first search, we are going to use Q data structure. Whereas in depth first search, we are going to use stack data structure. Okay. Shall we solve a problem for BFS, BFS or you can go through the problems which we solved earlier, my dear friends. I think in marathon series, we taken problem for both BFS and DFS. You can just go through it. Okay. So here I'll just discuss the complexities. And for minimal spanning trees, you need to know about this Prims and Kruskal algorithm. The main difference between Prims and Kruskal algorithm is, see, while building the minimal spanning tree, the substructure which you form in Prims algorithm is always a tree. Okay. So you are going to keep trees, that tree uh, combined to form full tree, my dear friends. So, a is a subset of minimal spanning tree, then the edges of A always form a single tree. The edges of any part which you created so far always form a tree. Whereas Kruskal algorithm, the problem is the sub portion which you created because you may select one edge here, one edge here, one edge here like this. So the sub portion may not be tree, my dear friend. So it may be forming forest, but towards the end, the minimal spanning tree will be formed. Here, the sub tree always formed will be a tree, my dear friend. So that is the main difference between your Prim's algorithm and Kruskal algorithm. The complexity of Prim's algorithm is order E log V. Whereas for Kruskal algorithm, it is order E log E. But, uh, you know, uh, number of edges is of order V square. Okay. So because of that order E log E, this E is written as V square. So we can take it as also as order E log V, my dear friends. You can also take it as order E log V, my dear friends. So that is... Uh, the complexity for uh, you know prims and Kruskal algorithm then we can take uh, one example for this if you want to go for prims algorithm you have to start at one vertex suppose you select this particular vertex then from here you make a split so what is the edge crossing that particular uh, you know cut you can call it cut the smallest edge crossing the cut you have to select it then d is selected my difference then this cut is removed. Then you have to take the uh, cut, cutting these two vertices from other vertices. And smallest edge crossing this cut, you have to select it. That fellow is selected. So next vertex selected is A. So you can remove this cut, but uh, cut my dear friends. Then you have to create a cut which separate these three vertices from other one. What is the smallest edge? Yeah, E log V only I written. Na? E log V. E log V. E log V. Nishu Kumar, yes. Smallest cut crossing this, that is 3, you have to say. Uh, 3, you select, that is, this is selected. So, remove this cut, my dear friends. Now, uh, you have to see the uh, cut which separate uh, these vertices from the other vertex. And what is the smallest edge crossing the cut? This is 7. So, the Prim's algorithm gives this 2 plus uh, you know, 5 plus 3 plus 7, that is the minimal cost spanning tree or the minimal cost of the spanning tree, 7 plus 7, 14 plus 3, 17, my dear friends. But if you use Kruskal algorithm for this, if you want to use Kruskal's algorithm for this, you have to arrange the edges according to their weights, my dear friends. You have to arrange the edges according to their weights, my dear friends. So, smallest edge is BD, that is having cost 2. The next one is AC, which is having cost 3. The next one is uh, BA, having cost 5. Next one is CD, having cost 6. Next one is CE, having cost 7. Next one is DE, having cost 8. First, BD can be selected. Yes, BD can be selected because it is not forming cycle. Okay, it is a branch. Next, AC can be selected. Yes. See, if you observe BD and AC selected, at this position, the subset of edges doesn't form a tree. It is not a tree. Whereas in Prims, you always create a tree, my dear friends. See, this is how we created. So at every step, the substructure 
of the spanning tree that a set of edges which are selected always form a tree in prims whereas in cruskal they need not always form a tree that is the important point to be noted for difference between cruskal and prims algorithm my dear friends then uh, ac is selected yes then after that uh, this particular fellow 5 that is selected but 6 cannot be selected because it is forms a cycle then 7 is selected my dear friends so cost would be the same cost is same but the only thing is the methodology in which it is solved is different. Then comes single source shortest path algorithms. We have two algorithms. One is called Dijkstra's algorithm. The other one is Bellman Ford's algorithm, my dear friends. See, see uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, negative weights are not allowed, my dear friends. Negative weights are, negative edge weights are not allowed. And the complexity is same as that of your Prince or Fiscal algorithm. That is order E log V, my dear friends. Whereas Bellman Ford's algorithm, negative weights are allowed, but negative cycle reachable from source are not allowed. So, if you can reach a negative cycle, so if the cycle is negative, so you can just go around, go around, go around. So, it can, it keep on reducing the cost of it. Okay. So, you are not going to get the final answer here. So, this is not allowed, my dear friends. And here the time complexity is order V into E, my dear friends. Order V into E is the time complexity, my dear friends. Okay. Because uh, every time you have to repeat that edge set, my dear friends, till you select V vertices. Because of that order V into E is the time complexity for this Bellman Ford's algorithm. So, these are the uh, complexities for graph algorithms, my dear friends. Okay. Now, let us move on to the next topic that is data structures. Okay. So, let us wind up uh, quickly. Because data structures, uh, the ideas are very simple, my dear friends. So, simple ideas. So, it will not take much time. Okay, but uh, before I complete, I want 100 likes because a lot of effort has been put by both of us, Mr. Sachar sir and me and we expect more likes, more subscriptions, okay, and more shares. Am I clear? See, my dear friends, see when you are coming online and YouTube sessions, to reach out more and more students my dear friends because see not everyone uh, are uh, taking the courses there are so many people outside okay see i tell you now minimum qualifying also not happening out of out of 1 lakh students if students are writing 1 lakh students are writing you know how many people are qualifying 16 15 14 17 percent people are qualifying that is out of 1 lakh people 17,000 18,000 people qualify remaining 82,000 don't even qualify now some people ask me sir what is the use of just qualification are yaar, you don't even have the basic minimum common sense that shows that if you are writing the examination you are not qualifying that means the minimal required knowledge for an engineer you do not have and you are not worried about it because <coughs> outside the university examination pattern it is a pattern based examination one day you prepare and you get 90 percent 95 percent marks okay people may get 70 80 percent also people are happy with that even if they pass they are happy so they don't want to you know utilize this see my dear friends you are a computer science student Tomorrow, the technologies may vary, technologies may change, but these standard subjects will never change. The subjects which you study in your gate are the basics, the foundations for computer science student. Once your foundation is strong, the technology may change, but the foundation can never change. So, you can just give some beautiful colors to that, sir. Am I clear? See, all this chat, GPT and all, okay, they'll come. See, now what happened? People, whatever uh, doubt they get it, they just browse it and they'll get the answer. At our time, we don't have all such. Because we used to study properly, make a notes and understand, get the properties. Now, whatever you don't know, you type, get some nonsense and think that is it. And now, people are not using the results. They are just seeing the result. That is the difference happens. See, my dear friends, if chat gpto whatever anything which solution is ready made available you never solve the problem you just see the problem you just see the solution there's a lot of difference between solving a problem and seeing a solution of a problem so the people who are just seeing the solution of problem never be never complicated for others sir please remember this okay if you are not able to 
qualify gate okay you are not at all an eligible engineer my dear friends that i can assure you but those who can minimum qualify uh, in beginning someone asked me one question so for pw category see what our category it is okay there may be different categories see there also competition is there otherwise you know okay you have some uh, reservation or something you can get just crack that it's not like that for everywhere comp people are determined to get some good rank competition will be there the 17000 people are competition am i clear and these people who are not even qualifying it they're just playing it okay see if you can attend such sessions at least uh, marathon session and this qualification is obvious sir simply you can qualify definitely all the subjects once you complete na definitely qualification is just a cake walk that is just with 4 5 days preparation or 10 days preparation qualification can happen only thing is how to make it a good rank see first of all if you want to get good rank minimal eligibility is what sir okay suppose you started running today you cannot be usain bolt okay suppose you started practice of football you cannot be the uh, what do you call messi am i clear you have to do the practice so that next level you can reach but you have to start na so people always uh, say i cannot be the topper why should i write you not even started and you say that i cannot be topper see that is it the negative and they spread this negativity among their friends also okay see my dear friends for computer science student the possibility i tell you before starting the data structures now in the market if you take one two months course okay there are some uh, you know uh, what do you call this uh, simple of course uh, bp jobs are always there now you know bda jobs also people are going after btech okay so these are all jobs are available am i clear testing jobs will be there for one two months uh, preparation you can get it but what is the use you will be in what level you will be retiring that you never understand am i clear see if you want to go to the next level now suppose a big recession uh, bomb uh, blast okay most of the people who come out of that would be the people who just managed to get the job will come out see see always suppose there is some recession or some uh, layoffs are happening you can see that 5 10 20 percent will lay off will happen not 100 percent layoff will happen no? okay so that people who are laid off maybe some people may be laid off due to different reasons but the people who are not needed are out okay you cannot change your technology also then you are out so for that this base should be very very strong i always suggest computer science student prepare well for gate examination because you will be tested properly for your undergraduate subjects in this examination okay it's not because i am teaching gate you have to do it sir even if i don't teach okay i suggest this you have to write a good competitive examination of that particular engineering branch or whatever uh, thing you are doing it sir you have to get qualified to prove yourself to prove that you are an engineer just with your college marks you cannot prove sir remember that okay yeah so with this long detailed motivation let us start with Uh, discussion about data structures so in data structures about arrays uh, one thing is memory representation we call it uh, if you have one dimensional array suppose the array ranging from l to u the size of the array is u minus l plus 1 and you want to find location of ith index a ith element it is base address we call it as base address then it is i minus starting location or starting index into k is the size of each element so with this you can get size of each element you can reach that particular element my friends then comes your array uh, formula a l1 u that is two dimensional array so you are having a uh, row number uh, l1 to u1 i make clear l1 u1 and l2 u2 my friends so this difference will give you number of rows and this will give you the number of columns my friends okay so if you want uh, writing in the row major order row by row so if you want to reach this ith element first you have to complete row by row means this many rows you have to complete so this i minus l1 into see this is in each row how many columns are that columns will give you c will give you c is what number of elements in each row so how many rows you have to complete i minus l1 rows into each row this many elements will be there 
each row this many elements will be there and in this uh, ith row up to jth element that is j minus l2 you have to complete it my friends okay so into k k is size of element alpha is base address whereas if you are going for column major order first you have to complete these columns suppose you want to reach this element this columns you have to reach so each column will have r elements so j minus l2 j minus l2 columns you have to complete it in each column this many elements are there then in this uh, uh, this particular column jth column i minus l1 elements you have to complete this many elements you have to complete my difference that is right hope you understand so that will give you the column major order my difference now when you take this linked list okay when you take this linked list my difference okay so it is a singly linked list okay so if you want to traverse the singly linked list the time complexity is theta n my dear friends the time complexity to traverse a single linked list is theta n my dear friends and searching an element see searching best case would be theta 1 but we generally here i am writing only worst case complexities my dear friends i am writing only worst case complexities my dear friends the worst case complexity for search would be you have to traverse the entire list to find the element so theta n my dear friends theta n is the time complexity my dear friends okay whereas insertion see if you want to insert a new node at the beginning see you can take a new node ptr and ptr link is start then start is ptr so order one time just two pointer manipulation you can insert a new node at the beginning so at the beginning you can insert an, a node in theta one time my dear friends but if you want to insert at any position or insert at end of the list you have to travel till that point so theta n will be the complexity same is the case for deletion in a singly linked list my dear friends deletion of starting node is very simple sir if you want to delete the starting element just do this you can delete the element of course you can uh, remove this properly by freeing the node okay that is all you know programming aspect but you can just uh, change the link of the start node to the next of the start node you can easily get that my dear friends okay so deletion uh, complexities would be this one is that clear then it is a circular linked list generally uh, the good way to access circular linked list is keep the pointer to the last node my dear friends if you can keep the pointer to the last node see in this what happens of course traverse and search will take theta and time but insertion at the beginning or insertion at the end can be done in theta one time insertion at the beginning or end can be done in theta one time if you keep the pointer to the last one but insertion at a position will take theta n time my dear friends but deletion starting node deletion can be done in theta one time but deletion of the last node because if you want to delete this node if you want to delete this node you should have pointer to this so you have to traverse so theta n will be the complexity for that my dear friends theta n will be the complexity for this my dear friends hope you understand and now uh, position if you want to delete at a position you have to traverse so theta n will be the complexity now comes doubly linked list of course you have two links my dear friends okay so traversing will take theta n times searching will take theta n time my dear friends insertion see if you want to insert at the beginning of course it will take theta one time insertion at the end because if you have only one link to the starting pointer by default we assume that we have pointer to the first node you have to traverse the entire list so theta n is the complexity inserting at a position means you have to traverse till that particular position my dear friends and deletion at the starting position just one pointer manipulation will delete it end or any position you have to traverse so theta n will be the complexity my dear friends now stack stack is last in first out before structure we call it see if uh, using array you want to implement stack using array if you want to implement stack see uh, the operation like push pop and top push means push operation see for push operation this is the top uh, we can keep the pointer or top index we can keep track of whenever you want to insert any new element just uh, increment top at this particular position you can uh, push the new element my difference you can push the new element my difference so uh, pop means you have to delete then what you need to do just take uh, keep this element in some uh, node or item or value is equal to that uh, stack top element and top you can just decrement my difference 
so that can be done in theta one time see the top just will return the top most element but top pointer will remain the same my dear friend we are not removing it we are just telling what is the top most element my dear friends so using arrays if you want to implement stack this can be implemented in theta one time my dear friend all the operations can be performed in theta one time my dear friends whereas uh, actually this is a very interesting problem if you want two stacks also or multiple stacks also can be implemented using one array my dear friends okay for that you have to keep two indices uh, two point pointers in the sense it's not pointers sir this uh, value top uh, denotes one index and top two denotes another index top one goes from zero to it will increase in this direction top two increase in this direction initially top one will be at zero index uh, top one will be uh, at minus one maybe zero means you want to utilize full st stack means full array means initially top one will be at minus one and top two will be at m my difference that is talk uh, stack empty condition both the stacks are empty now as uh, you know whenever you want to increment top is incremented at that position you are going to place the element my difference suppose top one is here and top two is here top one increases in this direction whereas top two the index will decrease my difference now how many elements are there how many elements are there of course stack full condition means of course before uh, how many elements are there what is stack full condition see top one you cannot increment see this top one can be incremented up to here suppose if top one reached here top 1 plus 1 is equal to top 2 or top 2 minus 1 is equal to top 1 then stack is full you cannot uh, add any more elements in the stack my dear friends similarly top 2 is top 1 plus 1 same thing sir top 1 plus 1 same condition is for stack full condition how many elements are there suppose top 1 is here see top 1 to 0 how many elements will be there sir top 1 minus 0 plus 1 and from here to here m minus 1 to top 2 plus 1 see whenever you are having lu how many elements are there u minus l plus 1 elements are there so this plus this will be the answer which is top 1 plus 1 and this is <coughs> i think somewhere something plus 1 na? sorry this is plus 1 this 1 1 cancel you get m minus top 2 that is top 1 minus top 2 plus m plus 1 is the number of elements in uh, number of elements in two stacks my dear friends so using this you can find number of elements in two stacks see all questions all such questions are very important for gate point of view my dear friends all such questions are very important and suppose using a linked list if you want to implement see you can keep the pointer to this first node my dear friends so insertion can be done at this particular end deletions can be done at this particular end so even uh, top element you can find with this operation so it's a very simple operation my dear friends so order one time only you can implement using linked list also that is not a big deal my dear friends now there are some applications like stack permutations how many stack permutations are possible for the numbers 1 to n my dear friends that is given by catlon number which is 1 by n plus 1 2 n cn my dear friends this many stack permutations are possible this many stack permutations are possible okay suppose if you are having numbers 1 2 3 4 5 number of stack permutations someone asks how many stack permutations are there which is nothing but n is equal to 5 no so 1 by 6 uh, 10 10 c 5 my difference simplify to get the required answer hope you understand so that is the answer my difference <coughs> so let us discuss these ideas for some time in other way hope you understand mm -hmm. now one more uh, this one like you know uh, postfix expression using stack and uh, postfix evaluation using stack is one more important application let me explain this with this simple example when you want to write the postfix evaluation okay we read the input from left to right whenever you sim you see any uh, symbol i mean symbol in the sense uh, any uh, whenever you see any uh, operand directly append to the postfix string okay if the symbol is operand append to the postfix string my dear friends suppose if it is left symbol you are going to push it on to the stack my dear friends if the symbol is operator you are going to uh, check this condition precedence of the symbol is smaller or equal to top of the stack symbol then you pop okay and append to the postfix string then 
you are going to push this onto the stack my dear friends but here uh, there is one thing called uh, right to left associative operator see if uh, normally if this is less than or equal to when it is right to left uh, you use less than here and here we use greater than or equal to so that small variation we do it for right to left uh, associative operators my dear friends when it is right to left associative operator instead of less than or equal to only for less than we do it here my dear friends please note that point okay so here star comes it will be pushed on to the stack then b comes pushed on to the stack now power power is having higher precedence than multiplication so star is removed and append to the post fixed string and power is pushed onto the stack then left parenthesis anywhere you find left parenthesis directly push onto the stack plus push onto the stack then d append to the post fix uh, sorry c we forgot to write sir c we forgot to write c we have to write it here then plus comes c plus is uh, pushed onto the stack then d then when you see right parenthesis remove all the symbols till you get the left parenthesis plus and then uh, right para left parenthesis is removed and thrown out then you see power ne now when you see power actually power is having equal precedence see other equal precedence operators normally what you do you pop them but for power what you do because it is right to left associative you are going to push it inside the stack my dear friends you are going to push it inside the stack okay then uh, you see e now all the symbols are completed pop everything and append to the post fix string my dear friends so this is how we convert infix to post fix string and this is the algorithm my dear friends i think it is useful for you i just given this particular algorithm so keep it and uh, read before going for exam then once you got the post fix you can also expand or evaluate post fix my dear friends see for this you are going to use operand stack here we use operator stack here we are going to use operand stack okay so the idea is very simple sir so whenever you see operand you are going to push on to the stack when you see operand push on to the stack now you see operator so first pop will give you second operator star second pop will give you first operator 5 into 4 20 that is again pushed on to the stack then you see 6 push on to the stack then you see 7 push on to the stack then you see plus so pop it is second operator pop it is first operator 6 plus 7 13 pushed on to the stack am i clear pushed on to the stack then again 13 uh, the 13 um, uh, plus you done uh, pushed on to the stack then again you see minus 13 pop 20 pop 20 minus 13 is 7 uh, push on to the stack then you see 3 push on to the stack then you see plus sign pop 3 pop 7 7 plus 3 10 push on to the stack nothing else is there so 10 is the answer my dear friends 10 is the answer my dear friends so this is your post fix evaluation see wherever operand is there push on to the operand stack so whenever you see symbol first first pop is your operator 2 second pop is operator 1 and result you again push on to the stack that is the story my dear friends now what about q using array again again here there are different implementations i am telling you one implementation uh, see this is the empty condition because these empty conditions and full conditions they are asking in examination babu this full and empty conditions they will ask you in the examination my dear friends so you should know them properly <coughs> now here uh, initially what we do is so when you have this particular array say 0 1 2 3 0 1 2 3 4 initially f is minus 1 and r is minus 1 you keep it so here what we do is initially front is minus 1 means it is empty condition okay so now what you do how you are going to do this nq operation sir if it is full you can't do empty you can't do nq operation otherwise if front is minus 1 you make front is equal to 0 so here front is minus 1 you just make front is equal to 0 then what you are going to do is rare is incremented rare is also incremented at this particular only when front is minus 1 you do front is 0 otherwise front is not incremented in remaining cases only rare is incremented at that particular position item is inserted my dear friends now here f and r are here from next time onwards only r is incremented next time onwards for nq operation because front is not minus 1 only r is that is rare rare uh, index is incremented my dear friends so at this position you are going to push the elements now again you want rare is incremented at this position you are going to increment it see with this what happens is with this particular implementation there is a problem 
for example now look at this 0 1 2 3 4 suppose you incremented 10 20 30 40 and 50 f is here r is here now suppose you pop this element so popping this element what you are doing you check whether it is empty or not so for empty it is minus 1 or front is equal to rare plus 1 you consider it as empty my friend so front is not minus 1 so what you can do you can do the uh, dq operation for dq operation what you are doing item you are going to store uh, uh, in the that is the first element you store somewhere and you are going to increment front index my friend so 10 you store in the somewhere in some item then f is incremented again suppose you want to delete element suppose this some item you store this 20 value then f is incremented see this is not actually deleted f is only uh, going here means we assume that our uh, q is from here to here now suppose you want to insert one more element actually there are two positions which are vacant but i cannot do it because my uh, q full condition is reached rare is equal to n minus 1 condition is reached i cannot insert any more elements that is the problem with linear array representation for q my dear friend so if you want to represent q using linear array this particular problem will arise because even though there are some vacant position you cannot include any element because you reach the q full condition am i clear so this is the q full condition and this is the q empty condition my dear friends that is the problem with normal q so here uh, of course nq dq all the operations can be performed in theta one time nq operation dq operations can be performed in theta one time peak means uh, front element what is the front element just you want to see that that can be done in theta one time but all the operations can be done in theta one time but the problem is uh, even though we have some vacant positions you cannot utilize the vacant position because you already reached the q full condition that is the problem with linear q of course they have some solutions like you know uh, uh, when q full condition is uh, reached but number of elements in the uh, q you can find using this formula number of elements in q using this formula you find it if the number of elements is not equal to size of the array less than size of the array you understand that there are some vacant positions so what we people do is they just switch, uh, shift all the elements to the left that one type of thing they do it or whenever they you know dq the elements they shift elements to one position to the left like that they do this my dear friends that is one way one way of implementing it is very costly implementation so what is the better implementation for this what is the better choice or better implementation for this so we use this circular queue implementation so here what we do is suppose you are having these indices initially we keep f and r at zero f and r at 0 we keep that is initially f is equal to 0 and r is equal to 0 so here also f is equal to rare see this uh, f is equal to rare is my q empty condition but here in this implementation uh, we may sacrifice one element my dear friend we may sacrifice one element always okay see and q full condition is rare plus one percentile n because when you do percentile n operation what happens after reaching the end you can go to the zero index so this rare plus one percentile n operation can allow me to go to the first one first position see actually array is linear only with this implementation you are making it a circular see. see physically it is linear logically it is circular physically the array is linear only but logically we are making it circular by using this idea that is the point my difference okay see my, what happens whenever you want to insert a new element see for nq element what you do if it is full or not you verify rare is incremented as rare plus one percent ln see as long as the value of rare plus one is less than n same answer you get it if it is equal to n or more than n percentile you have to do it so circular t will start my difference so rare will be incremented to this position and at this position you are going to insert the element so r is here again you want to insert an element r is incremented and you insert the element okay you are not deleting it sir again rare is incremented element is inserted rare is incremented element is inserted like this you do it okay now suppose you want to delete see for deleting what happens you have to check whether it is empty or not front is not equal to rare so what you do here is what you do here is see my dear friends f 
points the position which is one index left to the actual element f is not actually pointing to position sir f is pointing to one position left to the element to be deleted okay so your front more than one index you are here that is if uh, front is at second index your f will be at first index see actually front is at first index but your f is at zero index my dear friends f is at zero index my dear friends hope you understand hope you understand that is the idea so now when you want to delete first you increment f for incrementing f also front plus one percentile n my dear friends <coughs> as long as it is less than n same answer if it is greater than or equal to n percentile operation will give you the circularity my dear friends then this item at the front is removed my dear friends see actually here front is here now front is here now but this is your front element actually front index is showing this but this is your front element like this my dear friends so you can continue this process now you can continue the process suppose r is incremented you you supply one more element now r is at fifth index now you want to insert one more element you see the condition q fall condition rare plus one that is five plus one five plus one that is six percentile what is the size of this n value sir zero to n minus one size is six six percentile six zero is f at zero index no so you can insert element here so r can be taken here and you can insert new element here my dear friends so this is the advantage of this circular array my dear friends this is the advantage of this circular array my dear friends am i clear so with this what happens you can easily insert more elements but one index position will be always vacant my dear friends one uh, position will be sacrificed by this particular simpler method okay and of course the complexities for nq dq and peak will be theta one only no change in that but the only thing is they can ask you this condition sir what is the condition for q full what is the condition for q full this is rare plus one percentile n is equal to front what is the condition for q empty front is equal to rare remember this condition is very very important now linked list of course you can use two pointers front and rare pointer so with that uh, nq dq and peak operations can be done in theta one time it's a very very simple one my dear friends see dq means what sir see nq we do it here see nq you do it here sir whatever you want to nq you nq here dq you do here okay from front end you dq from rare end you nq so that is the point so all operations can be done in theta one time my dear friends now the next topic that is binary trees okay see you know the height of a binary tree you know height of a binary tree then how many nodes are there minimum and maximum see when you know height with the given height minimum number of nodes the minimum number of nodes happens for the skewed binary trees okay so height is three height is three here the nodes here is four so minimum number of nodes is given by h plus one the maximum number of nodes possible when all the levels are completely filled so for a given height suppose height is say three height is say three so maximum nodes will be this so if height is h maximum nodes is given by maximum nodes is given by two power zero plus two power one plus two square and so on to power h because at height h how many nodes will be there two power h nodes will be there which is nothing but two power h plus one minus one by two minus one that is two power h plus one minus one so this is the maximum number of nodes where is it gone this is the minimum number of nodes and this is the maximum number of nodes okay so that is about for a given binary tree of a height minimum number of nodes is given by h plus 1 maximum number of nodes is given by 2 power h plus 1 my dear, minus 1 my dear friends now suppose if i know the number of nodes in a binary tree for a given number of nodes what is the maximum height and what is the minimum height suppose i have three nodes sir i have three nodes with three nodes maximum height i can get is 2 with three nodes maximum height i can get is that is 
maximum height is n minus 1. Maximum height is n minus 1. This is the maximum n minus 1. The minimum, see when the minimum will happen, sir. When that minimum will happen, see this 2 power h plus 1 minus 1. Okay, this is equal to n, my dear friends. That is 2 power h plus 1 is equal to n plus 1. Yeah, need 2 power h is equal to n plus 1 by this is 2 by 2. Therefore, h is equal to log n plus 1 by 2 to the base 2. See, this is the minimum height. See, for a given number of nodes, if you want to get minimum heights, means all the levels must be completely filled. Suppose height is h, all the levels are completely filled, this many nodes we are going to get. So, what should be the height? This is the minimum height. There is a minimum height and there is a maximum height for a given number of nodes, my dear friends. All of you able to follow? Any doubts? <coughs> Next, in a binary tree with n nodes, how many leaf nodes will be there? See, minimum leaf nodes is, this is minimum, one leaf node will be there. See, obviously, minimum is one leaf node. Maximum leaf nodes. See, maximum leaf nodes, if you want the height, all the nodes will be completely filled. So, for a given height, all the nodes must be completely filled. So, we should have how many nodes? See, 2 power h nodes will be there. For a given height, max nodes is 2 power h. That is 2 power log n plus 1 by 2 to the base 2. These two get cancelled, you get n plus 1 by 2. See, for a given height or for a given number of nodes, for a given number of nodes, minimum leaf is 1. Minimum, obviously, 1 leaf nodes you can have. Maximum leaf nodes you can have is what, sir? n plus 1 by 2, my dear friends. Maximum leaf nodes will be n plus 1 by 2, my dear friends. This is the range of leaf nodes. Minimum number of leaf nodes for a given number of nodes. Maximum number of leaf nodes for a given number of nodes. Now, this is a very interesting relation between a number of nodes of degree 0, that is number of leaf nodes and number of nodes with two children. Okay. And this is the relation between number of nodes with or number of leaf nodes and number of nodes with exactly two children. And number of leaf nodes is always equal to number of nodes of degree 2. That is, children is given as degree here, sir. Am I clear? Here, we consider them as only out degree. No in degrees are considered. They are the directed graphs. Am I clear? So, n0 is equal to n2 plus 1. This is a very beautiful relation between number of leaf nodes and number of nodes of degree 2, my dear friends. Now, the one uh, interesting, how many binary trees with n unlabeled nodes is given by Catalan number. And if uh, number of binary trees with n labeled nodes is given by just Cn into n factor. Because labels are given, you have to arrange those n labels, my dear friends. So, that is Cn into n factorial. Okay. So, please tell me answer because I am going to give you the password for this document. Password is going to, uh, I am going to give you the password for this document now. Okay. This is, okay. Discrete mass, algorithms and data structures. Answer for this problem. Okay. Now, number of labeled binary trees with three labeled nodes or three labeled nodes. Number of labeled binary trees with three labeled nodes, my dear friends. With three labeled nodes, my dear friends. So, C3 into 3 factorial. C3 means what, sir? 1 by 4, 6 C3 into 3 factorial, any 6 which is 1 by 4, 6 C3 means 6 into 5 into 4 by 3 into 2 into 1 into 6, this 6, this 6 cancel, this 4, this 4 cancel, 6, 5 is 30. You please answer, check, check the answer correctly. So, the password for this particular document is DM 
KDS 30. That is a password. Let me write down. Hope your answer is clear. Now, number of strict binary. Strict binary tree means degree of each node is 0 or 2 only. There are not, uh, uh, degree, uh, no nodes of degree 1 here, sir. Okay? So, when you are having number of strict binary trees with n internal nodes, based on the internal nodes, we have the formula Cn by the trees. Based on how many internal nodes are there, we have this particular formula which is Cn. Now, when it is a binary search tree, number of binary search tree with n nodes, here they are obviously labeled. Binary search trees are obviously labeled because with labeling only we get this particular binary tree. It is directly given by Cn, my dear friend. That is cat one number. That is cat one number. <coughs> now, we have tree traversal. Num the order in which you visit the nodes of a tree, my dear friends. Okay. So, there are different orders like pre-order traversal, in-order traversal, post-order traversal and level-order traversal. Level-order is very simple, first order, first, first level complete, second level complete, third level complete, like that we complete my difference. The pre-order is nothing but, pre-order means first root node, then left subtree, then right subtree. In-order means first uh, left subtree, then root node, then right subtree. Post-order means left subtree, right subtree, then N. N here is root node, N is the node. Am I clear? So, that is the idea, my dear friends. Where our level order is? By order by order, we are going to traverse, my dear friends. Actually, we are going to use this numbering schema uh, to complete your orderings, my dear friends. So, each node is uh, visited three times. 1, 2 and 3 or left, middle and right. Each node is visited three times. Am I clear? So, you can just write the numbers 1, 2, 3 for each node. So, if you write once, you have to traverse from here. While traversing, if you uh, write the label set once, you are going to get pre-order. While traversing, if you write the label set twos, you are going to get in order. And while traversing, if you write the label set 3s, you are going to get post order. So, A, it is also 1, 1, 2, 3, B, F, J, then 2, K, then it continues and G, this is also 1, 2, 3, do not forget everything, anything sir, G, L, complete, complete, everything complete, then D, then H, then I, Done. All ones are completed. Similarly, travel and uh, uh, note in order and post order, my dear friends. Similarly, complete that. Level order is very simple. First, level order is very simple. Level by level A, B, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L. That is the level order traversal, my dear friends. Now, binary search tree. Of course, uh, worst case it would be theta n because you may have this, uh, you know, skewed binary search trees, my dear friends. But we we'll generally write theta h here. See, for binary search tree, what happens? Uh, see, uh, uh, the value at the root, okay, all the elements uh, to the left of this will be smaller than this key value, all the elements to the right of this will be larger than this. That is the idea for binary search tree, my dear friends. And for complex t is theta height. Height in the worst case is n, my dear friends. Okay. So, to insert n keys into an empty binary search tree, uh, you know, because first key you insert in one a time, second key, worst case two time, one plus two plus three plus and so on, worst case n time. So, order n square in worst case, my dear friends. But uh, best case, you may be inserting beautifully in the, uh, in the tree like this, my dear friends. So, balanced binary search tree you may be inserting. In that particular case, the time to insert n keys will be 
theta n log n my dear friends even in the average case the time to insert n keys into empty binary search tree will be theta n log n my dear friends next comes av avl tree adelson wilski and uh, landis okay they identified this balanced binary search trees the other forms of balanced binary search tree this is very famous so here we are going to use something called balance factor the height of left subtree minus height of right subtree it should be less than or equal to absolute value of balance factor that is whatever balance factor you get that absolute value should be less than or equal to 1 or in other words the balance factor should be either minus 1 0 or plus 1 okay so if it is balanced out using rotations depending on where you are inserting new element you do uh, you know single rotations yeah, or double rotations my dear friends we call them as ll rr rotations lr rl rotations my dear friends okay of course the minimum number of nodes in a binary, uh, I mean, AVL tree of height h is given by following recurrence relation, which is h is equal to 0, it is 1, h is equal to 1, it is 2. But for higher values of h, we have this recurrence relation nh minus 1 plus nh minus 2 plus 1, my difference. So, for given height, minimum number of nodes is given in this particular table. This result is very important. So, sometimes they ask you if I am having AVL tree with 20 minimum nodes, what is the height? For this given 20 nodes, what is the height of the AVL tree, my dear friends? You immediately need to say the answer 5. The heaps. See, heaps are generally maintained in the level order, my dear friends. So, here a heap property means either max heap or yeah, min heap property. In max heap property, the value at the root is greater than value at its children, whereas in min heap, value at the root is smaller than its children. So, that max heap property we have to maintain. So, there is something called heap 5 procedure. So, whenever a element is there, heapification means uh, depending on the position, uh, you, you need to uh, traverse that particular element to the top or bottom of the uh, tree. So, because uh, this is a complete binary tree, complete here, complete, uh, there are different definitions here. Complete binary tree means all the levels except the last level are completely filled and the last level is, okay, filled uh, from left to right. Some people call it as almost complete binary tree also, my dear friends. Okay, so that is the idea for this binary heap, my dear friends. So that is the idea for this particular binary heap, my dear friends. Hope you understand. All of you able to follow? Yeah. I'm not able to hear any comments. I think people are exhausted. Fine. We'll complete it with uh, the formula. So, please note down this formula list I am giving now. <coughs> so, pre RTQs and hashing formulas also I just uh, given. Just go through it. This PDF anyhow I am going to give. It is a password protected as I mentioned already. So, we also have this particular test series uh, which is offered uh, I think uh, towards the end for your preparation. It is always best to give the test series my dear friends. And uh, by use exam prep offers the test series where you can get unlimited access to full length mocks as well as subject wise tests my dear friends okay so please uh, uh, take this particular test series to check your knowledge my dear friends okay and we also have this uh, 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 detailed uh, stories about your test series like uh, you know uh, mock analysis that is test series uh, what is very important with the test series is analysis of the test series Okay, that analysis is very, very important. So, we have this uh, mock analysis for the test series. So, you can make use of this test series and it is uh, virtual science ca scientific calculator is provided. So, it is similar to that of you are writing your gate examination, my dear friends. So, you can see the environment of your gate examination while writing this test series and it is curated by gate experts and we have all India open mock challenges. So, I expect a minimum 100 likes, my dear friends here right so that is about your uh, uh, 50 marks in five r series uh, it is wonderfully started by uh, such as sir and uh, i just concluded with uh, my own uh, three subjects here like algorithms data structures and discrete mathematics uh, this is password protected password is given in the uh, video itself you can go through this my difference okay so you can subscribe to byju's exam prep uh, channel okay for more uh, regular updates classes and you can also subscribe to my telegram uh, channel my telegram channel is cs underscore sridhar my telegram group you can join this telegram group for more updates the pdf of this uh, uh, 
uh, workshop or uh, this particular uh, session, my dear friends. And thank you all. Thank you for your patience and thank you for listening patiently. And that's all for today. Signing off, my dear friends. If you have two more likes to go, two more likes to go. So, shall I wait for two more likes? Shall I wait for two more likes? Okay. Sign, sir. So, I will be calling it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for attending the session. All the best.